Chapter One of Cousin Betty. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bruce Peary. Cousin Betty by Honoré de Balzac. Translated by James Waring. Chapter One. One day, about the middle of July, eighteen thirty-eight one of the carriages then lately introduced to paris cabstands and known as milords was driving down the rue de l'universite conveying a stout man of middle age in the uniform of a captain of the national guard among the paris crowd who are supposed to be so clever there are some men who fancy themselves infinitely more attractive in uniform than in their ordinary clothes and who attribute to women so depraved a taste that they believe they will be favorably impressed by the aspect of a busby and of military accoutrements the countenance of this captain of the second company beamed with a self-satisfaction that added splendor to his ruddy and somewhat chubby face the halo of glory that a fortune made in business gives to a retired tradesman sat on his brow and stamped him as one of the elect of paris at least a retired deputy mayor of his quarter of the town and you may be sure that the ribbon of the legion of honor was not missing from his breast gallantly padded a la prussienne proudly seated in one corner of the milord this splendid person let his gaze wander over the passers-by who in paris often thus meet an ingratiating smile meant for sweet eyes that are absent the vehicle stopped in the part of the street between the rue de belle chasse and the rue de bourgogne at the door of a large newly built house standing on part of the courtyard of an ancient mansion that had a garden the old house remained in its original state beyond the courtyard curtailed by half its extent only from the way in which the officer accepted the assistance of the coachman to help him out it was plain that he was past fifty there are certain movements so undisguisedly heavy that they are as tell-tale as a register of birth the captain put on his lemon-colored right-hand glove and without any question to the gatekeeper went up the outer steps to the ground of the new house with a look that proclaimed she is mine the concierges of paris have sharp eyes they do not stop visitors who wear an order have a blue uniform and walk ponderously in short they know a rich man when they see him this ground floor was entirely occupied by monsieur le baron hulot d'ervy commissary general under the republic retired army contractor and at the present time at the head of one of the most important departments of the war office councillor of state officer of the legion of honor and so forth this baron hulot had taken the name of d'ervy the place of his birth to distinguish him from his brother the famous general hulot colonel of the grenadiers of the imperial guard created by the emperor comte de Fortsheim after the campaign of eighteen hundred and nine the count the elder brother being responsible for his junior had with paternal care placed him in the commissariat where thanks to the services of the two brothers the baron deserved and won napoleon's good graces after eighteen hundred and seven baron hulot was commissary-general for the army in spain having rung the bell the citizen captain made strenuous efforts to pull his coat into place for it had rucked up as much at the back as in front pushed out of shape by the working of a piriform stomach being admitted as soon as the servant in livery saw him the important and imposing personage followed the man who opened the door of the drawing-room announcing monsieur crevel on hearing the name singularly appropriate to the figure of the man who bore it a tall fair woman evidently young-looking for her age rose as if she had received an electric shock hortense my darling go into the garden with your cousin betty she said hastily to her daughter who was working at some embroidery at her mother's side after curtsying prettily to the captain mademoiselle hortense went out by a glass door taking with her a withered-looking spinster who looked older than the baroness though she was five years younger 
they are settling your marriage said cousin betty in the girl's ear without seeming at all offended at the way in which the baroness had dismissed them counting her almost as zero the cousin's dress might at need have explained this free and easy demeanour the old maid wore a merino gown of a dark plum colour of which the cut and trimming dated from the year of the restoration a little worked collar worth perhaps three francs and a common straw hat with blue satin ribbons edged with straw plate such as the old clothes buyers wear at market on looking down at her kid shoes made it was evident by the veriest cobbler a stranger would have hesitated to recognize cousin betty as a member of the family for she looked exactly like a journeywoman sempstress but she did not leave the room without bestowing a little friendly nod on m crevel to which that gentleman responded by a look of mutual understanding you are coming to us to-morrow i hope mademoiselle fischer said he you have no company asked cousin betty my children and yourself no one else replied the visitor very well replied she depend on me and here am i madame at your orders said the citizen captain bowing again to madame hulot he gave such a look at madame hulot as tartuffe casts at elmire when a provincial actor plays the part and thinks it necessary to emphasize its meaning at poitiers or at coutances if you will come into this room with me we shall be more conveniently placed for talking business than we are in this room said madame hulot going to an adjoining room which as the apartment was arranged served as a card-room it was divided by a slight partition from a boudoir looking out on the garden and madame hulot left her visitor to himself for a minute for she thought it wise to shut the window and the door of the boudoir so that no one should get in and listen she even took the precaution of shutting the glass door of the drawing-room smiling on her daughter and her cousin whom she saw seated in an old summer-house at the end of the garden as she came back she left the card-room door open so as to hear if any one should open that of the drawing-room to come in as she came and went the baroness seen by nobody allowed her face to betray all her thoughts and any one who could have seen her would have been shocked to see her agitation but when she finally came back from the glass door of the drawing-room as she entered the card-room her face was hidden behind the impenetrable reserve which every woman even the most candid seems to have at her command during all these preparations odd to say the least the national guardsman studied the furniture of the room in which he found himself as he noted the silk curtains once red now faded to dull purple by the sunshine and frayed in the pleats by long wear the carpet from which the hues had faded the discoloured gilding of the furniture and the silk seats discoloured in patches and wearing into strips expressions of scorn satisfaction and hope dawned in succession without disguise on his stupid tradesman's face he looked at himself in the glass over an old clock of the empire and was contemplating the general effect when the rustle of her silk skirt announced the baroness he at once struck an attitude after dropping on to a sofa which had been a very handsome one in the year eighteen hundred and nine the baroness pointing to an armchair with the arms ending in bronze sphinx's heads while the paint was peeling from the wood which showed through in many places signed to crevel to be seated all the precautions you are taking madame would seem full of promise to a to a lover said she interrupting him the word is too feeble said he placing his right hand on his heart and rolling his eyes in a way which almost always makes a woman laugh when she in cold blood sees such a look a lover a lover say a man bewitched End of chapter one
Chapter Two of Cousin Betty by Honoré de Balzac, translated by James Waring. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Chapter Two. Listen, Monsieur Crevel," said the Baroness, too anxious to be able to laugh. "You are fifty, ten years younger than Monsieur Hulot. I know." but at my age a woman's follies ought to be justified by beauty youth fame superior merit some one of the splendid qualities which can dazzle us to the point of making us forget all else even at our age though you may have fifty thousand francs a year your age counterbalances your fortune thus you have nothing whatever of what a woman looks for but love said the officer rising and coming forward such love as no monsieur such obstinacy said the baroness interrupting him to put an end to his absurdity yes obstinacy said he and love but something stronger still a claim a claim cried madame hulot rising sublime with scorn defiance and indignation but she went on this will bring us to no issues i did not ask you to come here to discuss the matter which led to your banishment in spite of the connection between our families i had fancied so what still cried she do you not see monsieur by the entire ease and freedom with which i can speak of lovers and love of everything least creditable to a woman that i am perfectly secure in my own virtue i fear nothing not even to shut myself in alone with you is that the conduct of a weak woman you know full well why i begged you to come no madame replied crevel with an assumption of great coldness he pursed up his lips and again struck an attitude well i will be brief to shorten our common discomfort said the baroness looking at crevel crevel made an ironical bow in which a man who knew the race would have recognized the graces of a bagman our son married your daughter and if it were to do again said crevel it would not be done at all i suspect said the baroness hastily however you have nothing to complain of my son is not only one of the leading pleaders of paris but for the last year he has sat as deputy and his maiden speech was brilliant enough to lead us to suppose that ere long he will be in office victorin has twice been called upon to report on important measures and he may even now if he chose be made attorney-general in the court of appeal so if you mean to say that your son-in-law has no fortune worse than that madame a son-in-law whom i am obliged to maintain replied crevel of the five hundred thousand francs that formed my daughter's marriage portion two hundred thousand have vanished god knows how in paying the young gentleman's debts in furnishing his house splendaciously a house costing five hundred thousand francs and bringing in scarcely fifteen thousand since he occupies the larger part of it while he owes two hundred and sixty thousand francs of the purchase money the rent he gets barely pays the interest on the debt i have had to give my daughter twenty thousand francs this year to help her to make both ends meet and then my son-in-law who was making thirty thousand francs a year at the assizes i am told is going to throw that up for the chamber this again monsieur crevel is beside the mark we are wandering from the point still to dispose of it finally it may be said that if my son gets into office if he has you made an officer of the legion of honor and councillor of the municipality of paris you as a retired perfumer will not have much to complain of ah there we are again madame yes i am a tradesman a shopkeeper a retail dealer in almond paste eau de portugal and hair oil and was only too much honoured when my only daughter was married to the son of monsieur le baron hulot d'ervy my daughter will be a baroness this is regency louis the fifteenth oeil de boeuf quite tip-top very good i love celestine as a man loves his only child so well indeed that to preserve her from having either brother or sister i resigned myself to all the privations of a widower in paris and in the prime of life madame 
but you must understand that in spite of this extravagant affection for my daughter i do not intend to reduce my fortune for the sake of your son whose expenses are not wholly accounted for in my eyes as an old man of business monsieur you may at this day see in the ministry of commerce monsieur popinot formerly a druggist in the rue des lombards and a friend of mine madame said the ex-perfumer for i celestin crevel foreman once to old cesar birotteau bought up the said cesar birotteau's stock and he was popinot's father-in-law why that very popinot was no more than a shopman in the establishment and he is the first to remind me of it for he is not proud to do him justice to men in a good position with an income of sixty thousand francs in the funds well then monsieur the notions you term regency are quite out of date at a time when a man is taken at his personal worth and that is what you did when you married your daughter to my son but you do not know how the marriage was brought about cried crevel oh that cursed bachelor life but for my misconduct my celestine might at this day be vicomtesse papineau once more have done with recriminations over accomplished facts said the baroness anxiously let us rather discuss the complaints i have found on your strange behaviour my daughter hortense had a chance of marrying the match depended entirely on you i believed you felt some sentiments of generosity i thought you would do justice to a woman who has never had a thought in her heart for any man but her husband that you would have understood how necessary it is for her not to receive a man who may compromise her and that for the honour of the family with which you are allied you would have been eager to promote hortense's settlement with monsieur le conseiller le bas and it is you monsieur you have hindered the marriage madame said the ex-perfumer i acted the part of an honest man i was asked whether the two hundred thousand francs to be settled on mademoiselle hortense would be forthcoming i replied exactly in these words i would not answer for it my son-in-law to whom the hulots had promised the same sum was in debt and i believe that if monsieur hulot d'ervy were to die to-morrow his widow would have nothing to live on there fair lady and would you have said as much monsieur asked madame hulot looking crevel steadily in the face if i had been false to my duty i should not be in a position to say it dearest adeline cried this singular adorer interrupting the baroness for you would have found the amount in my pocket-book and adding action to word the fat guardsman knelt down on one knee and kissed madame hulot's hand seeing that his speech had filled her with speechless horror which he took for hesitancy what buy my daughter's fortune at the cost of rise monsieur or i ring the bell crevel rose with great difficulty this fact made him so furious that he again struck his favourite attitude most men have some habitual position by which they fancy that they show to the best advantage the good points bestowed on them by nature this attitude in crevel consisted in crossing his arms like napoleon his head showing three-quarters face and his eyes fixed on the horizon as the painter has shown the emperor in his portrait to be faithful he began with well-acted indignation so faithful to a liber to a husband who is worthy of such fidelity madame hulot put in to hinder crevel from saying a word she did not choose to hear come madame you wrote to bid me here you ask the reasons for my conduct you drive me to extremities with your imperial airs your scorn and your contempt anyone might think i was a negro but i repeat it and you may believe me i have a right to to make love to you for but no i love you well enough to hold my tongue you may speak monsieur in a few days i shall be eight and forty i am no prude i can hear whatever you can say then will you give me your word of honour as an honest woman for you are alas for me an honest woman never to mention my name or to say that it was i who betrayed the secret 
if that is the condition on which you speak i will swear never to tell any one from whom i heard the horrors you propose to tell me not even my husband i should think not indeed for only you and he are concerned madame hulot turned pale oh if you still really love hulot it will distress you shall i say no more speak monsieur for by your account you wish to justify in my eyes the extraordinary declarations you have chosen to make me and your persistency in tormenting a woman of my age whose only wish is to see her daughter married and then to die in peace you see you are unhappy i monsieur yes beautiful noble creature cried crevel you have indeed been too wretched monsieur be silent and go or speak to me as you ought do you know madame how master hulot and i first made acquaintance at our mistresses madame oh monsieur yes madame at our mistresses crevel repeated in a melodramatic tone and leaving his position to wave his right hand well and what then said the baroness coolly to crevel's great amazement such mean seducers cannot understand a great soul i a widower five years since crevel began in the tone of a man who has a story to tell and not wishing to marry again for the sake of the daughter i adore not choosing either to cultivate any such connection in my own establishment though i had at the time a very pretty lady accountant i set up on her own account as they say a little sempstress of fifteen really a miracle of beauty with whom i fell desperately in love and in fact madame i asked an aunt of my own my mother's sister whom i sent for from the country to live with the sweet creature and keep an eye on her that she might behave as well as might be in this rather what shall i say shady no delicate position the child whose talent for music was striking had masters she was educated i had to give her something to do besides i wished to be at once her father her benefactor and well out with it her lover to kill two birds with one stone a good action and a sweetheart for five years i was very happy the girl had one of those voices that make the fortune of a theatre i can only describe her by saying that she is a dupre in petticoats it cost me two thousand francs a year only to cultivate her talent as a singer she made me music mad i took a box at the opera for her and for my daughter and went there alternate evenings with celestine or josepha what the famous singer yes madame said crevel with pride the famous josepha owes everything to me at last in eighteen thirty four when the child was twenty believing that i had attached her to me for ever and being very weak where she was concerned i thought i would give her a little amusement and i introduced her to a pretty little actress jenny cadine whose life had been somewhat like her own this actress also owed everything to a protector who had brought her up in leading strings that protector was baron hulot i know that said the baroness in a calm voice without the least agitation bless me cried crevel more and more astounded well but do you know that your monster of a husband took jenny cadine in hand at the age of thirteen what then said the baroness as jenny cadine and josepha were both aged twenty when they first met the ex-tradesman went on the baron had been playing the part of louis the fifteenth to mademoiselle de romans ever since eighteen twenty six and you were twelve years younger then i had my reasons monsieur for leaving monsieur hulot his liberty that falsehood madame will surely be enough to wipe out every sin you have ever committed and to open to you the gates of paradise replied crevel with a knowing air that brought the colour to the baroness's cheeks sublime and adored woman tell that to those who will believe it but not to old crevel who has i may tell you feasted too often as one of four with your rascally husband not to know what your high merits are many a time has he blamed himself when half tipsy as he has expatiated on your perfections oh i know you well 
a libertine might hesitate between you and a girl of twenty i do not hesitate monsieur well i say no more but you must know saintly and noble woman that a husband under certain circumstances will tell things about his wife to his mistress that will mightily amuse her tears of shame hanging to madame hulot's long lashes checked the national guardsman he stopped short and forgot his attitude to proceed said he we became intimate the baron and i through the two hussies the baron like all bad lots is very pleasant a thoroughly jolly good fellow yes he took my fancy the old rascal he could be so funny well enough of those reminiscences we got to be like brothers the scoundrel quite regency in his notions tried indeed to deprave me altogether preached saint simonism as to women and all sorts of lordly ideas but you see i was fond enough of my girl to have married her only i was afraid of having children then between two old daddies such friends as as we were what more natural than that we should think of our children marrying each other three months after his son had married my celestine hulot i don't know how i can utter the wretch's name he has cheated us both madame well the villain did me out of my little josepha the scoundrel knew that he was supplanted in the heart of jenny cadine by a young lawyer and by an artist only two of them for the girl had more and more of a howling success and he stole my sweet little girl a perfect darling but you must have seen her at the opera he got her an engagement there your husband is not so well behaved as i am i am ruled as straight as a sheet of music paper he had dropped a good deal of money on jenny cadine who must have cost him near on thirty thousand francs a year well i can only tell you that he is ruining himself outright for josepha josepha madame is a jewess her name is mira the anagram of hiram an israelite mark that stamps her for she was a foundling picked up in germany and the inquiries i have made prove that she is the illegitimate child of a rich jew banker the life of the theatre and above all the teaching of jenny cadine madame schontz malaga and carabine as to the way to treat an old man have developed in the child whom i had kept in a respectable and not too expensive way of life all the native hebrew instinct for gold and jewels for the golden calf so this famous singer hungering for plunder now wants to be rich very rich she tried her prentice hand on baron hulot and soon plucked him bare plucked him ay and singed him to the skin the miserable man after trying to vie with one of the kellers and with the marquis d'esquignon both perfectly mad about josepha to say nothing of unknown worshippers is about to see her carried off by that very rich duke who is such a patron of the arts oh, what is his name a dwarf ah the duc d'herouville this fine gentleman insists on having josepha for his very own and all that set are talking about it the baron knows nothing of it as yet for it is the same in the thirteenth arrondissement as in every other the lover like the husband is last to get the news now do you understand my claim your husband dear lady has robbed me of my joy in life the only happiness i have known since i became a widower yes if i had not been so unlucky as to come across that old rip josepha would still be mine for i you know should never have placed her on the stage she would have lived obscure well conducted and mine oh if you could but have seen her eight years ago slight and wiry with the golden skin of an andalusian as they say black hair as shiny as satin an eye that flashed lightning under long brown lashes the style of a duchess in every movement the modesty of a dependent decent grace and the pretty ways of a wild fawn and by that hulot's doing all this charm and purity has been degraded to a man-trap a money-box for five-franc pieces the girl is the queen of trollops 
and nowadays she humbugs every one she who knew nothing not even that word at this stage the retired perfumer wiped his eyes which were full of tears the sincerity of his grief touched madame hulot and roused her from the meditation into which she had sunk tell me madame is a man of fifty-two likely to find such another jewel at my age love costs thirty thousand francs a year it is through your husband's experience that i know the price and i love celestine too truly to be her ruin when i saw you at the first evening party you gave in our honor i wondered how that scoundrel hulot could keep a jenny cadine you had the manner of an empress you do not look thirty he went on to me madame you look young and you are beautiful on my word of honor that evening i was struck to the heart i said to myself if i had not josepha since old hulot neglects his wife she would fit me like a glove forgive me it is a reminiscence of my old business the perfumer will crop up now and then and that is what keeps me from standing to be elected deputy and then when i was so abominably deceived by the baron for really between old rips like us our friend's mistress should be sacred i swore i would have his wife it is but justice the baron could say nothing we are certain of impunity you showed me the door like a mangy dog at the first words i uttered as to the state of my feelings you only made my passion my obstinacy if you will twice as strong and you shall be mine indeed how i do not know but it will come to pass you see madame an idiot of a perfumer retired from business who has but one idea in his head is stronger than a clever fellow who has a thousand i am smitten with you and you are the means of my revenge it is like being in love twice over i am speaking to you quite frankly as a man who knows what he means i speak coldly to you just as you do to me when you say i never will be yours in fact as they say i play the game with the cards on the table yes you shall be mine sooner or later if you were fifty you should still be my mistress and it will be for i expect anything from your husband madame hulot looked at this vulgar intriguer with such a fixed stare of terror that he thought she had gone mad and he stopped you insisted on it you heaped me with scorn you defied me and i have spoken said he feeling that he must justify the ferocity of his last words oh my daughter my daughter moaned the baroness in a voice like a dying woman's oh i have forgotten all else crevel went on the day when i was robbed of josepha i was like a tigress robbed of her cubs in short as you see me now your daughter yes i regard her as the means of winning you yes i put a spoke in her marriage and you will not get her married without my help handsome as mademoiselle hortense is she needs a fortune alas yes said the baroness wiping her eyes well just ask your husband for ten thousand francs said crevel striking his attitude once more he waited a minute like an actor who has made a point if he had the money he would give it to the woman who will take josepha's place he went on emphasizing his tones does a man ever pull up on the road he has taken in the first place he is too sweet on women there is a happy medium in all things as our king has told us and then his vanity is implicated he is a handsome man he would bring you all to ruin for his pleasure in fact you are already on the high road to the workhouse why look never since i set foot in your house have you been able to do up your drawing-room furniture hard up is the word shouted by every slit in the stuff where will you find a son-in-law who would not turn his back in horror of the ill-concealed evidence of the most cruel misery there is that of people in decent society i have kept shop and i know there is no eye so quick as that of the paris tradesman to detect real wealth from its sham you have no money 
he said in a lower voice it is written everywhere even on your manservant's coat would you like me to disclose any more hideous mysteries that are kept from you monsieur cried madame hulot whose handkerchief was wet through with her tears enough enough my son-in-law i tell you gives his father money and this is what i particularly wanted to come to when i began by speaking of your son's expenses but i keep an eye on my daughter's interests be easy oh if i could but see my daughter married and die cried the poor woman quite losing her head well then this is the way said the ex-perfumer madame hulot looked at crevel with a hopeful expression which so completely changed her countenance that this alone ought to have touched the man's feelings and have led him to abandon his monstrous schemes End of chapter two chapter three of cousin betty by honore de balzac translated by james waring this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by bruce peary chapter three you will still be handsome ten years hence crevel went on with his arms folded be kind to me and mademoiselle hulot will marry hulot has given me the right as i have explained to you to put the matter crudely and he will not be angry in three years i have saved the interest on my capital for my dissipations have been restricted i have three hundred thousand francs in the bank over and above my invested fortune they are yours go said madame hulot go monsieur and never let me see you again but for the necessity in which you placed me to learn the secret of your cowardly conduct with regard to the match i had planned for hortense yes cowardly she repeated in answer to a gesture from crevel how can you load a poor girl a pretty innocent creature with such a weight of enmity but for the necessity that goaded me as a mother you would never have spoken to me again never again have come within my doors thirty-two years of an honourable and loyal life shall not be swept away by a blow from m crevel the retired perfumer successor to cesar birotteau at the queen of the roses rue st honore added crevel in mocking tones deputy mayor captain in the national guard chevalier of the legion of honor exactly what my predecessor was monsieur said the baroness if after twenty years of constancy monsieur hulot is tired of his wife that is nobody's concern but mine as you see he has kept his infidelity a mystery for i did not know that he had succeeded you in the affections of mademoiselle josepha oh it has cost him a pretty penny madame his singing bird has cost him more than a hundred thousand francs in these two years aha you have not seen the end of it have done with all this monsieur crevel i will not for your sake forego the happiness a mother knows who can embrace her children without a single pang of remorse in her heart who sees herself respected and loved by her family and i will give up my soul to god unspotted amen exclaimed crevel with the diabolical rage that embitters the face of these pretenders when they fail for the second time in such an attempt you do not yet know the latter end of poverty shame disgrace i have tried to warn you i would have saved you you and your daughter well you must study the modern parable of the prodigal father from a to z your tears and your pride move me deeply said crevel seating himself for it is frightful to see the woman one loves weeping all i can promise you dear adeline is to do nothing against your interests or your husband's only never send to me for information that is all what is to be done cried madame hulot up to now the baroness had bravely faced the threefold torment which this explanation inflicted on her for she was wounded as a woman as a mother and as a wife in fact so long as her son's father-in-law was insolent and offensive she had found the strength in her resistance to the aggressive tradesman 
but the sort of good nature he showed in spite of his exasperation as a mortified adorer and as a humiliated national guardsman broke down her nerve strung to the point of snapping she wrung her hands melted into tears and was in a state of such helpless dejection that she allowed crevel to kneel at her feet kissing her hands good god what will become of us she went on wiping away her tears can a mother sit still and see her child pine away before her eyes what is to be the fate of that splendid creature as strong in her pure life under her mother's care as she is by every gift of nature there are days when she wanders round the garden out of spirits without knowing why i find her with tears in her eyes she is one and twenty said crevel must i place her in a convent asked the baroness but in such cases religion is impotent to subdue nature and the most piously trained girls lose their head get up pray monsieur do you not understand that everything is final between us that i look upon you with horror that you have crushed a mother's last hopes but if i were to restore them asked he madame hulot looked at crevel with a frenzied expression that really touched him but he drove pity back to the depths of his heart she had said i look upon you with horror virtue is always a little too rigid it overlooks the shades and instincts by help of which we are able to tack when in a false position so handsome a girl as mademoiselle hortense does not find a husband nowadays if she is penniless crevel remarked resuming his starchiest manner your daughter is one of those beauties who rather alarm intending husbands like a thoroughbred horse which is too expensive to keep up to find a ready purchaser if you go out walking with such a woman on your arm every one will turn to look at you and follow and covet his neighbor's wife such success is a source of much uneasiness to men who do not want to be killing lovers for after all no man kills more than one in the position in which you find yourself there are just three ways of getting your daughter married either by my help and you will have none of it that is one or by finding some old man of sixty very rich childless and anxious to have children that is difficult still such men are to be met with many old men take up with a josepha a jenny cadine why should not one be found who is ready to make a fool of himself under legal formalities if it were not for celestine and our two grandchildren i would marry hortense myself that is two the last way is the easiest madame hulot raised her head and looked uneasily at the ex-perfumer paris is a town whither every man of energy and they sprout like saplings on french soil comes to meet his kind talent swarms here without hearth or home and energy equal to anything even to making a fortune well these youngsters your humble servant was such a one in his time and how many he has known what had du tillet or popinot twenty years since they were both pottering around in daddy birotteau's shop with not a penny of capital but their determination to get on which in my opinion is the best capital a man can have money may be eaten through but you don't eat through your determination why what had i the will to get on and plenty of pluck at this day du tillet is a match for the greatest folks little popinot the richest druggist of the rue des lombards became a deputy now he is in office well one of these free lances as we say on the stock market of the pen or of the brush is the only man in paris who would marry a penniless beauty for they have courage enough for anything m popinot married mademoiselle birotteau without asking for a farthing those men are madmen to be sure they trust in love as they trust in good luck and brains find a man of energy who will fall in love with your daughter and he will marry without a thought of money you must confess that by way of an enemy i am not ungenerous for this advice is against my own interests oh monsieur crevel if you would indeed be my friend and give up your ridiculous notions ridiculous madame do not run yourself down 
look at yourself i love you and you will come to be mine the day will come when i shall say to hulot you took josepha i have taken your wife it is the old law of tit for tat and i will persevere till i have attained my end unless you should become extremely ugly i shall succeed and i will tell you why he went on resuming his attitude and looking at madame hulot you will not meet with such an old man or such a young lover he said after a pause because you love your daughter too well to hand her over to the manoeuvres of an old libertine and because you the baronne hulot sister of the old lieutenant-general who commanded the veteran grenadiers of the old guard will not condescend to take a man of spirit wherever you may find him for he might be a mere craftsman as many a millionaire of to-day was ten years ago a working artisan or the foreman of a factory and then when you see the girl urged by her twenty years capable of dishonouring you all you will say to yourself it will be better that i should fall if monsieur crevel will but keep my secret i will earn my daughter's portion two hundred thousand francs for ten years attachment to that old glove-seller old crevel i disgust you no doubt and what i am saying is horribly immoral you think but if you happen to have been bitten by an overwhelming passion you would find a thousand arguments in favour of yielding as women do when they are in love yes and hortense's interests will suggest to your feelings such terms of surrendering your conscience hortense has still an uncle what old fischer he is winding up his concerns and that again is the baron's fault his rake is dragged over every till within his reach comte hulot oh madame your husband has already made thin air of the old general's savings he spent them in furnishing his singer's rooms now come am i to go without a hope good-bye monsieur a man easily gets over a passion for a woman of my age and you will fall back on christian principles god takes care of the wretched the baroness rose to oblige the captain to retreat and drove him back into the drawing-room ought the beautiful madame hulot to be living amid such squalor said he and he pointed to an old lamp a chandelier bereft of its gilding the threadbare carpet the very rags of wealth which made the large room with its red white and gold look like a corpse of imperial festivities monsieur virtue shines on it all i have no wish to owe a handsome abode to having made of the beauty you are pleased to ascribe to me a man-trap and a money-box for five franc pieces the captain bit his lips as he recognized the words he had used to vilify josepha's avarice and for whom are you so magnanimous said he by this time the baroness had got her rejected admirer as far as the door for a libertine said he with a lofty grimace of virtue and superior wealth if you are right my constancy has some merit monsieur that is all after bowing to the officer as a woman bows to dismiss an importune visitor she turned away too quickly to see him once more fold his arms she unlocked the doors she had closed and did not see the threatening gesture which was crevel's parting greeting she walked with a proud defiant step like a martyr to the Colosseum, but her strength was exhausted she sank on the sofa in her blue room as if she were ready to faint and sat there with her eyes fixed on the tumble-down summer-house where her daughter was gossiping with cousin betty from the first days of her married life to the present time the baroness had loved her husband as josephine in the end had loved napoleon with an admiring maternal and cowardly devotion though ignorant of the details given her by crevel she knew that for twenty years past baron hulot had been anything rather than a faithful husband but she had sealed her eyes with lead she had wept in silence and no word of reproach had ever escaped her in return for this angelic sweetness she had won her husband's veneration and something approaching to worship from all who were about her a wife's affection for her husband and the respect she pays him are infectious in a family 
hortense believed her father to be a perfect model of conjugal affection as to their son brought up to admire the baron whom everybody regarded as one of the giants who so effectually backed napoleon he knew that he owed his advancement to his father's name position and credit and besides the impressions of childhood exert an enduring influence he still was afraid of his father and if he had suspected the misdeeds revealed by crevel as he was too much overawed by him to find fault he would have found excuses in the view every man takes of such matters it now will be necessary to give the reasons for the extraordinary self-devotion of a good and beautiful woman and this in a few words is her past history three brothers simple laboring men named fisher and living in a village situated on the furthest frontier of lorraine were compelled by the republican conscription to set out with the so-called army of the rhine in seventeen ninety nine the second brother andre a widower and madame hulot's father left his daughter to the care of his elder brother pierre fisher disabled from service by a wound received in seventeen ninety seven and made a small private venture in the military transport service an opening he owed to the favor of hulot d'ervy who was high in the commissariat by a very obvious chance hulot coming to strasbourg saw the fisher family adeline's father and his younger brother were at that time contractors for forage in the province of alsace adeline then sixteen years of age might be compared with the famous madame du barry like her a daughter of lorraine she was one of those perfect and striking beauties a woman like madame tallien finished with peculiar care by nature who bestows on them all her choicest gifts distinction dignity grace refinement elegance flesh of a superior texture and a complexion mingled in the unknown laboratory where good luck presides these beautiful creatures all have something in common bianca capella whose portrait is one of bronzino's masterpieces jean goujon's venus painted from the famous diane de poitiers signora olympia whose picture adorns the doria gallery ninon madame du barry madame tallien mademoiselle georges madame recamier all these women who preserved their beauty in spite of years of passion and of their life of excess and pleasure have in figure frame and in the character of their beauty certain striking resemblances enough to make one believe that there is in the ocean of generations an aphrodisian current whence every such venus is born all daughters of the same salt wave adeline fisher one of the loveliest of this race of goddesses had the splendid type the flowing lines the exquisite texture of a woman born a queen the fair hair that our mother eve received from the hand of god the form of an empress an air of grandeur and an august line of profile with her rural modesty made every man pause in delight as she passed like amateurs in front of a raphael in short having once seen her the commissariat officer made mademoiselle adeline fisher his wife as quickly as the law would permit to the great astonishment of the fishers who had all been brought up in the fear of their betters the eldest a soldier of seventeen ninety two severely wounded in the attack on the lines at wissembourg adored the emperor napoleon and everything that had to do with the grande armee andre and johann spoke with respect of commissary hulot the emperor's protege to whom indeed they owed their prosperity for hulot d'ervy finding them intelligent and honest had taken them from the army provision wagons to place them in charge of a government contract needing despatch the brothers fisher had done further service during the campaign of eighteen hundred and four at the peace hulot had secured for them the contract for forage from alsace not knowing that he would presently be sent to strasbourg to prepare for the campaign of eighteen hundred and six this marriage was like an assumption to the young peasant girl the beautiful adeline was translated at once from the mire of her village to the paradise of the imperial court for the contractor one of the most conscientious and hard-working of the commissariat staff was made a baron obtained a place near the emperor and was attached to the imperial guard 
the handsome rustic bravely set to work to educate herself for love of her husband for she was simply crazy about him and indeed the commissariat officer was as a man a perfect match for adeline as a woman he was one of the picked corps of fine men tall well-built fair with beautiful blue eyes full of irresistible fire and life his elegant appearance made him remarkable by the side of d'orsay forbin ouvrard in short in the battalion of fine men that surrounded the emperor a conquering buck and holding the ideas of the directoire with regard to women his career of gallantry was interrupted for some long time by his conjugal affection to adeline the baron was from the first a sort of god who could do no wrong to him she owed everything fortune she had a carriage a fine house every luxury of the day happiness he was devoted to her in the face of the world a title for she was a baroness fame for she was spoken of as the beautiful madame hulot and in paris finally she had the honor of refusing the emperor's advances for napoleon made her a present of a diamond necklace and always remembered her asking now and again and is the beautiful madame hulot still a model of virtue in the tone of a man who might have taken his revenge on one who should have triumphed where he had failed so it needs no great intuition to discern what were the motives in a simple guileless and noble soul for the fanaticism of madame hulot's love having fully persuaded herself that her husband could do her no wrong she made herself in the depths of her heart the humble abject and blindfold slave of the man who had made her it must be noted too that she was gifted with great good sense the good sense of the people which made her education sound in society she spoke little and never spoke evil of any one she did not try to shine she thought out many things listened well and formed herself on the model of the best conducted women of good birth in eighteen fifteen hulot followed the lead of the prince de wissembourg his intimate friend and became one of the officers who organized the improvised troops whose rout brought the napoleonic cycle to a close at waterloo in eighteen sixteen the baron was one of the men best hated by the feltre administration and was not reinstated in the commissariat till eighteen twenty three when he was needed for the spanish war in eighteen thirty he took office as the fourth wheel of the coach at the time of the levies a sort of conscription made by louis philippe on the old napoleonic soldiery from the time when the younger branch ascended the throne having taken an active part in bringing that about he was regarded as an indispensable authority at the war office he had already won his marshal's baton and the king could do no more for him unless by making him minister or a peer of france from eighteen eighteen till eighteen twenty three having no official occupation baron hulot had gone on active service to womankind madame hulot dated her hector's first infidelities from the grand finale of the empire thus for twelve years the baroness had filled the part in her household of prima donna assoluta without a rival she still could boast of the old-fashioned inveterate affection which husbands feel for wives who are resigned to be gentle and virtuous helpmates she knew that if she had a rival that rival would not subsist for two hours under a word of reproof from herself but she shut her eyes she stopped her ears she would know nothing of her husband's proceedings outside his home in short she treated her hector as a mother treats a spoiled child three years before the conversation reported above hortense at the theatre des varietes had recognized her father in a lower tier stage box with jenny cadine and had exclaimed there is papa you are mistaken my darling he is at the marshal's the baroness replied she too had seen jenny cadine but instead of feeling a pang when she saw how pretty she was she said to herself that rascal hector must think himself very lucky she suffered nevertheless she gave herself up in secret to rages of torment 
but as soon as she saw hector she always remembered her twelve years of perfect happiness and could not find it in her to utter a word of complaint she would have been glad if the baron would have taken her into his confidence but she never dared to let him see that she knew of his kicking over the traces out of respect for her husband such an excess of delicacy is never met with but in those grand creatures daughters of the soil whose instinct it is to take blows without ever returning them the blood of the early martyrs still lives in their veins well-born women their husbands equals feel the impulse to annoy them to mark the points of their tolerance like points at billiards by some stinging word partly in the spirit of diabolical malice and to secure the upper hand or the right of turning the tables the baroness had an ardent admirer in her brother-in-law lieutenant-general hulot the venerable colonel of the grenadiers of the imperial infantry guard who was to have a marshal's baton in his old age this veteran after having served from eighteen thirty to eighteen thirty four as commandant of the military division including the departments of brittany the scene of his exploits in seventeen ninety nine and eighteen hundred had come to settle in paris near his brother for whom he had a fatherly affection this old soldier's heart was in sympathy with his sister-in-law he admired her as the noblest and saintliest of her sex he had never married because he hoped to find a second adeline though he had vainly sought for her through twenty campaigns in as many lands to maintain her place in the esteem of this blameless and spotless old republican of whom napoleon had said that brave old hulot is the most obstinate republican but he will never be false to me adeline would have endured griefs even greater than those that had just come upon her but the old soldier seventy-two years of age battered by thirty campaigns and wounded for the twenty-seventh time at waterloo was adeline's admirer and not a protector the poor old count among other infirmities could only hear through a speaking trumpet so long as baron hulot d'ervy was a fine man his flirtations did not damage his fortune but when a man is fifty the graces claim payment at that age love becomes vice insensate vanities come into play thus at about that time adeline saw that her husband was incredibly particular about his dress he dyed his hair and whiskers and wore a belt and stays he was determined to remain handsome at any cost this care of his person a weakness he had once mercilessly mocked at was carried out in the minutest details at last adeline perceived that the pactolus poured out before the baron's mistresses had its source in her pocket in eight years he had dissipated a considerable amount of money and so effectually that on his son's marriage two years previously the baron had been compelled to explain to his wife that his pay constituted their whole income what shall we come to asked adeline be quite easy said the official i will leave the whole of my salary in your hands and i will make a fortune for hortense and some savings for the future in business the wife's deep belief in her husband's power and superior talents in his capabilities and character had in fact for the moment allayed her anxiety End of chapter three Chapter Four of Cousin Betty by Honore de Balzac, translated by James Waring. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Chapter Four. What the Baroness's reflections and tears were after Crevel's departure may now be clearly imagined. The poor woman had for two years past known that she was at the bottom of a pit, but she had fancied herself alone in it how her son's marriage had been finally arranged she had not known she had known nothing of hector's connections with the grasping jewess and above all she hoped that no one in the world knew anything of her troubles now if crevel went about so ready to talk of the baron's excesses hector's reputation would suffer she could see under the angry ex-perfumer's coarse harangue the odious gossip behind the scenes which led to her son's marriage 
two reprobate hussies had been the priestesses of this union planned at some orgy amid the degrading familiarities of two tipsy old sinners and has he forgotten hortense she wondered but he sees her every day will he try to find her a husband among his good-for-nothing sluts at this moment it was the mother that spoke rather than the wife for she saw hortense laughing with her cousin betty the reckless laughter of heedless youth and she knew that such hysterical laughter was quite as distressing a symptom as the tearful reverie of solitary walks in the garden hortense was like her mother with golden hair that waved naturally and was amazingly long and thick her skin had the lustre of mother of pearl she was visibly the offspring of a true marriage of a pure and noble love in its prime there was a passionate vitality in her countenance a brilliancy of feature a full fount of youth a fresh vigour and abundance of health which radiated from her with electric flashes hortense invited the eye when her eye of deep ultramarine blue liquid with the moisture of innocent youth rested on a passer-by he was involuntarily thrilled nor did a single freckle mar her skin such as those with which many a white and golden maid pays toll for her milky whiteness tall round without being fat with a slender dignity as noble as her mother's she really deserved the name of goddess of which old authors were so lavish in fact those who saw hortense in the street could hardly restrain the exclamation what a beautiful girl she was so genuinely innocent that she could say to her mother what do they mean mamma by calling me a beautiful girl when i am with you are not you much handsomer than i am and in point of fact at seven-and-forty the baroness might have been preferred to her daughter by amateurs of sunset beauty for she had not yet lost any of her charms by one of those phenomena which are especially rare in paris where ninon was regarded as scandalous simply because she thus seemed to enjoy such an unfair advantage over the plainer women of the seventeenth century thinking of her daughter brought her back to the father she saw him sinking by degrees day after day down to the social mire and even dismissed some day from his appointment the idea of her idol's fall with a vague vision of the disasters prophesied by crevel was such a terror to the poor woman that she became wrapped in the contemplation like an ecstatic cousin betty from time to time as she chatted with hortense looked round to see when they might return to the drawing-room but her young cousin was pelting her with questions and at the moment when the baroness opened the glass door she did not happen to be looking lisbeth fisher though the daughter of the eldest of the three brothers was five years younger than madame hulot she was far from being as handsome as her cousin and had been desperately jealous of adeline jealousy was the fundamental passion of this character marked by eccentricities a word invented by the english to describe the craziness not of the asylum but of respectable households a native of the vosges a peasant in the fullest sense of the word lean brown with shining black hair and thick eyebrows joining in a tuft with long strong arms thick feet and some moles on her narrow simian face such is a brief description of the elderly virgin the family living all under one roof had sacrificed the common-looking girl to the beauty the bitter fruit to the splendid flower lisbeth worked in the fields while her cousin was indulged and one day when they were alone together she had tried to destroy adeline's nose a truly greek nose which the old mothers admired though she was beaten for this misdeed she persisted nevertheless in tearing the favorite's gowns and crumpling her collars at the time of adeline's wonderful marriage lisbeth had bowed to fate as napoleon's brothers and sisters bowed before the splendor of the throne and the force of authority adeline who was extremely sweet and kind remembered lisbeth when she found herself in paris and invited her there in eighteen hundred and nine intending to rescue her from poverty by finding her a husband 
but seeing that it was impossible to marry the girl out of hand with her black eyes and sooty brows unable to to read or write the baron began by apprenticing her to a business he placed her as a learner with the embroiderers to the imperial court the well-known Pons brothers lisbeth called betty for short having learned to embroider in gold and silver and possessing all the energy of a mountain race had determination enough to learn to read write and keep accounts for her cousin the baron had pointed out the necessity for these accomplishments if she hoped to set up in business as an embroiderer she was bent on making a fortune in two years she was another creature in eighteen eleven the peasant woman had become a very presentable skilled and intelligent forewoman her department that of gold and silver lace work as it is called included epaulettes sword knots aiguillettes in short the immense mass of glittering ornaments that sparkled on the rich uniforms of the french army and civil officials the emperor a true italian in his love of dress had overlaid the coats of all his servants with silver and gold and the empire included a hundred and thirty-three departments these ornaments usually supplied to tailors who were solvent and wealthy paymasters were a very secure branch of trade just when cousin betty the best hand in the house of Pons brothers where she was forewoman of the embroidery department might have set up in business on her own account the empire collapsed the olive branch of peace held out by the bourbons did not reassure lisbeth she feared a diminution of this branch of trade since henceforth there were to be but eighty-six departments to plunder instead of a hundred and thirty-three to say nothing of the immense reduction of the army utterly scared by the ups and downs of industry she refused the baron's offers of help and he thought she must be mad she confirmed this opinion by quarrelling with m rivet who bought the business of pons brothers and with whom the baron wished to place her in partnership she would be no more than a workwoman thus the fisher family had relapsed into the precarious mediocrity from which baron hulot had raised it the three brothers fisher who had been ruined by the abdication at fontainebleau in despair joined the irregular troops in eighteen fifteen the eldest lisbeth's father was killed adeline's father sentenced to death by court-martial fled to germany and died at treves in eighteen twenty johann the youngest came to paris a petitioner to the queen of the family who was said to dine off gold and silver plate and never to be seen at a party but with diamonds in her hair as big as hazelnuts given to her by the emperor johann fischer then aged forty-three obtained from baron hulot a capital of ten thousand francs with which to start a small business as forage dealer at versailles under the patronage of the war office through the influence of the friends still in office of the late commissary-general these family catastrophes baron hulot's dismissal and the knowledge that he was a mere cipher in that immense stir of men and interests and things which makes paris at once a paradise and a hell quite quelled lisbeth fischer she gave up all idea of rivalry and comparison with her cousin after feeling her great superiority but envy still lurked in her heart like a plague germ that may hatch and devastate a city if the fatal bale of wool is opened in which it is concealed now and again indeed she said to herself adeline and i are the same flesh and blood our fathers were brothers and she is in a mansion while i am in a garret but every new year lisbeth had presents from the baron and baroness the baron who was always good to her paid for her firewood in the winter old general hulot had her to dinner once a week and there was always a cover laid for her at her cousin's table they laughed at her no doubt but they never were ashamed to own her in short they had made her independent in paris where she lived as she pleased the old maid had in fact a terror of any kind of tie her cousin had offered her a room in her own house lisbeth suspected the halter of domestic servitude several times the baron had found a solution of the difficult problem of her marriage 
but though tempted in the first instance she would presently decline fearing lest she should be scorned for her want of education her general ignorance and her poverty finally when the baroness suggested that she should live with their uncle johann and keep house for him instead of the upper servant who must cost him dear lisbeth replied that that was the very last way she should think of marrying lisbeth fischer had the sort of strangeness in her ideas which is often noticeable in characters that have developed late in savages who think much and speak little her peasant's wit had acquired a good deal of parisian asperity from hearing the talk of workshops and mixing with workmen and workwomen she whose character had a marked resemblance to that of the corsicans worked upon without fruition by the instincts of a strong nature would have liked to be the protectress of a weak man but as a result of living in the capital the capital had altered her superficially parisian polish became rust on this coarsely tempered soul gifted with a cunning which had become unfathomable as it always does in those whose celibacy is genuine with the originality and sharpness with which she clothed her ideas in any other position she would have been formidable full of spite she was capable of bringing discord into the most united family in early days when she indulged in certain secret hopes which she confided to none she took to wearing stays and dressing in the fashion and so shone in splendor for a short time that the baron thought her marriageable lisbeth at that stage was the piquant brunette of old-fashioned novels her piercing glance her olive skin her reed-like figure might invite a half-pay major but she was satisfied she would say laughing with her own admiration and indeed she found her life pleasant enough when she had freed it from practical anxieties for she dined out every evening after working hard from sunrise thus she had only her rent and her midday meal to provide for she had most of her clothes given her and a variety of very acceptable stores such as coffee sugar wine and so forth in eighteen thirty seven after living for twenty-seven years half maintained by the hulots and her uncle fischer cousin betty resigned to being nobody allowed herself to be treated so she herself refused to appear at any grand dinners preferring the family party where she held her own and was spared all slights to her pride wherever she went at general hulot's at Cravel's, at the house of the young hulot's or at rivet's pons's successor with whom she made up her quarrel and who made much of her and at the baroness's table she was treated as one of the family in fact she managed to make friends of the servants by making them an occasional small present and always gossiping with them for a few minutes before going into the drawing-room this familiarity by which she uncompromisingly put herself on their level conciliated their servile good nature which is indispensable to a parasite she is a good steady woman was everybody's verdict her willingness to oblige which knew no bounds when it was not demanded of her was indeed like her assumed bluntness a necessity of her position she had at length understood what her life must be seeing that she was at everybody's mercy and needing to please everybody she would laugh with young people who liked her for a sort of wheedling flattery which always wins them guessing and taking part with their fancies she would make herself their spokeswoman and they thought her a delightful confidante since she had no right to find fault with them her absolute secrecy also won her the confidence of their seniors for like ninon she had certain manly qualities as a rule our confidence is given to those below rather than above us we employ our inferiors rather than our betters in secret transactions and they thus become the recipients of our inmost thoughts and look on at our meditations richelieu thought he had achieved success when he was admitted to the council this penniless woman was supposed to be so dependent on every one about her that she seemed doomed to perfect silence she herself called herself the family confessional the baroness only remembering her ill usage in childhood by the cousin who though younger was stronger than herself never wholly trusted her 
besides out of sheer modesty she would never have told her domestic sorrows to any one but god it may here be well to add that the baron's house preserved all its magnificence in the eyes of lisbeth fisher who was not struck as the parvenu perfumer had been with the penury stamped on the shabby chairs the dirty hangings and the ripped silk the furniture we live with is in some sort like our own person seeing ourselves every day we end like the baron by thinking ourselves but little altered and still youthful when others see that our head is covered with chinchilla our forehead scarred with circumflex accents our stomach assuming the rotundity of a pumpkin so these rooms always blazing in betty's eyes with the bengal fire of imperial victory were to her perennially splendid as time went on lisbeth had contracted some rather strange old maidish habits for instance instead of following the fashions she expected the fashion to accept her ways and yield to her always out-of-date notions when the baroness gave her a pretty new bonnet or a gown in the fashion of the day betty remade it completely at home and spoilt it by producing a dress of the style of the empire or of her old lorraine costume a thirty-franc bonnet came out a rag and the gown a disgrace on this point lisbeth was as obstinate as a mule she would please no one but herself and believed herself charming whereas the assimilative process harmonious no doubt in so far as that it stamped her for an old maid from head to foot made her so ridiculous that with the best will in the world no one could admit her on any smart occasion this refractory capricious and independent spirit and the inexplicable wild shyness of the woman for whom the baron had four times found a match an employee in his office a retired major an army contractor and a half-pay captain while she had refused an army lace-maker who had since made his fortune had won her the name of the nanny goat which the baron gave her in jest but this nickname only met the peculiarities that lay on the surface the eccentricities which each of us displays to his neighbors in social life this woman who if closely studied would have shown the most savage traits of the peasant class was still the girl who had clawed her cousin's nose and who if she had not been trained to reason would perhaps have killed her in a fit of jealousy it was only her knowledge of the laws and of the world that enabled her to control the swift instinct with which country folk like wild men reduce impulse to action in this alone perhaps lies the difference between natural and civilized man the savage has only impulse the civilized man has impulses and ideas and in the savage the brain retains as we may say but few impressions it is wholly at the mercy of the feeling that rushes in upon it while in the civilized man ideas sink into the heart and change it he has a thousand interests and many feelings where the savage has but one at a time this is the cause of the transient ascendancy of a child over its parents which ceases as soon as it is satisfied in the man who is still one with nature this contrast is constant cousin betty a savage of lorraine somewhat treacherous too was of this class of natures which are commoner among the lower orders than is supposed accounting for the conduct of the populace during revolutions at the time when this drama opens if cousin betty would have allowed herself to be dressed like other people if like the women of paris she had been accustomed to wear each fashion in its turn she would have been presentable and acceptable but she preserved the stiffness of a stick now a woman devoid of all the graces in paris simply does not exist the fine but hard eyes the severe features the calabrian fixity of complexion which made lisbeth like a figure by giotto and of which a true parisian would have taken advantage above all her strange way of dressing gave her such an extraordinary appearance that she sometimes looked like one of those monkeys in petticoats taken about by little savoyards 
as she was well known in the houses connected by family which she frequented and restricted her social efforts to that little circle as she liked her own home her singularities no longer astonished anybody and out of doors they were lost in the immense stir of paris street life where only pretty women are ever looked at hortense's laughter was at this moment caused by a victory won over her cousin lisbeth's perversity she had just wrung from her an avowal she had been hoping for these three years past however secretive an old maid may be there is one sentiment which will always avail to make her break her fast from words and that is her vanity for the last three years hortense having become very inquisitive on such matters had pestered her cousin with questions which however bore the stamp of perfect innocence she wanted to know why her cousin had never married hortense who knew of the five offers that she had refused had constructed her little romance she supposed that lisbeth had had a passionate attachment and a war of banter was the result hortense would talk of we young girls when speaking of herself and her cousin cousin betty had on several occasions answered in the same tone and who says i have not a lover so cousin betty's lover real or fictitious became a subject of mild jesting at last after two years of this petty warfare the last time lisbeth had come to the house hortense's first question had been and how is your lover pretty well thank you was the answer he is rather ailing poor young man he has delicate health asked the baroness laughing i should think so he is fair a sooty thing like me can love none but a fair man with a color like the moon but who is he what does he do asked hortense is he a prince a prince of artisans as i am a queen of the bobbin is a poor woman like me likely to find a lover in a man with a fine house and money in the funds or in a duke of the realm or some prince charming out of a fairy tale oh i should so much like to see him cried hortense smiling to see what a man can be like who can love the nanny goat retorted lisbeth he must be some monster of an old clerk with a goat's beard hortense said to her mother well then you are quite mistaken mademoiselle then you mean that you really have a lover hortense exclaimed in triumph as sure as you have not retorted lisbeth nettled but if you have a lover why don't you marry him lisbeth said the baroness shaking her head at her daughter we have been hearing rumors about him these three years you have had time to study him and if he has been faithful so long you should not persist in a delay which must be hard upon him after all it is a matter of conscience and if he is young it is time to take a brevet of dignity cousin betty had fixed her gaze on adeline and seeing that she was jesting she replied it would be marrying hunger and thirst he is a workman i am a workwoman if we had children they would be workmen no no we love each other spiritually it is less expensive why do you keep him in hiding hortense asked he wears a round jacket replied the old maid laughing you truly love him the baroness inquired i believe you i love him for his own sake the dear cherub for four years his home has been in my heart well then if you love him for himself said the baroness gravely and if he really exists you are treating him criminally you do not know how to love truly we all know that from our birth said lisbeth no there are women who love and yet are selfish and that is your case cousin betty's head fell and her glance would have made any one shiver who had seen it but her eyes were on her reel of thread if you would introduce your so-called lover to us hector might find him employment or put him in a position to make money that is out of the question said cousin betty and why he is a sort of pole a refugee a conspirator cried hortense what luck for you has he had any adventures he has fought for poland he was a professor in the school where the students began the rebellion and as he had been placed there by the grand duke constantine he has no hope of mercy 
a professor of what of fine arts and he came to paris when the rebellion was quelled in eighteen thirty three he came through germany on foot poor young man and how old is he he was just four-and-twenty when the insurrection broke out he is twenty-nine now fifteen years your junior said the baroness and what does he live on asked hortense his talent oh he gives lessons no said cousin betty he gets them and hard ones too and his christian name is it a pretty name wenceslas what a wonderful imagination you old maids have exclaimed the baroness to hear you talk lisbeth one might really believe you you see mamma he is a pole and so accustomed to the knout that lisbeth reminds him of the joys of his native land they all three laughed and hortense sang wenceslas idole de mon âme instead of o mathilde then for a few minutes there was a truce End of chapter 4chapter five of cousin betty by honore de balzac translated by james waring this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by bruce peary chapter five these children said cousin betty looking at hortense as she went up to her fancy that no one but themselves can have lovers listen hortense replied finding herself alone with her cousin if you prove to me that wenceslas is not a pure invention i will give you my yellow cashmere shawl he is a count every pole is a count but he is not a pole he comes from liva litha lithuania no livonia yes that's it but what is his name i wonder if you are capable of keeping a secret cousin betty i will be as mute as a fish as a fish by your life eternal by my life eternal no by your happiness in this world yes well then his name is wenceslas steinbach one of charles the second's generals was named steinbach he was his granduncle his own father settled in livonia after the death of the king of sweden but he lost all his fortune during the campaign of eighteen twelve and died leaving the poor boy at the age of eight without a penny the grand duke constantine for the honor of the name of steinbach took him under his protection and sent him to school i will not break my word hortense replied prove his existence and you shall have the yellow shawl the color is most becoming to dark skins and you will keep my secret and tell you mine well then the next time i come you shall have the proof but the proof will be the lover said hortense cousin betty who since her first arrival in paris had been bitten by a mania for shawls was bewitched by the idea of owning the yellow cashmere given to his wife by the baron in eighteen hundred and eight and handed down from mother to daughter after the manner of some families in eighteen thirty the shawl had been a good deal worn ten years ago but the costly object now always kept in its sandalwood box seemed to the old maid ever new like the drawing-room furniture so she brought in her handbag a present for the baroness's birthday by which she proposed to prove the existence of her romantic lover this present was a silver seal formed of three little figures back to back wreathed with foliage and supporting the globe they represented faith hope and charity their feet rested on monsters rending each other among them the symbolical serpent in eighteen forty six now that such immense strides have been made in the art of which benvenuto cellini was the master by mademoiselle de fauveau wagner chanet fromont maurice and wood-carvers like lienard this little masterpiece would amaze nobody but at that time a girl who understood the silversmith's art stood astonished as she held the seal which lisbeth put into her hands saying there what do you think of that in design attitude and drapery the figures were of the school of raphael 
but the execution was in the style of the florentine metal workers the school created by donatello brunelleschi ghiberti benvenuto cellini john of bologna and others the french masters of the renaissance had never invented more strangely twining monsters than these that symbolized the evil passions the palms ferns reeds and foliage that wreathed the virtues showed a style a taste a handling that might have driven a practised craftsman to despair a scroll floated above the three figures and on its surface between the heads were a w a chamois and the word fake it who carved this asked hortense well just my lover replied lisbeth there are ten months work in it i could earn more at making sword knots he told me that steinbach means a rock goat a chamois in german and he intends to mark all his work in that way aha i shall have the shawl what for do you suppose i could buy such a thing or order it impossible well then it must have been given to me and who would make me such a present a lover hortense with an artfulness that would have frightened lisbeth fischer if she had detected it took care not to express all her admiration though she was full of the delight which every soul that is open to a sense of beauty must feel on seeing a faultless piece of work perfect and unexpected on my word said she it is very pretty yes it is pretty said her cousin but i like an orange-coloured shawl better well child my lover spends his time in doing such work as that since he came to paris he has turned out three or four little trifles in that style and that is the fruit of four years study and toil he has served as apprentice to founders metal casters and goldsmiths there he has paid away thousands and hundreds of francs and my gentleman tells me that in a few months now he will be famous and rich then you often see him bless me do you think it is all a fable i told you truth in jest and he is in love with you asked hortense eagerly he adores me replied lisbeth very seriously you see child he had never seen any women but the washed-out pale things they all are in the north and a slender brown youthful thing like me warmed his heart but mum you promised you know and he will fare like the five others said the girl ironically as she looked at the seal six others miss i left one in lorraine who to this day would fetch the moon down for me this one does better than that said hortense he has brought down the sun where can that be turned into money asked her cousin it takes wide lands to benefit by the sunshine these witticisms fired in quick retort and leading to the sort of giddy play that may be imagined had given cause for the laughter which had added to the baroness's troubles by making her compare her daughter's future lot with the present when she was free to indulge the light-heartedness of youth but to give you a gem which cost him six months of work he must be under some great obligations to you said hortense in whom the silver seal had suggested very serious reflections oh you want to know too much at once said her cousin but listen i will let you into a little plot is your lover in it too oh you want so much to see him but as you may suppose an old maid like cousin betty who had managed to keep a lover for five years keeps him well hidden now just let me alone you see i have neither cat nor canary nor dog nor a parrot and the old nanny goat wanted something to pet and tease so i treated myself to a polish count has he a moustache as long as that said lisbeth holding up her shuttle filled with gold thread she always took her lace-work with her and worked till dinner was served if you ask too many questions you will be told nothing she went on you are but two and twenty and you chatter more than i do though i am forty-two not to say forty-three i am listening i am a wooden image said hortense my lover has finished a bronze group ten inches high lisbeth went on it represents samson slaying a lion and he has kept it buried till it is so rusty that you might believe it to be as old as samson himself 
this fine piece is shown at the shop of one of the old curiosity sellers on the place du carrousel near my lodgings now your father knows m papineau the minister of commerce and agriculture and the comte de rastignac and if he would mention the group to them as a fine antique he had seen by chance it seems that such things take the fancy of your grand folks who don't care so much about gold lace and that my man's fortune would be made if one of them would buy or even look at the wretched piece of metal the poor fellow is sure that it might be mistaken for old work and that the rubbish is worth a great deal of money and then if one of the ministers should purchase the group he would go to pay his respects and prove that he was the maker and be almost carried in triumph oh he believes he has reached the pinnacle poor young man and he is as proud as two newly made counts michelangelo over again but for a lover he has kept his head on his shoulders said hortense and how much does he want for it fifteen hundred francs the dealer will not let it go for less since he must make his commission papa is in the king's household just now said hortense he sees those two ministers every day at the chamber and he will do the thing i undertake that you will be a rich woman madame la comtesse de steinbach no the boy is too lazy for whole weeks he sits twiddling with bits of red wax and nothing comes of it why he spends all his days at the louvre and the library looking at prints and sketching things he is an idler the cousins chatted and giggled hortense laughing a forced laugh for she was invaded by a kind of love which every girl has gone through the love of the unknown love in its vaguest form when every thought is accreted round some form which is suggested by a chance word as the efflorescence of hoar-frost gathers about a straw that the wind has blown against the window-sill for the past ten months she had made a reality of her cousin's imaginary romance believing like her mother that lisbeth would never marry and now within a week this visionary being had become comte wenceslas steinbach the dream had a certificate of birth the wraith had solidified into a young man of thirty the seal she held in her hand a sort of annunciation in which genius shone like an imminent light had the powers of a talisman hortense felt such a surge of happiness that she almost doubted whether the tale were true there was a ferment in her blood and she laughed wildly to deceive her cousin but i think the drawing-room door is open said lisbeth let us go and see if monsieur crevel is gone mamma has been very much out of spirits these two days i suppose the marriage under discussion has come to nothing oh it may come on again he is i may tell you so much a counsellor of the supreme court how would you like to be madame la presidente if monsieur crevel has a finger in it he will tell me about it if i ask him i shall know by to-morrow if there is any hope leave the seal with me said hortense i will not show it mamma's birthday is not for a month yet i will give it to you that morning no no give it back to me it must have a case but i will let papa see it that he may know what he is talking about to the ministers for men in authority must be careful what they say urged the girl well do not show it to your mother that is all i ask for if she believed i had a lover she would make game of me i promise the cousins reached the drawing-room just as the baroness turned faint her daughter's cry of alarm recalled her to herself lisbeth went off to fetch some salts when she came back she found the mother and daughter in each other's arms the baroness soothing her daughter's fears and saying it was nothing a little nervous attack there is your father she added recognizing the baron's way of ringing the bell say not a word to him adeline rose and went to meet her husband intending to take him into the garden and talk to him till dinner should be served of the difficulties about the proposed match getting him to come to some decision as to the future and trying to hint at some warning advice baron hector hulot came in in a dress at once lawyer-like and napoleonic 
for imperial men men who had been attached to the emperor were easily distinguishable by their military deportment their blue coats with gilt buttons buttoned to the chin their black silk stock and an authoritative demeanor acquired from a habit of command in circumstances requiring despotic rapidity there was nothing of the old man in the baron it must be admitted his sight was still so good that he could read without spectacles his handsome oval face framed in whiskers that were indeed too black showed a brilliant complexion ruddy with the veins that characterize a sanguine temperament and his stomach kept in order by a belt had not exceeded the limits of the majestic as bria savarin says a fine aristocratic air and great affability served to conceal the libertine with whom crevel had had such high times he was one of those men whose eyes always light up at the sight of a pretty woman even of such as merely pass by never to be seen again have you been speaking my dear asked adeline seeing him with an anxious brow no replied hector but i am worn out with hearing others speak for two hours without coming to a vote they carry on a war of words in which their speeches are like a cavalry charge which has no effect on the enemy talk has taken the place of action which goes very much against the grain of men who are accustomed to marching orders as i said to the marshal when i left him however i have enough of being bored on the minister's bench here i may play how do la chevre good morning little kid and he took his daughter round the neck kissed her and made her sit on his knee resting her head on his shoulder that he might feel her soft golden hair against his cheek he is tired and worried said his wife to herself i shall only worry him more i will wait are you going to be at home this evening she asked him no children after dinner i must go out if it had not been the day when lisbeth and the children and my brother come to dinner you would not have seen me at all the baroness took up the newspaper looked down the list of theatres and laid it down again when she had seen that robert le diable was to be given at the opera josepha who had left the italian opera six months since for the french opera was to take the part of alice this little pantomime did not escape the baron who looked hard at his wife adeline cast down her eyes and went out into the garden her husband followed her come what is it adeline said he putting his arm round her waist and pressing her to his side do not you know that i love you more than more than jenny cadine or josepha said she boldly interrupting him who put that into your head exclaimed the baron releasing his wife and starting back a step or two i got an anonymous letter which i burnt at once in which i was told my dear that the reason hortense's marriage was broken off was the poverty of our circumstances your wife my dear hector would never have said a word she knew of your connection with jenny cadine and did she ever complain but as the mother of hortense i am bound to speak the truth hulot after a short silence which was terrible to his wife whose heart beat loud enough to be heard opened his arms clasped her to his heart kissed her forehead and said with the vehemence of enthusiasm adeline you are an angel and i am a wretch no no cried the baroness hastily laying her hand upon his lips to hinder him from speaking evil of himself yes for i have not at this moment a sou to give to hortense and i am most unhappy but since you open your heart to me i may pour into it the trouble that is crushing me your uncle fisher is in difficulties and it is i who dragged him there for he has accepted bills for me to the amount of twenty-five thousand francs and all for a woman who deceives me who laughs at me behind my back and calls me an old dyed tom it is frightful a vice which costs me more than it would to maintain a family and i cannot resist i would promise you here and now never to see that abominable jewess again but if she wrote me two lines i should go to her as we marched into fire under the emperor do not be so distressed cried the poor woman in despair but forgetting her daughter as she saw the tears in her husband's eyes 
there are my diamonds whatever happens save my uncle your diamonds are worth scarcely twenty thousand francs nowadays that would not be enough for old fisher so keep them for hortense i will see the marshal to-morrow my poor dear said the baroness taking her hector's hands and kissing them this was all the scolding he got adeline sacrificed her jewels the father made them a present to hortense she regarded this as a sublime action and she was helpless he is the master he could take everything and he leaves me my diamonds he is divine this was the current of her thoughts and indeed the wife had gained more by her sweetness than another perhaps could have achieved by a fit of angry jealousy the moralist cannot deny that as a rule well-bred though very wicked men are far more attractive and lovable than virtuous men having crimes to atone for they crave indulgence by anticipation by being lenient to the shortcomings of those who judge them and they are thought most kind though there are no doubt some charming people among the virtuous virtue considers itself fair enough unadorned to be at no pains to please and then all really virtuous persons for the hypocrites do not count have some slight doubts as to their position they believe that they are cheated in the bargain of life on the whole and they indulge in acid comments after the fashion of those who think themselves unappreciated hence the baron who accused himself of ruining his family displayed all his charm of wit and his most seductive graces for the benefit of his wife for his children and his cousin lisbeth then when his son arrived with celestine crevel's daughter who was nursing the infant hulot he was delightful to his daughter-in-law loading her with compliments a treat to which celestine's vanity was little accustomed for no moneyed bride more commonplace or more utterly insignificant was ever seen the grandfather took the baby from her kissed it declared it was a beauty and a darling he spoke to it in baby language prophesied that it would grow to be taller than himself insinuated compliments for his son's benefit and restored the child to the normandy nurse who had charge of it celestine on her part gave the baroness a look as much as to say what a delightful man and she naturally took her father-in-law's part against her father after thus playing the charming father-in-law and the indulgent grandpapa the baron took his son into the garden and laid before him a variety of observations full of good sense as to the attitude to be taken up by the chamber on a certain ticklish question which had that morning come under discussion the young lawyer was struck with admiration for the depth of his father's insight touched by his cordiality and especially by the deferential tone which seemed to place the two men on a footing of equality m hulot junior was in every respect the young frenchman as he has been moulded by the revolution of eighteen thirty his mind infatuated with politics respectful of his own hopes and concealing them under an affectation of gravity very envious of successful men making sententiousness do the duty of witty rejoinders the gems of the french language with a high sense of importance and mistaking arrogance for dignity such men are walking coffins each containing a frenchman of the past now and again the frenchman wakes up and kicks against his english-made casing but ambition stifles him and he submits to be smothered the coffin is always covered with black cloth ah here is my brother said baron hulot going to meet the count at the drawing-room door having greeted the probable successor of the late marshal montcornet he led him forward by the arm with every show of affection and respect the older man a member of the chamber of peers but excused from attendance on account of his deafness had a handsome head chilled by age but with enough gray hair still to be marked in a circle by the pressure of his hat he was short square and shrunken but carried his hale old age with a free and easy air and as he was full of excessive activity which had now no purpose he divided his time between reading and taking exercise 
in a drawing-room he devoted his attention to waiting on the wishes of the ladies you are very merry here said he seeing that the baron shed a spirit of animation on the little family gathering and yet hortense is not married he added noticing a trace of melancholy on his sister-in-law's countenance that will come all in good time lisbeth shouted in his ear in a formidable voice so there you are you wretched seedling that could never blossom said he laughing the hero of fortsheim rather liked cousin betty for there were certain points of resemblance between them a man of the ranks without any education his courage had been the sole mainspring of his military promotion and sound sense had taken the place of brilliancy of the highest honor and clean-handed he was ending a noble life in full contentment in the centre of his family which claimed all his affections and without a suspicion of his brother's still undiscovered misconduct no one enjoyed more than he the pleasing sight of this family party where there never was the smallest disagreement for the brothers and sisters were all equally attached celestine having been at once accepted as one of the family but the worthy little count wondered now and then why monsieur crevel never joined the party papa is in the country celestine shouted and it was explained to him that the ex-perfumer was away from home this perfect union of all her family made madame hulot say to herself this after all is the best kind of happiness and who can deprive us of it the general on seeing his favorite adeline the object of her husband's attentions laughed so much about it that the baron fearing to seem ridiculous transferred his gallantries to his daughter-in-law who at these family dinners was always the object of his flattery and kind care for he hoped to win crevel back through her and make him forego his resentment any one seeing this domestic scene would have found it hard to believe that the father was at his wit's end the mother in despair the son anxious beyond words as to his father's future fate and the daughter on the point of robbing her cousin of her lover end of chapter five Chapter Six of Cousin Betty by Honoré de Balzac, translated by James Waring. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Chapter Six. At seven o'clock, the Baron, seeing his brother, his son, the Baroness, and Hortense all engaged at whist, went off to applaud his mistress at the opera, taking with him Lisbeth Fisher, who lived in the Rue du Doyenne and who always made an excuse of the solitude of that deserted quarter to take herself off as soon as dinner was over parisians will all admit that the old maid's prudence was but rational the existence of the maze of houses under the wing of the old louvre is one of those protests against obvious good sense which frenchmen love that europe may reassure itself as to the quantum of brains they are known to have and not be too much alarmed perhaps without knowing it this reveals some profound political idea it will surely not be a work of supererogation to describe this part of paris as it is even now when we could hardly expect its survival and our grandsons who will no doubt see the louvre finished may refuse to believe that such a relic of barbarism should have survived for six and thirty years in the heart of paris and in the face of the palace where three dynasties of kings have received during those thirty-six years the elite of france and of europe between the little gate leading to the bridge of the carousel and the rue du musee every one having come to paris were it but for a few days must have seen a dozen of houses with a decayed frontage where the dejected owners have attempted no repairs the remains of an old block of buildings of which the destruction was begun at the time when napoleon determined to complete the louvre this street and the blind alley known as the impasse du doyenne are the only passages into this gloomy and forsaken block inhabited perhaps by ghosts for there never is anybody to be seen the pavement is much below the footway of the rue du musee on a level with that of the rue froid thus half sunken by the raising of the soil 
these houses are also wrapped in the perpetual shadow cast by the lofty buildings of the louvre darkened on that side by the northern blast darkness silence an icy chill and the cavernous depth of the soil combine to make these houses a kind of crypt tombs of the living as we drive in a hackney cab past this dead alive spot and chance to look down the little rue du doyenne a shudder freezes the soul and we wonder who can lie there and what things may be done there at night at an hour when the alley is a cut-throat pit and the vices of paris run riot there under the cloak of night this question frightful in itself becomes appalling when we note that these dwelling-houses are shut in on the side towards the rue de richelieu by marshy ground by a sea of tumbled paving stones between them and the tuileries by little garden plots and suspicious-looking hovels on the side of the great galleries and by a desert of building-stone and old rubbish on the side towards the old louvre henri the third and his favourites in search of their trunk hose and marguerite's lovers in search of their heads must dance sarabands by moonlight in this wilderness overlooked by the roof of a chapel still standing there as if to prove that the catholic religion so deeply rooted in france survives all else for forty years now has the louvre been crying out by every gap in these damaged walls by every yawning window rid me of these warts upon my face this cut-throat lane has no doubt been regarded as useful and has been thought necessary as symbolizing in the heart of paris the intimate connection between poverty and the splendor that is characteristic of the queen of cities and indeed these chill ruins among which the legitimist newspaper contracted the disease it is dying of the abominable hovels of the rue du musee and the hoarding appropriated by the shop stalls that flourish there will perhaps live longer and more prosperously than three successive dynasties in eighteen twenty three the low rents in these already condemned houses had tempted lisbeth fisher to settle there notwithstanding the necessity imposed upon her by the state of the neighbourhood to get home before nightfall this necessity however was in accordance with the country habits she retained of rising and going to bed with the sun an arrangement which saves country folk considerable sums in lights and fuel she lived in one of the houses which since the demolition of the famous hotel cambacerez command a view of the square just as baron hulot set his wife's cousin down at the door of this house saying good-night cousin an elegant-looking woman young small slender pretty beautifully dressed and redolent of some delicate perfume passed between the wall and the carriage to go in this lady without any premeditation glanced up at the baron merely to see the lodger's cousin and the libertine at once felt the swift impression which all parisians know on meeting a pretty woman realizing as entomologists have it their desiderata so he waited to put on one of his gloves with judicious deliberation before getting into the carriage again to give himself an excuse for allowing his eye to follow the young woman whose skirts were pleasingly set out by something else than these odious and delusive crinoline bustles that said he to himself is a nice little person whose happiness i should like to provide for as she would certainly secure mine when the unknown fair had gone into the hall at the foot of the stairs going up to the front rooms she glanced at the gate out of the corner of her eye without precisely looking round and she could see the baron riveted to the spot in admiration consumed by curiosity and desire this is to every parisian woman a sort of flower which she smells at with delight if she meets it on her way nay certain women though faithful to their duties pretty and virtuous come home much put out if they have failed to call such a posy in the course of their walk the lady ran upstairs and in a moment a window on the second floor was thrown open and she appeared at it but accompanied by a man whose bald head and somewhat scowling looks announced him as her husband if they aren't sharp and ingenious the cunning jades thought the baron 
she does that to show me where she lives but this is getting rather warm especially for this part of paris we must mind what we are at as he got into the milord he looked up and the lady and the husband hastily vanished as though the baron's face had affected them like the mythological head of medusa it would seem that they know me thought the baron that would account for everything as the carriage went up the rue de musee he leaned forward to see the lady again and in fact she was again at the window ashamed of being caught gazing at the hood under which her admirer was sitting the unknown started back at once nanny shall tell me who it is said the baron to himself the sight of the government official had as will be seen made a deep impression on this couple why it is baron hulot the chief of the department to which my office belongs exclaimed the husband as he left the window well marneffe the old maid on the third floor at the back of the courtyard who lives with that young man is his cousin is it not odd that we should never have known that till to-day and now find it out by chance mademoiselle fischer living with a young man repeated the husband that is porter's gossip do not speak so lightly of the cousin of a councillor of state who can blow hot and cold in the office as he pleases now come to dinner i have been waiting for you since four o'clock pretty very pretty madame marneffe the natural daughter of comte montcornet one of napoleon's most famous officers had on the strength of a marriage portion of twenty thousand francs found a husband in an inferior official at the war office through the interest of the famous lieutenant-general made marshal of france six months before his death this quill-driver had risen to unhoped-for dignity as head clerk of his office but just as he was to be promoted to be deputy chief the marshal's death had cut off marneffe's ambitions and his wife's at the root the very small salary enjoyed by sieur marneffe had compelled the couple to economize in the matter of rent for in his hands mademoiselle valerie fortin's fortune had already melted away partly in paying his debts and partly in the purchase of necessaries for furnishing a house but chiefly in gratifying the requirements of a pretty young wife accustomed in her mother's house to luxuries she did not choose to dispense with the situation of the rue du doyenne within easy distance of the war office and the gay part of paris smiled on monsieur and madame marneffe and for the last four years they had dwelt under the same roof as lisbeth fischer monsieur jean paul stanislas marneffe was one of the class of employees who escape sheer brutishness by the kind of power that comes of depravity the small lean creature with thin hair and a starved beard an unwholesome pasty face worn rather than wrinkled with red-lidded eyes harnessed with spectacles shuffling in his gait and yet meaner in his appearance realized the type of man that any one would conceive of as likely to be placed in the dock for an offence against decency the rooms inhabited by this couple had the illusory appearance of sham luxury seen in many paris homes and typical of a certain class of household in the drawing-room the furniture covered with shabby cotton velvet the plaster statuettes pretending to be florentine bronze the clumsy cast chandelier merely lacquered with cheap glass saucers the carpet whose small cost was accounted for in advancing life by the quality of cotton used in the manufacture now visible to the naked eye everything down to the curtains which plainly showed that worsted damask has not three years of prime proclaimed poverty as loudly as a beggar in rags at a church door the dining-room badly kept by a single servant had the sickening aspect of a country inn everything looked greasy and unclean monsieur's room very like a schoolboy's furnished with the bed and fittings remaining from his bachelor days as shabby and worn as he was dusted perhaps once a week that horrible room where everything was in a litter with old socks hanging over the horsehair seated chairs the pattern outlined in dust was that of a man to whom home is a matter of indifference who lives out of doors gambling in cafes or elsewhere 
madame's room was an exception to the squalid slovenliness that disgraced the living-rooms where the curtains were yellow with smoke and dust and where the child evidently left to himself littered every spot with his toys valerie's room and dressing-room were situated in the part of the house which on one side of the courtyard joined the front half looking out on the street to the wing forming the inner side of the court backing against the adjoining property handsomely hung with chintz furnished with rosewood and thickly carpeted they proclaimed themselves as belonging to a pretty woman and indeed suggested the kept mistress a clock in the fashionable style stood on the velvet-covered mantelpiece there was a nicely fitted cabinet and the chinese flower stands were handsomely filled the bed the toilet table the wardrobe with its mirror the little sofa and all the ladies frippery bore the stamp of fashion or caprice though everything was quite third-rate as to elegance or quality and nothing was absolutely newer than three years old a dandy would have had no fault to find but that the taste of all this luxury was commonplace art and the distinction that comes of the choice of things that taste assimilates was entirely wanting a doctor of social science would have detected a lover in two or three specimens of costly trumpery which could only have come there through that demigod always absent but always present if the lady is married the dinner four hours behind time to which the husband wife and child sat down betrayed the financial straits in which the household found itself for the table is the surest thermometer for gauging the income of a parisian family vegetable soup made with the water haricot beans had been boiled in a piece of stewed veal and potatoes sodden with water by way of gravy a dish of haricot beans and cheap cherries served and eaten in cracked plates and dishes with the dull-looking and dull-sounding forks of german silver was this a banquet worthy of this pretty young woman the baron would have wept could he have seen it the dingy decanters could not disguise the vile hue of wine bought by the pint at the nearest wine-shop the table napkins had seen a week's use in short everything betrayed undignified penury and the equal indifference of the husband and wife to the decencies of home the most superficial observer on seeing them would have said that these two beings had come to the stage when the necessity of living had prepared them for any kind of dishonor that might bring luck to them valerie's first words to her husband will explain the delay that had postponed the dinner by the not disinterested devotion of the cook Seminole will only take your bills at fifty per cent and insists on a lien on your salary as security so poverty still unconfessed in the house of the superior official and hidden under a stipend of twenty four thousand francs irrespective of presence had reached its lowest stage in that of the clerk you have caught on with the chief said the man looking at his wife i rather think so replied she understanding the full meaning of his slang expression what is to become of us marneffe went on the landlord will be down on us to-morrow and to think of your father dying without making a will on my honour these men of the empire all think themselves as immortal as their emperor poor father said she i was his only child and he was very fond of me the countess probably burned the will how could he forget me when he used to give us as much as three or four thousand franc notes at once from time to time we owe four quarters rent fifteen hundred francs is the furniture worth so much that is the question as shakespeare says now good-bye ducky said valerie who had only eaten a few mouthfuls of the veal from which the maid had extracted all the gravy for a brave soldier just home from algiers great evils demand heroic remedies valerie where are you off to cried marneffe standing between his wife and the door i am going to see the landlord she replied arranging her ringlets under her smart bonnet you had better try to make friends with that old maid if she really is your chief's cousin 
the ignorance in which the dwellers under one roof can exist as to the social position of their fellow lodgers is a permanent fact which as much as any other shows what the rush of paris life is still it is easily conceivable that a clerk who goes early every morning to his office comes home only to dinner and spends every evening out and a woman swallowed up in a round of pleasures should know nothing of an old maid living on the third floor beyond the courtyard of the house they dwell in especially when she lives as mademoiselle fisher did up in the morning before any one else lisbeth went out to buy her bread milk and live charcoal never speaking to any one and she went to bed with the sun she never had a letter or a visitor nor chatted with her neighbors here was one of those anonymous entomological existences such as are to be met with in many large tenements where at the end of four years you unexpectedly learn that up on the fourth floor there is an old man lodging who knew voltaire pilatre de rosier beaujean marcel Molé, sophie arnould franklin and robespierre what monsieur and madame marneffe had just said concerning lisbeth fisher they had come to know in consequence partly of the loneliness of the neighbourhood and of the alliance to which their necessities had led between them and the doorkeepers whose good will was too important to them not to have been carefully encouraged now the old maid's pride silence and reserve had engendered in the porter and his wife the exaggerated respect and cold civility which betrayed the unconfessed annoyance of an inferior also the porter thought himself in all essentials the equal of any lodger whose rent was no more than two hundred and fifty francs cousin betty's confidences to hortense were true and it is evident that the porter's wife might be very likely to slander mademoiselle fisher in her intimate gossip with the marneffes while only intending to tell tales when lisbeth had taken her candle from the hands of worthy madame olivier the portress she looked up to see whether the windows of the garret over her own rooms were lighted up at that hour even in july it was so dark within the courtyard that the old maid could not get to bed without a light oh you may be quite easy monsieur steinbach is in his room he has not been out even said madame olivier with meaning lisbeth made no reply she was still a peasant in so far that she was indifferent to the gossip of persons unconnected with her just as a peasant sees nothing beyond his village she cared for nobody's opinion outside the little circle in which she lived so she boldly went up not to her own room but to the garret and this is why at dessert she had filled her bag with fruit and sweets for her lover and she went to give them to him exactly as an old lady brings home a biscuit for her dog she found the hero of hortense's dreams working by the light of a small lamp of which the light was intensified by the use of a bottle of water as a lens a pale young man seated at a workman's bench covered with a modeller's tools wax chisels rough-hewn stone and bronze castings he wore a blouse and had in his hand a little group in red wax which he gazed at like a poet absorbed in his labors here wenceslas see what i have brought you said she laying her handkerchief on a corner of the table then she carefully took the sweetmeats and fruit out of her bag you are very kind mademoiselle replied the exile in melancholy tones it will do you good poor boy you get feverish by working so hard you were not born to such a rough life wenceslas steinbach looked at her with a bewildered air eat come eat said she sharply instead of looking at me as you do at one of your images when you are satisfied with it on being thus smacked with words the young man seemed less puzzled for this indeed was the female mentor whose tender moods were always a surprise to him so much more accustomed was he to be scolded though steinbach was nine and twenty like many fair men he looked five or six years younger and seeing his youth though its freshness had faded under the fatigue and stress of life in exile by the side of that dry hard face it seemed as though nature had blundered in the distribution of sex he rose and threw himself into a deep chair of louis the fifteenth pattern covered with yellow utrecht velvet as if to rest himself 
the old maid took a green gauge and offered it to him thank you said he taking the plum are you tired said she giving him another i am not tired with work but tired of life said he what absurd notions you have she exclaimed with some annoyance have you not had a good genius to keep an eye on you she said offering him the sweetmeats and watching him with pleasure as he ate them all you see i thought of you when dining with my cousin i know said he with a look at lisbeth that was at once affectionate and plaintive but for you i should long since have ceased to live but my dear lady artists require relaxation ah there we come to the point cried she interrupting him her hands on her hips and her flashing eyes fixed on him you want to go wasting your health in the vile resorts of paris like so many artisans who end by dying in the workhouse no no make a fortune and then when you have money in the funds you may amuse yourself child then you will have enough to pay for the doctor and for your pleasure libertine that you are wenceslas steinbach on receiving this broadside with an accompaniment of looks that pierced him like a magnetic flame bent his head the most malignant slanderer on seeing this scene would at once have understood that the hints thrown out by the oliviers were false everything in this couple their tone manner and way of looking at each other proved the purity of their private life the old maid showed the affection of rough but very genuine maternal feeling the young man submitted as a respectful son yields to the tyranny of a mother the strange alliance seemed to be the outcome of a strong will acting constantly on a weak character on the fluid nature peculiar to the slavs which while it does not hinder them from showing heroic courage in battle gives them an amazing incoherency of conduct a moral softness of which physiologists ought to try to detect the causes since physiologists are to political life what entomologists are to agriculture but if i die before i am rich said wenceslas dolefully die cried she oh i will not let you die i have enough life for both and i would have my blood injected into your veins if necessary tears rose to steinbock's eyes as he heard her vehement and artless speech do not be unhappy my little wenceslas said lisbeth with feeling my cousin hortense thought your seal quite pretty i am sure and i will manage to sell your bronze group you will see you will have paid me off you will be able to do as you please you will soon be free come smile a little i can never repay you mademoiselle said the exile and why not asked the peasant woman taking the livonian's part against herself because you not only fed me lodged me cared for me in my poverty but you also gave me strength you have made me what i am you have often been stern you have made me very unhappy i said the old maid are you going to pour out all your nonsense once more about poetry and the arts and to crack your fingers and stretch your arms while you spout about the ideal and beauty and all your northern madness beauty is not to compare with solid pudding and what am i you have ideas in your brain what is the use of them i too have ideas what is the good of all the fine things you may have in your soul if you can make no use of them those who have ideas do not get so far as those who have none if they don't know which way to go instead of thinking over your ideas you must work now what have you done while i was out what did your pretty cousin say who told you she was pretty asked lisbeth sharply in a tone hollow with tiger-like jealousy why you did that was only to see your face do you want to go trotting after petticoats you who are so fond of women well make them in bronze let us see a cast of your desires for you will have to do without the ladies for some little time yet and certainly without my cousin my good fellow she is not game for your bag that young lady wants a man with sixty thousand francs a year and has found him why your bed is not made she exclaimed looking into the adjoining room poor dear boy i quite forgot you 
the sturdy woman pulled off her gloves her cape and bonnet and remade the artist's little camp bed as briskly as any housemaid this mixture of abruptness of roughness even with real kindness perhaps accounts for the ascendancy lisbeth had acquired over the man whom she regarded as her personal property is not our attachment to life based on its alternations of good and evil if the livonian had happened to meet madame marneffe instead of lisbeth fisher he would have found a protectress whose complaisance must have led him into some boggy or discreditable path where he would have been lost he would certainly never have worked nor the artist have been hatched out thus while he deplored the old maid's grasping avarice his reason bid him prefer her iron hand to the life of idleness and peril led by many of his fellow countrymen this was the incident that had given rise to the coalition of female energy and masculine feebleness a contrast in union said not to be uncommon in poland End of chapter six Chapter seven of Cousin Betty by Honore de Balzac translated by James Waring. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Chapter seven in eighteen thirty three mademoiselle fisher who sometimes worked into the night when business was good at about one o'clock one morning perceived a strong smell of carbonic acid gas and heard the groans of a dying man the fumes and the gasping came from a garret over the two rooms forming her dwelling and she supposed that a young man who had but lately come to lodge in this attic which had been vacant for three years was committing suicide she ran upstairs broke in the door by a push with her peasant strength and found the lodger writhing on a camp bed in the convulsions of death she extinguished the brazier the door was open the air rushed in and the exile was saved then when lisbeth had put him to bed like a patient and he was asleep she could detect the motives of his suicide in the destitution of the rooms where there was nothing whatever but a wretched table the camp bed and two chairs on the table lay a document which she read i am count wenceslas steinbach born at prelia in livonia no one is to be accused of my death my reasons for killing myself are in the words of kosciusko finis polonio the grand-nephew of a valiant general under charles the twelfth could not beg my weekly constitution forbids my taking military service and i yesterday saw the last of the hundred dollars which i had brought with me from dresden to paris i have left twenty-five francs in the drawer of this table to pay the rent i owe to the landlord my parents being dead my death will affect nobody i desire that my countrymen will not blame the french government i have never registered myself as a refugee and i have asked for nothing I have met none of my fellow exiles no one in paris knows of my existence i am dying in christian beliefs may god forgive the last of the steinbocks wenceslas mademoiselle fischer deeply touched by the dying man's honesty opened the drawer and found the five five-franc pieces to pay his rent poor young man cried she and with no one in the world to care about him she went downstairs to fetch her work and sat stitching in the garret watching over the livonian gentleman when he awoke his astonishment may be imagined on finding a woman sitting by his bed it was like the prolongation of a dream as she sat there covering aiguillettes with gold thread the old maid had resolved to take charge of the poor youth whom she admired as he lay sleeping as soon as the young count was fully awake lisbeth talked to give him courage and questioned him to find out how he might make a living wenceslas after telling his story added that he owed his position to his acknowledged talent for the fine arts he had always had a preference for sculpture the necessary time for study had however seemed to him too long for a man without money and at this moment he was far too weak to do any hard manual labor or undertake an important work in sculpture all this was greek to lisbeth fischer 
she replied to the unhappy man that paris offered so many openings that any man with will and courage might find a living there a man of spirit need never perish if he had a certain stock of endurance i am but a poor girl myself a peasant and i have managed to make myself independent said she in conclusion if you will work in earnest i have saved a little money and i will lend you month by month enough to live upon but to live frugally and not to play ducks and drakes with or squander in the streets you can dine in paris for twenty-five sous a day and i will get you your breakfast with mine every day i will furnish your rooms and pay for such teaching as you may think necessary you shall give me formal acknowledgment for the money i may lay out for you and when you are rich you shall repay me all but if you do not work i shall not regard myself as in any way pledged to you and i shall leave you to your fate ah cried the poor fellow still smarting from the bitterness of his first struggle with death exiles from every land may well stretch out their hands to france as the souls in purgatory do to paradise in what other country is such help to be found and generous hearts even in such a garret as this you will be everything to me my beloved benefactress i am your slave be my sweetheart he added with one of the caressing gestures familiar to the poles for which they are unjustly accused of servility oh no i am too jealous i should make you unhappy but i will gladly be a sort of comrade replied lisbeth ah if only you knew how i longed for some fellow-creature even a tyrant who would have something to say to me when i was struggling in the vast solitude of paris exclaimed wenceslas i regretted siberia whither i should be sent by the emperor if i went home be my providence i will work i will be a better man than i am though i am not such a bad fellow will you do whatever i bid you she asked yes well then i will adopt you as my child said she lightly here i am with a son risen from the grave come we will begin at once i will go out and get what i want you can dress and come down to breakfast with me when i knock on the ceiling with the broomstick that day mademoiselle fischer made some inquiries at the houses to which she carried her work home as to the business of a sculptor by dint of many questions she ended by hearing of the studio kept by florent and chanor a house that made a special business of casting and finishing decorative bronzes and handsome silver plate thither she went with steinbach recommending him as an apprentice in sculpture an idea that was regarded as too eccentric their business was to copy the works of the greatest artists but they did not teach the craft the old maid's persistent obstinacy so far succeeded that steinbach was taken on to design ornament he very soon learned to model ornament and invented novelties he had a gift for it five months after he was out of his apprenticeship as a finisher he made acquaintance with stidman the famous head of florent's studios within twenty months wenceslas was ahead of his master but in thirty months the old maid's savings of sixteen years had melted entirely two thousand five hundred francs in gold a sum with which she had intended to purchase an annuity and what was there to show for it a pole's receipt and at this moment lisbeth was working as hard as in her young days to supply the needs of her livonian when she found herself the possessor of a piece of paper instead of her gold louis she lost her head and went to consult monsieur rivet who for fifteen years had been his clever head-worker's friend and counsellor on hearing her story monsieur and madame rivet scolded lisbeth told her she was crazy abused all refugees whose plots for reconstructing their nation compromised the prosperity of the country and the maintenance of peace and they urged lisbeth to find what in trade is called security the only hold you have over this fellow is on his liberty observed m rivet m achille rivet was assessor at the tribunal of commerce imprisonment is no joke for a foreigner said he a frenchman remains five years in prison and comes out free of his debts to be sure for he is thenceforth bound only by his conscience and that never troubles him but a foreigner never comes out give me your promissory note my bookkeeper will take it up 
he will get it protested you will both be prosecuted and both be condemned to imprisonment in default of payment then when everything is in due form you must sign a declaration by doing this your interest will be accumulating and you will have a pistol always primed to fire at your pole the old maid allowed these legal steps to be taken telling her protege not to be uneasy as the proceedings were merely to afford a guarantee to a money-lender who agreed to advance them certain sums this subterfuge was due to the inventive genius of monsieur rivet the guileless artist blindly trusting to his benefactress lighted his pipe with the stamped paper for he smoked as all men do who have sorrows or energies that need soothing one fine day monsieur rivet showed mademoiselle fischer a schedule and said to her here you have wenceslas steinbach bound hand and foot and so effectually that within twenty-four hours you can have him snug in clichy for the rest of his days this worthy and honest judge at the chamber of commerce experienced that day the satisfaction that must come of having done a malignant good action beneficence has so many aspects in paris that this contradictory expression really represents one of them the livonian being fairly entangled in the toils of commercial procedure the point was to obtain payment for the illustrious tradesman looked on wenceslas as a swindler feeling sincerity poetry were in his eyes mere folly in business matters so rivet went off to see in behalf of that poor mademoiselle fischer who as he said had been done by the pole the rich manufacturers for whom steinbock had worked it happened that stidmann who with the help of these distinguished masters of the goldsmith's art was raising french work to the perfection it has now reached allowing it to hold its own against florence and the renaissance stidmann was in chanor's private room when the army lace manufacturer called to make inquiries as to one steinbach a polish refugee whom do you call one steinbach do you mean a young livonian who was a pupil of mine cried stidmann ironically i may tell you monsieur that he is a very great artist it is said of me that i believe myself to be the devil well that poor fellow does not know that he is capable of becoming a god indeed said rivet well pleased and then he added though you take a rather cavalier tone with a man who has the honor to be an assessor on the tribunal of commerce of the department of the seine your pardon consul said stidmann with a military salute i am delighted the assessor went on to hear what you say the man may make money then certainly said chanor but he must work he would have a tidy sum by now if he had stayed with us what is to be done artists have a horror of not being free they have a proper sense of their value and dignity replied stidmann i do not blame wenceslas for walking alone trying to make a name and to become a great man he had a right to do so but he was a great loss to me when he left that you see exclaimed rivet is what all young students aim at as soon as they are hatched out of the school egg begin by saving money i say and seek glory afterwards it spoils your touch to be picking up coin said stidmann it is glory's business to bring us wealth and after all said chanor to rivet you cannot tether them they would eat the halter replied stidmann all these gentlemen have as much caprice as talent said chanor looking at stidmann they spend no end of money they keep their girls they throw coin out of window and then they have no time to work they neglect their orders we have to employ workmen who are very inferior but who grow rich and then they complain of the hard times while if they were but steady they might have piles of gold you old lumignon said stidmann you remind me of the publisher before the revolution who said if only i could keep montesquieu voltaire and rousseau very poor in my back shed and lock up their breeches in a cupboard what a lot of nice little books they would write to make my fortune if works of art could be hammered out like nails workmen would make them 
give me a thousand francs and don't talk nonsense worthy monsieur rivet went home delighted for poor mademoiselle fischer who dined with him every monday and whom he found waiting for him if you can only make him work said he you will have more luck than wisdom you will be repaid interest capital and costs this pole has talent he can make a living but lock up his trousers and his shoes do not let him go to the chaumiere or the parish of notre dame de lorette keep him in leading strings if you do not take such precautions your artist will take to loafing and if you only knew what these artists mean by loafing shocking why i have just heard that they will spend a thousand franc note in a day this episode had a fatal influence on the home life of wenceslas and lisbeth the benefactress flavoured the exile's bread with the wormwood of reproof now that she saw her money in danger and often believed it to be lost from a kind mother she became a stepmother she took the poor boy to task she nagged him scolded him for working too slowly and blamed him for having chosen so difficult a profession she could not believe that those models in red wax little figures and sketches for ornamental work could be of any value before long vexed with herself for her severity she would try to efface the tears by her care and attention then the poor young man after groaning to think that he was dependent on this shrew and under the thumb of a peasant from the vosges was bewitched by her coaxing ways and by a maternal affection that attached itself solely to the physical and material side of life he was like a woman who forgives a week of ill usage for the sake of a kiss and a brief reconciliation thus mademoiselle fischer obtained complete power over his mind the love of dominion that lay as a germ in the old maid's heart developed rapidly she could now satisfy her pride and her craving for action had she not a creature belonging to her to be schooled scolded flattered and made happy without any fear of a rival thus the good and bad sides of her nature alike found play if she sometimes victimized the poor artist she had on the other hand delicate impulses like the grace of wild flowers it was a joy for her to provide for all his wants she would have given her life for him and wenceslas knew it like every noble soul the poor fellow forgot the bad points the defects of the woman who had told him the story of her life as an excuse for her rough ways and he remembered only the benefits she had done him one day exasperated with wenceslas for having gone out walking instead of sitting at work she made a great scene you belong to me said she if you were an honest man you would try to repay me the money you owe as soon as possible the gentleman in whose veins the blood of the steinbocks was fired turned pale bless me she went on we soon shall have nothing to live on but the thirty sous i earn a poor workwoman the two penniless creatures worked up by their own war of words grew vehement and for the first time the unhappy artist reproached his benefactress for having rescued him from death only to make him lead the life of a galley slave worse than the bottomless void where at least said he he would have found rest and he talked of flight flight cried lisbeth ah monsieur rivet was right and she clearly explained to the pole that within twenty-four hours he might be clapped into prison for the rest of his days it was a crushing blow steinbock sank into deep melancholy and total silence in the course of the following night lisbeth hearing overhead some preparations for suicide went up to her pensioner's room and gave him the schedule and a formal release here dear child forgive me she said with tears in her eyes be happy leave me i am too cruel to you only tell me that you will sometimes remember the poor girl who has enabled you to make a living what can i say you are the cause of my ill-humour i might die where would you be without me that is the reason of my being impatient to see you do some saleable work i do not want my money back for myself i assure you 
I am only frightened at your idleness, which you call meditation, at your ideas, which take up so many hours when you sit gazing at the sky. I want you to get into habits of industry. All this was said with an emphasis, a look, and tears that moved the high-minded artist. He clasped his benefactress to his heart and kissed her forehead. Keep these pieces, said he with a sort of cheerfulness. Why should you send me to Clichy? Am I not a prisoner here, out of gratitude? This episode of their secret domestic life had occurred six months previously, and had led to Steinbock's producing three finished works, the seal in Hortense's possession, the group he had placed with the curiosity dealer, and a beautiful clock to which he was putting the last touches, screwing in the last rivets. This clock represented the twelve hours, charmingly personified by twelve female figures whirling round in so mad and swift a dance that three little loves perched on a pile of fruit and flowers could not stop one of them. Only the torn skirts of midnight remained in the hand of the most daring cherub. The group stood on an admirably treated base, ornamented with grotesque beasts. The hours were told by a monstrous mouth that opened to yawn, and each hour bore some ingeniously appropriate symbol characteristic of the various occupations of the day. It is now easy to understand the extraordinary attachment of Mademoiselle Fischer for her Livonian. She wanted him to be happy, and she saw him pining, fading away in his attic. The causes of this wretched state of affairs may be easily imagined. The peasant woman watched this son of the north with the affection of a mother, with the jealousy of a wife, and the spirit of a dragon. Hence she managed to put every kind of folly or dissipation out of his power by leaving him destitute of money she longed to keep her victim and companion for herself alone well conducted perforce and she had no conception of the cruelty of this senseless wish since she for her own part was accustomed to every privation she loved steinbock well enough not to marry him and too much to give him up to any other woman she could not resign herself to be no more than a mother to him though she saw that she was mad to think of playing the other part. These contradictions, this ferocious jealousy, and the joy of having a man to herself, all agitated her old maid's heart beyond measure. Really in love, as she had been for four years, she cherished the foolish hope of prolonging this impossible and aimless way of life, in which her persistence would only be the ruin of the man she thought of as her child. This contest between her instincts and her reason made her unjust and tyrannical. She wreaked on the young man her vengeance for her own lot in being neither young, rich, nor handsome. Then, after each fit of rage, recognizing herself wrong, she stooped to unlimited humility, infinite tenderness. She never could sacrifice to her idol till she had asserted her power by blows of the axe. In fact, it was the converse of Shakespeare's Tempest, Caliban ruling Ariel and Prospero. As to the poor youth himself, high-minded, meditative, and inclined to be lazy, the desert that his protectress made in his soul might be seen in his eyes, as in those of a caged lion. The penal servitude forced on him by Lisbeth did not fulfill the cravings of his heart his weariness became a physical malady and he was dying without daring to ask or knowing where to procure the price of some little necessary dissipation on some days of special energy when a feeling of utter ill luck added to his exasperation he would look at lisbeth as a thirsty traveller on a sandy shore must look at the bitter sea-water these harsh fruits of indigence and this isolation in the midst of paris lisbeth relished with delight and besides she foresaw that the first passion would rob her of her slave sometimes she even blamed herself because her own tyranny and reproaches had compelled the poetic youth to become so great an artist of delicate work 
and she had thus given him the means of casting her off on the day after these three lives so differently but so utterly wretched that of a mother in despair that of the marneffe household and that of the unhappy exile were all to be influenced by hortense's guileless passion and by the strange outcome of the baron's luckless passion for josepha End of chapter seven chapter eight of cousin betty by honore de balzac translated by james waring this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by bruce peary chapter eight just as hulot was going into the opera house he was stopped by the darkened appearance of the building and of the rue le pelletier where there were no gendarmes no lights no theatre servants no barrier to regulate the crowd he looked up at the announcement board and beheld a strip of white paper on which was printed the solemn notice closed on account of illness he rushed off to josepha's lodgings in the rue chauchat for like all the singers she lived close at hand whom do you want sir asked the porter to the baron's great astonishment have you forgotten me said hulot much puzzled on the contrary sir it is because i have the honour to remember you that i ask you where are you going a mortal chill fell upon the baron what has happened he asked if you go up to mademoiselle mirat's rooms monsieur le baron you will find mademoiselle heloise brisetou there and monsieur bichiou monsieur leon de lora monsieur lousteau monsieur de vernisset monsieur stidman and ladies smelling of patchouli holding a housewarming then where where is mademoiselle mirat i don't know that i ought to tell you the baron slipped two five-franc pieces into the porter's hand well she is now in the rue de la ville l'eveque in a fine house given to her they say by the duc d'herouville replied the man in a whisper having ascertained the number of the house m hulot called a milord and drove to one of those pretty modern houses with double doors where everything from the gaslight at the entrance proclaims luxury the baron in his blue cloth coat white neckcloth nankeen trousers patent leather boots and stiffly starched shirt frill was supposed to be a guest though a late arrival by the janitor of this new eden his alacrity of manner and quick step justified this opinion the porter rang a bell and a footman appeared in the hall this man as new as the house admitted the visitor who said to him in an imperious tone and with a lordly gesture take in this card to mademoiselle josepha the victim mechanically looked round the room in which he found himself an anteroom full of choice flowers and of furniture that must have cost twenty thousand francs the servant on his return begged monsieur to wait in the drawing-room till the company came to their coffee though the baron had been familiar with imperial luxury which was undoubtedly prodigious while its productions though not durable in kind had nevertheless cost enormous sums he stood dazzled dumbfounded in this drawing-room with three windows looking out on a garden like fairyland one of those gardens that are created in a month with a made soil and transplanted shrubs while the grass seems as if it must be made to grow by some chemical process he admired not only the decoration the gilding the carving in the most expensive pompadour style as it is called and the magnificent brocades all of which any enriched tradesman could have procured for money but he also noted such treasures as only princes can select and find can pay for and give away two pictures by Greuze, two by watteau two heads by van dyck two landscapes by reistyle and two by le gaspre a rembrandt a holbein a murillo and a titian two paintings by Tenier and a pair by metsu a van Heysen, and an abraham mignon in short two hundred thousand francs worth of pictures superbly framed the gilding was worth almost as much as the paintings aha now you understand my good man said josepha 
she had stolen in on tiptoe through a noiseless door over persian carpets and came upon her adorer standing lost in amazement in the stupid amazement when a man's ears tingle so loudly that he hears nothing but that fatal knell the words my good man spoken to an official of such high importance so perfectly exemplified the audacity with which these creatures pour contempt on the loftiest that the baron was nailed to the spot josepha in white and yellow was so beautifully dressed for the banquet that amid all this lavish magnificence she still shone like a rare jewel isn't this really fine said she the duke has spent all the money on it that he got out of floating a company of which the shares all sold at a premium he is no fool is my little duke there is nothing like a man who has been a grandee in his time for turning coals into gold just before dinner the notary brought me the title deeds to sign and the bills receipted they are all a first-class set in there d'esquignon rastignac maxime lenoncourt vernet laginski rochefide la Pelferine, and from among the bankers nucingen and du Tillet, with antonia malaga carabine and la chance and they all feel for you deeply yes old boy and they hope you will join them but on condition that you forthwith drink up two bottles full of hungarian wine champagne or cup just to bring you up to their mark my dear fellow we are all so much on here that it was necessary to close the opera the manager is as drunk as a cornet a piston he is hiccuping already oh josepha cried the baron now can anything be more absurd than explanations she broke in with a smile look here can you stand six hundred thousand francs which this house and furniture cost can you give me a bond to the tune of thirty thousand francs a year which is what the duke has just given me in a packet of common sugared almonds from the grocers a pretty notion that what an atrocity cried hulot who in his fury would have given his wife's diamonds to stand in the duc d'herouville's shoes for twenty-four hours atrocity is my trade said she so that is how you take it well why don't you float a company goodness me my poor dyed tom you ought to be grateful to me i have thrown you over just when you would have spent on me your widow's fortune your daughter's portion what tears the empire is a thing of the past i hail the coming empire she struck a tragic attitude and exclaimed they call you hulot nay i know you not and she went into the other room through the door left ajar there came like a lightning flash a streak of light with an accompaniment of the crescendo of the orgy and the fragrance of a banquet of the choicest description the singer peeped through the partly open door and seeing hulot transfixed as if he had been a bronze image she came one step forward into the room monsieur said she i have handed over the rubbish in the rue chauchat to bichu's little eloise brise too if you wish to claim your cotton nightcap your boot jack your belt and your wax dye i have stipulated for their return this insolent banter made the baron leave the room as precipitately as lot departed from gomorrah but he did not look back like mrs lot hulot went home striding along in a fury and talking to himself he found his family still playing the game of whist at two sous a point at which he left them on seeing her husband return poor adeline imagined something dreadful some dishonor she gave her cards to hortense and led hector away into the very room where only five hours since crevel had foretold her the utmost disgrace of poverty what is the matter she said terrified oh forgive me but let me tell you all these horrors and for ten minutes he poured out his wrath but my dear said the unhappy woman with heroic courage these creatures do not know what love means such pure and devoted love as you deserve how could you so clear-sighted as you are dream of competing with millions dearest adeline cried the baron clasping her to his heart the baroness's words had shed balm on the bleeding wounds to his vanity 
to be sure take away the duc d'herouville's fortune and she could not hesitate between us said the baron my dear said adeline with a final effort if you positively must have mistresses why do you not seek them like crevel among women who are less extravagant and of a class that can for a time be content with little we should all gain by that arrangement i understand your need but i do not understand that vanity oh what a kind and perfect wife you are cried he i am an old lunatic i do not deserve to have such a wife i am simply the josephine of my napoleon she replied with a touch of melancholy josephine was not to compare with you said he come i will play a game of whist with my brother and the children i must try my hand at the business of a family man i must get hortense a husband and bury the libertine his frankness so greatly touched poor adeline that she said the creature has no taste to prefer any man in the world to my hector oh i would not give you up for all the gold on earth how can any woman throw you over who is so happy as to be loved by you the look with which the baron rewarded his wife's fanaticism confirmed her in her opinion that gentleness and docility were a woman's strongest weapons but in this she was mistaken the noblest sentiments carried to an excess can produce mischief as great as do the worst vices bonaparte was made emperor for having fired on the people at a stone's throw from the spot where louis the sixteenth lost his throne and his head because he would not allow a certain monsieur sauce to be hurt on the following morning hortense who had slept with the seal under her pillow so as to have it close to her all night dressed very early and sent to beg her father to join her in the garden as soon as he should be down by about half-past nine the father acceding to his daughter's petition gave her his arm for a walk and they went along the quays by the pont royal to the place du carrousel let us look into the shop windows papa said hortense as they went through the little gate to cross the wide square what here said her father laughing at her we are supposed to have come to see the pictures and over there and she pointed to the stalls in front of the houses at a right angle to the rue de doyenne look there are dealers in curiosities and pictures your cousin lives there i know it but she must not see us and what do you want to do said the baron who finding himself within thirty yards of madame marneffe's windows suddenly remembered her hortense had dragged her father in front of one of the shops forming the angle of a block of houses built along the front of the old louvre and facing the hotel de nantes she went into this shop her father stood outside absorbed in gazing at the windows of the pretty little lady who the evening before had left her image stamped on the old beau's heart as if to alleviate the wound he was so soon to receive and he could not help putting his wife's sage advice into practice i will fall back on a simple little citizen's wife said he to himself recalling madame marneffe's adorable graces such a woman as that will soon make me forget that grasping josepha now this was what was happening at the same moment outside and inside the curiosity shop as he fixed his eyes on the windows of his new bell the baron saw the husband who while brushing his coat with his own hands was apparently on the lookout expecting to see some one on the square fearing lest he should be seen and subsequently recognized the amorous baron turned his back on the rue du doyenne or rather stood at three-quarters face as it were so as to be able to glance round from time to time this manoeuvre brought him face to face with madame marneffe who coming up from the quay was doubling the promontory of houses to go home valerie was evidently startled as she met the baron's astonished eye and she responded with a prudish dropping of her eyelids a pretty woman exclaimed he for whom a man would do many foolish things indeed monsieur said she turning suddenly like a woman who has just come to some vehement decision you are monsieur le baron hulot i believe the baron more and more bewildered bowed assent 
then as chance has twice made our eyes meet and i am so fortunate as to have interested or puzzled you i may tell you that instead of doing anything foolish you ought to do justice my husband's fate rests with you and how may that be asked the gallant baron he is employed in your department in the war office under m lebrun in m coquet's room said she with a smile i am quite disposed madame 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 marneffe dear little madame marneffe to do injustice for your sake i have a cousin living in your house i will go to see her one day soon as soon as possible bring your petition to me in her rooms pardon my boldness monsieur le baron you must understand that if i dare to address you thus it is because i have no friend to protect me aha monsieur you misunderstand me said she lowering her eyelids hulot felt as if the sun had disappeared i am at my wit's end but i am an honest woman she went on about six months ago my only protector died marshal montcornet ah you are his daughter yes monsieur but he never acknowledged me that was that he might leave you part of his fortune he left me nothing he made no will indeed poor little woman the marshal died suddenly of apoplexy but come madame hope for the best the state must do something for the daughter of one of the chevalier bayard of the empire madame marneffe bowed gracefully and went off as proud of her success as the baron was of his where the devil has she been so early thought he watching the flow of her skirts to which she contrived to impart a somewhat exaggerated grace she looks too tired to have just come from a bath and her husband is waiting for her it is strange and puzzles me altogether madame marneffe having vanished within the baron wondered what his daughter was doing in the shop as he went in still staring at madame marneffe's windows he ran against a young man with a pale brow and sparkling gray eyes wearing a summer coat of black merino coarse drill trousers and tan shoes with gaiters rushing away headlong he saw him run to the house in the rue du doyenne into which he went hortense on going into the shop had at once recognized the famous group conspicuously placed on a table in the middle and in front of the door even without the circumstances to which she owed her knowledge of this masterpiece it would probably have struck her by the peculiar power which we must call the brio the go of great works and the girl herself might in italy have been taken as a model for the personification of brio not every work by a man of genius has in the same degree that brilliancy that glory which is at once patent even to the most ignoble beholder thus certain pictures by raphael such as the famous transfiguration the madonna di foligno and the frescoes of the stanza in the vatican do not at first captivate our imagination as do the violin player in the chiara palace the portraits of the doria family and the vision of ezekiel in the pity gallery the christ bearing his cross in the borghese collection and the marriage of the virgin in the brera at milan the saint john the baptist of the tribuna and saint luke painting the virgin's portrait in the academia at rome have not the charm of the portrait of leo the tenth and of the virgin at dresden and yet they are all of equal merit nay more the stanza the transfiguration the panels and the three easel pictures in the vatican are in the highest degree perfect and sublime but they demand a stress of attention even from the most accomplished beholder and serious study to be fully understood while the violin player the marriage of the virgin and the vision of ezekiel go straight to the heart through the portal of sight and make their home there it is a pleasure to receive them thus without an effort if it is not the highest phase of art it is the happiest this fact proves that in the begetting of works of art there is as much chance in the character of the offspring as there is in a family of children that some will be happily graced born beautiful and costing their mothers little suffering creatures on whom everything smiles and with whom everything succeeds 
in short genius like love has its fairer blossoms this brio an italian word which the french have begun to use is characteristic of youthful work it is the fruit of an impetus and fire of early talent an impetus which is met with again later in some happy hours but this particular brio no longer comes from the artist's heart instead of his flinging it into his work as a volcano flings up its fires it comes to him from outside inspired by circumstances by love or rivalry often by hatred and more often still by the imperious need of glory to be lived up to this group by wenceslas was to his later works what the marriage of the virgin is to the great mass of raphael's the first step of a gifted artist taken with the inimitable grace the eagerness and delightful overflowingness of a child whose strength is concealed under the pink and white flesh full of dimples which seem to echo to a mother's laughter prince eugene is said to have paid four hundred thousand francs for this picture which would be worth a million to any nation that owned no picture by raphael but no one would give that sum for the finest of the frescoes though their value is far greater as works of art hortense restrained her admiration for she reflected on the amount of her girlish savings she assumed an air of indifference and said to the dealer what is the price of that fifteen hundred francs replied the man sending a glance of intelligence to a young man seated on a stool in the corner the young man himself gazed in a stupefaction at monsieur hulot's living masterpiece hortense forewarned at once identified him as the artist from the color that flushed a face pale with endurance she saw the spark lighted up in his gray eyes by her question she looked on the thin drawn features like those of a monk consumed by asceticism she loved the red well-formed mouth the delicate chin and the pole's silky chestnut hair if it were twelve hundred said she i would beg you to send it to me it is antique mademoiselle the dealer remarked thinking like all his fraternity that having uttered this ne plus ultra of bric-a-brac there was no more to be said excuse me monsieur she replied very quietly it was made this year i came expressly to beg you if my price is accepted to send the artist to see us as it might be possible to procure him some important commissions and if he is to have the twelve hundred francs what am i to get i am the dealer said the man with candid good humor to be sure replied the girl with a slight curl of disdain oh mademoiselle take it i will make terms with the dealer cried the livonian beside himself fascinated by hortense's wonderful beauty and the love of art she displayed he added i am the sculptor of the group and for ten days i have come here three times a day to see if anybody would recognize its merit and bargain for it you are my first admirer take it come then monsieur with the dealer an hour hence here is my father's card replied hortense then seeing the shopkeeper go into a back room to wrap the group in a piece of linen rag she added in a low voice to the great astonishment of the artist who thought he must be dreaming for the benefit of your future prospects monsieur wenceslas do not mention the name of the purchaser to mademoiselle fischer for she is our cousin the word cousin dazzled the artist's mind he had a glimpse of paradise whence this daughter of eve had come to him he had dreamed of the beautiful girl of whom lisbeth had told him as hortense had dreamed of her cousin's lover and as she had entered the shop ah thought he if she could be but like this the look that passed between the lovers may be imagined it was a flame for virtuous lovers have no hypocrisies well what the deuce are you doing here her father asked her i have been spending twelve hundred francs that i had saved come and she took her father's arm twelve hundred francs he repeated to be exact thirteen hundred you will lend me the odd hundred and on what in such a place could you spend so much ah that is the question replied the happy girl if i have got a husband he is not dear at the money 
a husband in that shop my child listen dear little father would you forbid my marrying a great artist no my dear a great artist in these days is a prince without a title he has glory and fortune the two chief social advantages next to virtue he added in a smug tone oh of course said hortense and what do you think of sculpture it is very poor business replied hulot shaking his head it needs high patronage as well as great talent for government is the only purchaser it is an art with no demand nowadays where there are no princely houses no great fortunes no entailed mansions no hereditary estates only small pictures and small figures can find a place the arts are endangered by this need of small things but if a great artist could find a demand said hortense that indeed would solve the problem or had some one to back him that would be even better if he were of noble birth pooh a count and a sculptor he has no money and so he counts on that of mademoiselle hortense hulot said the baron ironically with an inquisitorial look into his daughter's eyes this great artist a count and a sculptor has just seen your daughter for the first time in his life and for the space of five minutes monsieur le baron hortense calmly replied yesterday you must know dear little father while you were at the chamber mamma had a fainting fit this which she ascribed to a nervous attack was the result of some worry that had to do with the failure of my marriage for she told me that to get rid of me she is too fond of you to have used an expression so unparliamentary hortense put in with a laugh no she did not use those words but i know that a girl old enough to marry and who does not find a husband is a heavy cross for respectable parents to bear well she thinks that if a man of energy and talent could be found who would be satisfied with thirty thousand francs for my marriage portion we might all be happy in fact she thought it advisable to prepare me for the modesty of my future lot and to hinder me from indulging in too fervid dreams which evidently meant an end to the intended marriage and no settlements for me your mother is a very good woman noble admirable replied the father deeply humiliated though not sorry to hear this confession she told me yesterday that she had your permission to sell her diamonds so as to give me something to marry on but i should like her to keep her jewels and to find a husband myself i think i have found the man the possible husband answering to mamma's prospectus there in the place du carrousel and in one morning oh papa the mischief lies deeper said she archly well come my child tell the whole story to your good old father said he persuasively and concealing his uneasiness End of chapter eight Chapter Nine of Cousin Betty by Honoré de Balzac, translated by James Waring. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Chapter Nine. Under promise of absolute secrecy, Hortense repeated the upshot of her various conversations with her cousin Betty. Then, when they got home, she showed the much talked of seal to her father in evidence of the sagacity of her views. The father, in the depth of his heart, wondered at the skill and acumen of girls who act on instinct discerning the simplicity of the scheme which her idealized love had suggested in the course of a single night to his guileless daughter you will see the masterpiece i have just bought it is to be brought home and that dear wenceslas is to come with the dealer the man who made that group ought to make a fortune only use your influence to get him an order for a statue and rooms at the institute how you run on cried her father why if you had your own way you would be man and wife within the legal period in eleven days must we wait so long said she laughing but i fell in love with him in five minutes as you fell in love with mamma at first sight and he loves me as if we had known each other for two years yes she said in reply to her father's look i read ten volumes of love in his eyes 
and will not you and mamma accept him as my husband when you see that he is a man of genius sculpture is the greatest of the arts she cried clapping her hands and jumping i will tell you everything what is there more to come asked her father smiling the child's complete and effervescent innocence had restored her father's peace of mind a confession of the first importance said she i loved him without knowing him and for the last hour since seeing him i am crazy about him a little too crazy said the baron who was enjoying the sight of this guileless passion do not punish me for confiding in you replied she it is so delightful to say to my father's heart i love him i am so happy in loving him you will see my wenceslas his brow is so sad the sun of genius shines in his gray eyes and what an air he has what do you think of livonia is it a fine country the idea of cousin betty's marrying that young fellow she might be his mother it would be murder i am quite jealous of all she has ever done for him but i don't think my marriage will please her see my darling we must hide nothing from your mother i should have to show her the seal and i promised not to betray cousin lisbeth who is afraid she says of mamma's laughing at her said hortense you have scruples about the seal and none about robbing your cousin of her lover i promised about the seal i made no promise about the sculptor this adventure patriarchal in its simplicity came admirably apropos to the unconfessed poverty of the family the baron while praising his daughter for her candour explained to her that she must now leave matters to the discretion of her parents you understand my child that it is not your part to ascertain whether your cousin's lover is a count if he has all his papers properly certified and if his conduct is a guarantee for his respectability as for your cousin she refused five offers when she was twenty years younger that will prove no obstacle i undertake to say listen to me papa if you really wish to see me married never say a word to lisbeth about it till just before the contract is signed i have been catechizing her about this business for the last six months well there is something about her quite inexplicable what said her father puzzled well she looks evil when i say too much even in joke about her lover make inquiries but leave me to row my own boat my confidence ought to reassure you the lord said suffer little children to come unto me you are one of those who have come back again replied the baron with a touch of irony after breakfast the dealer was announced and the artist with his group the sudden flush that reddened her daughter's face at once made the baroness suspicious and then watchful and the girl's confusion and the light in her eyes soon betrayed the mystery so badly guarded in her simple heart count steinbach dressed in black struck the baron as a very gentlemanly young man would you undertake a bronze statue he asked as he held up the group after admiring it on trust he passed it on to his wife who knew nothing about sculpture it is beautiful isn't it mamma said hortense in her mother's ear a statue monsieur it is less difficult to execute a statue than to make a clock like this which my friend here has been kind enough to bring said the artist in reply the dealer was placing on the dining-room sideboard the wax model of the twelve hours that the loves were trying to delay leave the clock with me said the baron astounded at the beauty of the sketch i should like to show it to the ministers of the interior and of commerce who is the young man in whom you take so much interest the baroness asked her daughter an artist who could afford to execute this model could get a hundred thousand francs for it said the curiosity dealer putting on a knowing and mysterious look as he saw that the artist and the girl were interchanging glances he would only need to sell twenty copies at eight thousand francs each for the materials would cost about a thousand crowns for each example but if each copy were numbered and the mould destroyed it would certainly be possible to meet with twenty amateurs only too glad to possess a replica of such a work a hundred thousand francs cried steinbach looking from the dealer to hortense the baron and the baroness 
yes a hundred thousand francs repeated the dealer if i were rich enough i would buy it of you myself for twenty thousand francs for by destroying the mould it would become a valuable property but one of the princes ought to pay thirty or forty thousand francs for such a work to ornament his drawing-room no man has ever succeeded in making a clock satisfactory alike to the vulgar and to the connoisseur and this one sir solves the difficulty this is for yourself monsieur said hortense giving six gold pieces to the dealer never breathe a word of this visit to any one living said the artist to his friend at the door if you should be asked where we sold the group mention the duc de rouville the famous collector in the rue de varennes the dealer nodded assent and your name said hulot to the artist when he came back count steinbach have you the papers that prove your identity yes monsieur le baron they are in russian and in german but not legalized do you feel equal to undertaking a statue nine feet high yes monsieur well then if the persons whom i shall consult are satisfied with your work i can secure you the commission for the statue of marshal montcornet which is to be erected on his monument at pere lachaise the minister of war and the old officers of the imperial guard have subscribed a sum large enough to enable us to select our artist oh monsieur it will make my fortune exclaimed steinbock overpowered by so much happiness at once be easy replied the baron graciously if the two ministers to whom i propose to show your group and this sketch in wax are delighted with these two pieces your prospects of a fortune are good hortense hugged her father's arm so tightly as to hurt him bring me your papers and say nothing of your hopes to anybody not even to our old cousin betty lisbeth said madame hulot at last understanding the end of all this though unable to guess the means i could give proof of my skill by making a bust of the baroness added wenceslas the artist struck by madame hulot's beauty was comparing the mother and daughter indeed monsieur life may smile upon you said the baron quite charmed by count steinbock's refined and elegant manner you will find out that in paris no man is clever for nothing and that persevering toil always finds its reward here hortense with a blush held out to the young man a pretty algerine purse containing sixty gold pieces the artist with something still of a gentleman's pride responded with a mounting color easy enough to interpret this perhaps is the first money your works have brought you said adeline yes madame my works of art it is not the first fruits of my labor for i have been a workman well we must hope my daughter's money will bring you good luck said she and take it without scruple added the baron seeing that wenceslas held the purse in his hand instead of pocketing it the sum will be repaid by some rich man a prince perhaps who will offer it with interest to possess so fine a work oh i want it too much myself papa to give it up to anybody in the world even a royal prince i can make a far prettier thing than that for you mademoiselle but it would not be this one replied she and then as if ashamed of having said too much she ran out into the garden then i shall break the mould and the model as soon as i go home said steinbock fetch me your papers and you will hear of me before long if you are equal to what i expect of you monsieur the artist on this could but take leave after bowing to madame hulot and hortense who came in from the garden on purpose he went off to walk in the tuileries not bearing not daring to return to his attic where his tyrant would pelt him with questions and wring his secret from him hortense's adorer conceived of groups and statues by the hundred he felt strong enough to hew the marble himself like canova who was also a feeble man and nearly died of it he was transfigured by hortense who was to him inspiration made visible now then said the baroness to her daughter what does all this mean well dear mamma you have just seen cousin lisbeth's lover who now i hope is mine but shut your eyes know nothing good heavens i was to keep it all from you and i cannot help telling you everything 
Goodbye, children, said the baron, kissing his wife and daughter. I shall perhaps go to call on the nanny, and from her I shall hear a great deal about our young man. Papa, be cautious, said Hortense. Oh, little girl, cried the baroness when Hortense had poured out her poem, of which the morning's adventure was the last canto. Dear little girl, artlessness will always be the artfulest puss on earth. Genuine passions have an unerring instinct. Set a greedy man before a dish of fruit, and he will make no mistake but take the choicest even without seeing it. In the same way, if you allow a girl who is well brought up to choose a husband for herself, if she is in a position to meet the man of her heart, rarely will she blunder. The act of nature in such cases is known as love at first sight, and in love first sight is practically second sight. The baroness's satisfaction, though disguised under maternal dignity, was as great as her daughter's. For of the three ways of marrying Hortense of which Crevel had spoken, the best, as she opined, was about to be realized, and she regarded this little drama as an answer by providence to her fervent prayers. Mademoiselle Fischer's galley-slave, obliged at last to go home, thought he might hide his joy as a lover under his glee as an artist rejoicing over his first success. Victory! my group is sold to the duc d'herouville who is going to give me some commissions cried he throwing the twelve hundred francs in gold on the table before the old maid he had as may be supposed concealed hortense's purse it lay next to his heart and a very good thing too said lisbeth i was working myself to death you see, child, money comes in slowly in the business you have taken up, for this is the first you have earned, and you have been grinding at it for near on five years now. That money barely repays me for what you have cost me since I took your promissory note. That is all I have got by my savings. But be sure of one thing, she said, after counting the gold. This money will all be spent on you. There is enough there to keep us going for a year." in a year you may now be able to pay your debt and have a snug little sum of your own if you go on in the same way wenceslas finding his trick successful expatiated on the duc d'herouville i will fit you out in a black suit and get you some new linen said lisbeth for you must appear presentably before your patrons and then you must have a larger and better apartment than your horrible garret and furnish it properly you look so bright you are not like the same creature she added gazing at wenceslas but my work is pronounced a masterpiece well so much the better do some more said the arid creature who was nothing but practical and incapable of understanding the joy of triumph or of beauty in art trouble your head no further about what you have sold make something else to sell you have spent two hundred francs in money to say nothing of your time and your labor on that devil of a samson your clock will cost you more than two thousand francs to execute i tell you what if you will listen to me you will finish the two little boys crowning the little girl with cornflowers that would just suit the parisians i will go round to monsieur graff the tailor before going to monsieur crevel go up now and leave me to dress Next day the baron, perfectly crazy about Madame Marneffe, went to see Cousin Betty, who was considerably amazed on opening the door to see who her visitor was, for he had never called on her before. She at once said to herself, Can it be that Hortense wants my lover? For she had heard the evening before, at Monsieur Crevel's, that the marriage with the counsellor of the Supreme Court was broken off what cousin you here this is the first time you have ever been to see me and it is certainly not for love of my fine eyes that you have come now fine eyes is the truth said the baron you have as fine eyes as i have ever seen come what are you here for i really am ashamed to receive you in such a kennel the outer room of the two inhabited by lisbeth served her as sitting-room dining-room kitchen and workroom the furniture was such as beseemed a well-to-do artisan. 
walnut wood chairs with straw seats a small walnut wood dining table a work table some colored prints in black wooden frames short muslin curtains to the windows the floor well polished and shining with cleanliness not a speck of dust anywhere but all cold and dingy like a picture by terberg in every particular even to the gray tone given by a wallpaper once blue and now faded to gray as to the bedroom no human being had ever penetrated its secrets the baron took it all in at a glance saw the sign manual of commonness on every detail from the cast-iron stove to the household utensils and his gorge rose as he said to himself and this is virtue what am i here for said he aloud you are far too cunning not to guess and i had better tell you plainly cried he sitting down and looking out across the courtyard through an opening he made in the puckered curtain there is a very pretty woman in the house madame marneffe now i understand she exclaimed seeing it all but josepha alas cousin josepha is no more i was turned out of doors like a discarded footman and you would like said lisbeth looking at the baron with the dignity of a prude on her guard a quarter of an hour too soon as madame marneffe is very much the lady and the wife of an employe you can meet her without compromising yourself the baron went on and i should like to see you neighborly oh you need not be alarmed she will have the greatest consideration for the cousin of her husband's chief at this moment the rustle of a gown was heard on the stairs and the footstep of a woman wearing the thinnest boots the sound ceased on the landing there was a tap at the door and madame marneffe came in pray excuse me mademoiselle for thus intruding upon you but i failed to find you yesterday when i came to call we are near neighbors and if i had known that you were related to monsieur le baron i should long since have craved your kind interest with him i saw him come in so i took the liberty of coming across for my husband monsieur le baron spoke to me of a report on the office clerks which is to be laid before the minister to-morrow she seemed quite agitated and nervous but she had only run upstairs you have no need to play the petitioner fair lady replied the baron it is i who should ask the favor of seeing you very well if mademoiselle allows it pray come said madame marneffe yes go cousin i will join you said lisbeth judiciously the parisienne had so confidently counted on the chief's visit and intelligence that not only had she dressed herself for so important an interview she had dressed her room early in the day it had been furnished with flowers purchased on credit marneffe had helped his wife to polish the furniture down to the smallest objects washing brushing and dusting everything valerie wished to be found in an atmosphere of sweetness to attract the chief and to please him enough to have a right to be cruel to tantalize him as a child would with all the tricks of fashionable tactics she had gauged hulot give a paris woman at bay four-and-twenty hours and she will overthrow a ministry the man of the empire accustomed to the ways of the empire was no doubt quite ignorant of the ways of modern love-making of the scruples in vogue and the various styles of conversation invented since eighteen thirty which led to the poor weak woman being regarded as the victim of her lover's desires a sister of charity salving a wound an angel sacrificing herself this modern art of love uses a vast amount of evangelical phrases in the service of the devil passion is martyrdom both parties aspire to the ideal to the infinite love is to make them so much better all these fine words are but a pretext for putting increased ardor into the practical side of it more frenzy into a fall than of old this hypocrisy a characteristic of the times is a gangrene in gallantry the lovers are both angels and they behave if they can like two devils love had no time for such subtle analysis between two campaigns and in eighteen hundred and nine its successes were as rapid as those of the empire 
so under the restoration the handsome baron a lady's man once more had begun by consoling some old friends now fallen from the political firmament like extinguished stars and then as he grew old was captured by jenny cadine and josepha madame marneffe had placed her batteries after due study of the baron's past life which her husband had narrated in much detail after picking up some information in the offices the comedy of modern sentiment might have the charm of novelty to the baron valerie had made up her mind as to her scheme and we may say the trial of her power that she made this morning answered her highest expectations End of chapter nine Chapter ten of Cousin Betty by Honore de Balzac Translated by James Waring This Librivox recording is in the public domain Recording by Bruce Peary Chapter ten thanks to her manoeuvres sentimental high-flown and romantic valerie without committing herself to any promises obtained for her husband the appointment as deputy head of the office and the cross of the legion of honour the campaign was not carried out without little dinners at the rocher de cancale parties to the play and gifts in the form of lace scarves gowns and jewellery the apartment in the rue de doyenne was not satisfactory the baron proposed to furnish another magnificently in a charming new house in the rue vanneau monsieur marneffe got a fortnight's leave to be taken a month hence for urgent private affairs in the country and a present in money he promised himself that he would spend both in a little town in switzerland studying the fair sex while monsieur hulot thus devoted himself to the lady he was protecting he did not forget the young artist comte popinot minister of commerce was a patron of art he paid two thousand francs for a copy of the samson on condition that the mould should be broken and that there should be no samson but his and mademoiselle hulot's the group was admired by a prince to whom the model sketch for the clock was also shown and who ordered it but that again was to be unique and he offered thirty thousand francs for it artists who were consulted and among them stidman were of opinion that the man who had sketched those two models was capable of achieving a statue the marshal prince de wissembourg minister of war and president of the committee for the subscriptions to the monument of marshal montcornet called a meeting at which it was decided that the execution of the work should be placed in steinbock's hands the comte de rastignac at that time under secretary of state wished to possess a work by the artist whose glory was waxing amid the acclamations of his rivals steinbock sold to him the charming group of two little boys crowning a little girl and he promised to secure for the sculptor a studio attached to the government marble quarries situated as all the world knows at le gros caillou this was a success such success as is won in paris that is to say stupendous success that crushes those whose shoulders and loins are not strong enough to bear it as be it said not unfrequently is the case count wenceslas steinbock was written about in all the newspapers and reviews without his having the least suspicion of it any more than had mademoiselle fischer every day as soon as lisbeth had gone out to dinner wenceslas went to the baroness's and spent an hour or two there excepting on the evenings when lisbeth dined with the hulots this state of things lasted for several days the baron assured of count steinbock's titles and position the baroness pleased with his character and habits hortense proud of her permitted love and of her suitor's fame none of them hesitated to speak of the marriage in short the artist was in the seventh heaven when an indiscretion on madame marneffe's part spoilt all and this was how lisbeth whom the baron wished to see intimate with madame marneffe that she might keep an eye on the couple had already dined with valerie and she on her part anxious to have an ear in the hulot house made much of the old maid it occurred to valerie to invite mademoiselle fischer to a housewarming in the new apartments she was about to move into lisbeth 
glad to have found another house to dine in and bewitched by madame marneffe had taken a great fancy to valerie of all the persons she had made acquaintance with no one had taken so much pains to please her in fact madame marneffe full of attentions for mademoiselle fischer found herself in the position towards lisbeth that lisbeth held towards the baroness monsieur rivet crevel and the others who invited her to dinner the marneffes had excited lisbeth's compassion by allowing her to see the extreme poverty of the house while varnishing it as usual with the fairest colors their friends were under obligations to them and ungrateful they had had much illness madame fortin her mother had never known of their distress and had died believing herself wealthy to the end thanks to their superhuman efforts and so forth poor people said she to her cousin hulot you are right to do what you can for them they are so brave and so kind they can hardly live on the thousand crowns he gets as deputy head of the office for they have got into debt since marshal montcornet's death it is barbarity on the part of the government to suppose that a clerk with a wife and family can live in paris on two thousand four hundred francs a year and so within a very short time a young woman who affected regard for her who told her everything and consulted her who flattered her and seemed ready to yield to her guidance had become dearer to the eccentric cousin lisbeth than all her relations the baron on his part admiring in madame marneffe such propriety education and breeding as neither jenny cadine nor josepha nor any friend of theirs had to show had fallen in love with her in a month developing a senile passion a senseless passion which had an appearance of reason in fact he found here neither the banter nor the orgies nor the reckless expenditure nor the depravity nor the scorn of social decencies nor the insolent independence which had brought him to grief alike with the actress and the singer he was spared too the rapacity of the courtesan like unto the thirst of dry sand madame marneffe of whom he had made a friend and confidant made the greatest difficulties over accepting any gift from him appointments official presents anything you can extract from the government but do not begin by insulting a woman whom you profess to love said valerie if you do i shall cease to believe you and i like to believe you she added with a glance like saint teresa leering at heaven every time he made her a present there was a fortress to be stormed a conscience to be over persuaded the hapless baron laid deep stratagems to offer her some trifle costly nevertheless proud of having at last met with virtue and the realization of his dreams in this primitive household as he assured himself he was the god as much as in his own and monsieur marneffe seemed at a thousand leagues from suspecting that the jupiter of his office intended to descend on his wife in a shower of gold he was his august chief's humblest slave madame marneffe twenty-three years of age a pure and bashful middle-class wife a blossom hidden in the rue de doyenne could know nothing of the depravity and demoralizing harlotry which the baron could no longer think of without disgust for he had never known the charm of recalcitrant virtue and the coy valerie made him enjoy it to the utmost all along the line as the saying goes the question having come to this point between hector and valerie it is not astonishing that valerie should have heard from hector the secret of the intended marriage between the great sculptor steinbach and hortense hulot between a lover on his promotion and a lady who hesitates long before becoming his mistress there are contests uttered or unexpressed in which a word often betrays a thought as in fencing the foils fly as briskly as the swords in duel then a prudent man follows the example of monsieur de turenne thus the baron had hinted at the greater freedom his daughter's marriage would allow him in reply to the tender valerie who more than once had exclaimed i cannot imagine how a woman can go wrong for a man who is not wholly hers and a thousand times already the baron had declared that for five-and-twenty years all had been at an end between madame hulot and himself 
and they say she is so handsome replied madame marneffe i want proof you shall have it said the baron made happy by this demand by which his valerie committed herself hector had then been compelled to reveal his plans already being carried into effect in the rue vanneau to prove to valerie that he intended to devote to her that half of his life which belonged to his lawful wife supposing that day and night equally divide the existence of civilized humanity he spoke of decently deserting his wife leaving her to herself as soon as hortense should be married the baroness would then spend all her time with hortense or the young hulot couple he was sure of her submission and then my angel my true life my real home will be in the rue vanneau bless me how you dispose of me said madame marneffe and my husband that rag to be sure as compared with you so he is said she with a laugh madame marneffe having heard steinbock's history was frantically eager to see the young count perhaps she wished to have some trifle of his work while they still lived under the same roof this curiosity so seriously annoyed the baron that valerie swore to him that she would never even look at wenceslas but though she obtained as the reward of her surrender of this wish a little tea service of old sevres pate tendre she kept her wish at the bottom of her heart as if written on tablets so one day when she had begged my cousin betty to come to take coffee with her in her room she opened on the subject of her lover to know how she might see him without risk my dear child said she for they called each other my dear why have you never introduced your lover to me do you know that within a short time he has become famous he famous he is the one subject of conversation pooh cried lisbeth he is going to execute the statue of my father and i could be of great use to him and help him to succeed in the work for madame montcornet cannot lend him as i can a miniature by saint a beautiful thing done in eighteen hundred and nine before the wagram campaign and given to my poor mother montcornet when he was young and handsome saint and augustin between them held the sceptre of miniature painting under the empire he is going to make a statue my dear did you say nine feet high by the orders of the minister of war why where have you dropped from that i should tell you the news why the government is going to give count steinbock rooms and a studio at le gros caillou the depot for marble your pole will be made the director i should not wonder with two thousand francs a year and a ring on his finger how do you know all this when i have heard nothing about it said lisbeth at last shaking off her amazement now my dear little cousin betty said madame marneffe in an insinuating voice are you capable of devoted friendship put to any test shall we henceforth be sisters will you swear to me never to have a secret from me any more than i from you to act as my spy as i will be yours above all will you pledge yourself never to betray me either to my husband or to monsieur hulot and never reveal that it was i who told you madame marneffe broke off in this spurring harangue lisbeth frightened her the peasant woman's face was terrible her piercing black eyes had the glare of the tigers her face was like that we ascribe to a pythoness she set her teeth to keep them from chattering and her whole frame quivered convulsively she had pushed her clenched fingers under her cap to clutch her hair and support her head which felt too heavy she was on fire the smoke of the flame that scorched her seemed to emanate from her wrinkles as from the crevices rent by a volcanic eruption it was a startling spectacle well why do you stop she asked in a hollow voice i will be all to you that i have been to him oh i would have given him my life-blood you loved him then like a child of my own well then said madame marneffe with a breath of relief if you only love him in that way you will be very happy for you wish him to be happy lisbeth replied by a nod as hasty as a madwoman's he is to marry your cousin hortense in a month's time hortense 
shrieked the old maid striking her forehead and starting to her feet well but then you were really in love with this young man asked valerie my dear we are bound for life and death you and i said mademoiselle fischer yes if you have any love affairs to me they are sacred your vices will be virtues in my eyes for i shall need your vices then did you live with him asked valerie no i meant to be a mother to him i give it up i cannot understand said valerie in that case you are neither betrayed nor cheated and you ought to be very happy to see him so well married he is now fairly afloat and at any rate your day is over our artist goes to madame hulot's every evening as soon as you go out to dinner adeline muttered lisbeth oh adeline you shall pay for this i will make you uglier than i am you are as pale as death exclaimed valerie there is something wrong oh what a fool i am the mother and daughter must have suspected that you would raise some obstacles in the way of this affair since they have kept it from you said madame marneffe but if you did not live with the young man my dear all this is a greater puzzle to me than my husband's feelings ah you don't know said lisbeth you have no idea of all their tricks it is the last blow that kills and how many such blows have i had to bruise my soul you don't know that from the time when i could first feel i have been victimized for adeline i was beaten and she was petted i was dressed like a scullion and she had clothes like a lady's i dug in the garden and cleaned the vegetables and she she never lifted a finger for anything but to make up some finery she married the baron she came to shine at the emperor's court while i stayed in our village till eighteen hundred and nine waiting for four years for a suitable match they brought me away to be sure but only to make me a workwoman and to offer me clerks or captains like coal heavers for a husband i have had their leavings for twenty-six years and now like the story in the old testament the poor relation has one ewe lamb which is all her joy and the rich man who has flocks covets the ewe lamb and steals it without warning without asking adeline has meanly robbed me of my happiness adeline adeline i will see you in the mire and sunk lower than myself and hortense i loved her and she has cheated me the baron no it is impossible tell me again what is really true of all this be calm my dear child valerie my darling i will be calm said the strange creature sitting down again one thing only can restore me to reason give me proofs your cousin hortense has the samson group here is a lithograph from it published in a review she paid for it out of her pocket-money and it is the baron who to benefit his future son-in-law is pushing him getting everything for him water water said lisbeth after glancing at the print below which she read a group belonging to mademoiselle hulot d'ervy water my head is burning i am going mad madame marneffe fetched some water lisbeth took off her cap unfastened her black hair and plunged her head into the basin her new friend held for her she dipped her forehead into it several times and checked the incipient inflammation after this douche she completely recovered her self-command not a word said she to madame marneffe as she wiped her face not a word of all this you see i am quite calm everything is forgotten i am thinking of something very different she will be in charenton to-morrow that is very certain thought madame marneffe looking at the old maid what is to be done lisbeth went on you see my angel there is nothing for it but to hold my tongue bow my head and drift to the grave as all water runs to the river what could i try to do i should like to grind them all adeline her daughter and the baron all to dust but what can a poor relation do against a rich family it would be the story of the earthen pot and the iron pot yes you are right said valerie you can only pull as much hay as you can to your side of the manger that is all the upshot of life in paris besides said lisbeth i shall soon die i can tell you if i lose that boy to whom i fancied i could always be a mother and with whom i counted on living all my days 
there were tears in her eyes and she paused such emotion in this woman made of sulphur and flame made valerie shudder well at any rate i have found you said lisbeth taking valerie's hand that is some consolation in this dreadful trouble we shall be true friends and why should we ever part i shall never cross your track no one will ever be in love with me those who would have married me would only have done it to secure my cousin hulot's interest with energy enough to scale paradise to have to devote it to procuring bread and water a few rags and a garret that is martyrdom my dear and i have withered under it she broke off suddenly and shot a black flash into madame marneffe's blue eyes a glance that pierced the pretty woman's soul as the point of a dagger might have pierced her heart and what is the use of talking she exclaimed in reproof to herself i never said so much before believe me the tables will be turned yet she added after a pause as you so wisely say let us sharpen our teeth and pull down all the hay we can get you are very wise said madame marneffe who had been frightened by this scene and had no remembrance of having uttered this maxim i am sure you are right my dear child life is not so long after all and we must make the best of it and make use of others to contribute to our enjoyment even i have learned that young as i am i was brought up a spoiled child my father married ambitiously and almost forgot me after making me his idol and bringing me up like a queen's daughter my poor mother who filled my head with splendid visions died of grief at seeing me married to an office clerk with twelve hundred francs a year at nine and thirty an aged and hardened libertine as corrupt as the hulks looking on me as others looked on you as a means of fortune well in that wretched man i have found the best of husbands he prefers the squalid sluts he picks up at the street corners and leaves me free though he keeps all his salary to himself he never asks me where i get money to live on and she in her turn stopped short as a woman does who feels herself carried away by the torrent of her confessions struck too by lisbeth's eager attention she thought well to make sure of lisbeth before revealing her last secrets you see dear child how entire is my confidence in you she presently added to which lisbeth replied by a most comforting nod an oath may be taken by a look and a nod more solemnly than in a court of justice End of chapter ten Chapter Eleven of Cousin Betty by Honoré de Balzac, translated by James Waring. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Chapter Eleven. I keep up every appearance of respectability. Valerie went on, laying her hand on Lisbeth's as if to accept her pledge. I am a married woman and my own mistress to such a degree that in the morning when Marneffe sets out for the office, if he takes it into his head to say good-bye and finds my door locked, he goes off without a word. He cares less for his boy than I care for one of the marble children that play at the feet of one of the river gods in the Tuileries. If I do not come home to dinner, he dines quite contentedly with the maid, for the maid is devoted to monsieur and he goes out every evening after dinner and does not come in till twelve or one o'clock unfortunately for a year past i have had no lady's maid which is as much as to say that i am a widow i have had one passion once have been happy a rich brazilian who went away a year ago my only lapse he went away to sell his estates to realize his land and come back to live in france what will he find left of his valerie a dunghill well it is his fault and not mine why does he delay coming so long perhaps he has been wrecked like my virtue good-bye my dear said lisbeth abruptly we are friends for ever i love you i esteem you i am wholly yours my cousin is tormenting me to go and live in the house you are moving to in the rue vanneau but i would not go for i saw at once the reasons for this fresh piece of kindness yes you would have kept an eye on me i know said madame marneffe 
that was no doubt the motive of his generosity replied lisbeth in paris most beneficence is a speculation as most acts of ingratitude are revenge to a poor relation you behave as you do to rats to whom you offer a bit of bacon now i will accept the baron's offer for this house has grown intolerable to me you and i have wit enough to hold our tongues about everything that would damage us and tell all that needs telling so no blabbing and we are friends through thick and thin cried madame marneffe delighted to have a sheep-dog a confidante a sort of respectable aunt listen to me the baron is doing a great deal in the rue vanneau i believe you interrupted lisbeth he has spent thirty thousand francs where he got the money i'm sure i don't know for josepha the singer bled him dry oh you are in luck she went on the baron would steal for a woman who held his heart in two little white satin hands like yours well then said madame marneffe with the liberality of such creatures which is mere recklessness look here my dear child take away from here everything that may serve your turn in your new quarters that chest of drawers that wardrobe and mirror the carpet the curtains lisbeth's eyes dilated with excessive joy she was incredulous of such a gift you are doing more for me in a breath than my rich relations have done in thirty years she exclaimed they have never even asked themselves whether i had any furniture at all on his first visit a few weeks ago the baron made a rich man's face on seeing how poor i was thank you my dear and i will give you your money's worth you will see how by and by valerie went out on the landing with her cousin betty and the two women embraced Puh, how she stinks of hard work said the pretty little woman to herself when she was alone i shall not embrace you often my dear cousin at the same time i must look sharp she must be skilfully managed for she can be of use and help me to make my fortune like the true creole of paris madame marneffe abhorred trouble she had the calm indifference of a cat which never jumps or runs but when urged by necessity to her life must be all pleasure and the pleasure without difficulties she loved flowers provided they were brought to her she could not imagine going to the play but to a good box at her own command and in a carriage to take her there valerie inherited these courtesan tastes from her mother on whom general montcornet had lavished luxury when he was in paris and who for twenty years had seen all the world at her feet who had been wasteful and prodigal squandering her all in the luxurious living of which the programme has been lost since the fall of napoleon the grandees of the empire were a match in their follies for the great nobles of the last century under the restoration the nobility cannot forget that it has been beaten and robbed and so with two or three exceptions it has become thrifty prudent and stay-at-home in short bourgeois and penurious since then eighteen thirty has crowned the work of seventeen ninety three in france henceforth there will be great names but no great houses unless there should be political changes which we can hardly foresee everything takes the stamp of individuality the wisest invest in annuities family pride is destroyed the bitter pressure of poverty which had stung valerie to the quick on the day when to use marneffe's expression she had caught on with hulot had brought the young woman to the conclusion that she would make a fortune by means of her good looks so for some days she had been feeling the need of having a friend about her to take the place of a mother a devoted friend to whom such things may be told as must be hidden from a waiting-maid and who could act come and go and think for her a beast of burden resigned to an unequal share of life now she quite as keenly as lisbeth had understood the baron's motives for fostering the intimacy between his cousin and herself prompted by the formidable perspicacity of the parisian half-breed who spends her days stretched on a sofa turning the lantern of her detective spirit on the obscurest depths of souls sentiments and intrigues she had decided on making an ally of the spy 
this supremely rash step was perhaps premeditated she had discerned the true nature of this ardent creature burning with wasted passion and meant to attach her to herself thus their conversation was like the stone a traveller casts into an abyss to demonstrate its depth and madame marneffe had been terrified to find this old maid a combination of iago and richard the third so feeble as she seemed so humble and so little to be feared for that instant lisbeth fisher had been her real self that corsican and savage temperament bursting the slender bonds that held it under had sprung up to its terrible height as the branch of a tree flies up from the hand of a child that has bent it down to gather the green fruit to those who study the social world it must always be a matter of astonishment to see the fullness the perfection and the rapidity with which an idea develops in a virgin nature virginity like every other monstrosity has its special richness its absorbing greatness life whose forces are always economized assumes in the virgin creature an incalculable power of resistance and endurance the brain is reinforced in the sum total of its reserved energy when really chaste natures need to call on the resources of body or soul and are required to act or to think they have muscles of steel or intuitive knowledge in their intelligence diabolical strength or the black magic of the will from this point of view the virgin mary even if we regard her only as a symbol is supremely great above every other type whether hindu egyptian or greek virginity the mother of great things magna parens rerum holds in her fair white hands the keys of the upper worlds in short that grand and terrible exception deserves all the honors decreed to her by the catholic church thus in one moment lisbeth fisher had become the mohican whose snares none can escape whose dissimulation is inscrutable whose swift decisiveness is the outcome of the incredible perfection of every organ of sense she was hatred and revenge as implacable as they are in italy spain and the east these two feelings the obverse of friendship and love carried to the utmost are known only in lands scorched by the sun but lisbeth was also a daughter of lorraine bent on deceit she accepted this detail of her part against her will she began by making a curious attempt due to her ignorance she fancied as children do that being imprisoned meant the same thing as solitary confinement but this is the superlative degree of imprisonment and that superlative is the privilege of the criminal bench as soon as she left madame marneffe lisbeth hurried off to monsieur rivet and found him in his office well my dear monsieur rivet she began when she had bolted the door of the room you were quite right those poles they are low villains all alike men who know neither law nor fidelity and who want to set europe on fire said the peaceable rivet to ruin every trade and every trader for the sake of a country that is all bogland they say and full of horrible jews to say nothing of the cossacks and the peasants a sort of wild beasts classed by mistake with human beings your poles do not understand the times we live in we are no longer barbarians war is coming to an end my dear mademoiselle it went out with the monarchy this is the age of triumph for commerce and industry and middle-class prudence such as were the making of holland yes he went on with animation we live in a period when nations must obtain all they need by the legal extension of their liberties and by the pacific action of constitutional institutions that is what the poles do not see and i hope you were saying my dear he added interrupting himself when he saw from his workwoman's face that high politics were beyond her comprehension here is the schedule said lisbeth if i don't want to lose my three thousand two hundred and ten francs i must clap this rogue into prison didn't i tell you so cried the oracle of the saint denis quarter the rivets successor to pons brothers had kept their shop still in the rue des mauvaises paroles 
in the ancient hotel langeais built by that illustrious family at the time when the nobility still gathered round the louvre yes and i blessed you on my way here replied lisbeth if he suspects nothing he can be safe in prison by eight o'clock in the morning said rivet consulting the almanac to ascertain the hour of sunrise but not till the day after to-morrow for he cannot be imprisoned till he has had notice that he is to be arrested by writ with the option of payment or imprisonment and so what an idiotic law exclaimed lisbeth of course the debtor escapes he has every right to do so said the assessor smiling so this is the way as to that said lisbeth interrupting him i will take the paper and hand it to him saying that i have been obliged to raise the money and that the lender insists on this formality i know my gentleman he will not even look at the paper he will light his pipe with it not a bad idea not bad mademoiselle fisher well make your mind easy the job shall be done but stop a minute to put your man in prison is not the only point to be considered you only want to indulge in that legal luxury in order to get your money who is to pay you those who give him money to be sure i forgot that the minister of war had commissioned him to erect a monument to one of our late customers ah the house has supplied many a uniform to general montcornet he soon blackened them with the smoke of cannon a brave man he was and he paid on the nail a marshal of france may have saved the emperor or his country he paid on the nail will always be the highest praise he can have from a tradesman very well and on saturday monsieur rivet you shall have the flat tassels by the way i am moving from the rue de doyenne i am going to live in the rue vanneau you are very right i could not bear to see you in that hole which in spite of my aversion to the opposition i must say is a disgrace i repeat it yes is a disgrace to the louvre and the place du carrousel i am devoted to louis philippe he is my idol he is the august and exact representative of the class on whom he founded his dynasty and i can never forget what he did for the trimming makers by restoring the national guard when i hear you speak so monsieur rivet i cannot help wondering why you are not made a deputy they are afraid of my attachment to the dynasty replied rivet my political enemies are the kings he has a noble character they are a fine family in short he said returning to the charge he is our ideal morality economy everything but the completion of the louvre is one of the conditions on which we gave him the crown and the civil list which i admit had no limits set to it leaves the heart of paris in a most melancholy state it is because i am so strongly in favor of the middle course that i should like to see the middle of paris in a better condition your part of the town is positively terrifying you would have been murdered there one fine day and so your monsieur crevel has been made major of his division he will come to us i hope for his big epaulette i am dining with him to-night and will send him to you lisbeth believed that she had secured her livonian to herself by cutting him off from all communication with the outer world if he could no longer work the artist would be forgotten as completely as a man buried in a cellar where she alone would go to see him thus she had two happy days for she hoped to deal a mortal blow at the baroness and her daughter to go to crevel's house in the rue de saussay she crossed the pont du carrousel went along the quai voltaire the quai d'orsay the rue bellechasse rue de l'université the pont de la concorde and the avenue de marigny this illogical route was traced by the logic of passion always the foe of the legs cousin betty as long as she followed the line of the quays kept watch on the opposite shore of the seine walking very slowly she had guessed rightly she had left wenceslas dressing she at once understood that as soon as he should be rid of her the lover would go off to the baroness's by the shortest road and in fact as she wandered along by the parapet of the quai voltaire in fancy suppressing the river and walking along the opposite bank 
she recognized the artist as he came out of the tuileries to cross the pont royal she there came up with the faithless one and could follow him unseen for lovers rarely look behind them she escorted him as far as madame hulot's house where he went in like an accustomed visitor this crowning proof confirming madame marneffe's revelations put lisbeth quite beside herself she arrived at the newly promoted major's door in the state of mental irritation which prompts men to commit murder and found m crevel senior in his drawing-room awaiting his children m and madame hulot junior but celestin crevel was so unconscious and so perfect a type of the parisian parvenu that we can scarcely venture so unceremoniously into the presence of cesar birotteau's successor celestin crevel was a world in himself and he even more than rivet deserves the honours of the palette by reason of his importance in this domestic drama End of chapter eleven chapter twelve of cousin betty by honore de balzac translated by james waring this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by bruce peary chapter twelve have you ever observed how in childhood or at the early stages of social life we create a model for our own imitation with our own hands as it were and often without knowing it the banker's clerk for instance as he enters his master's drawing-room dreams of possessing such another if he makes a fortune it will not be the luxury of the day twenty years later that you will find in his house but the old-fashioned splendour that fascinated him of yore it is impossible to tell how many absurdities are due to this retrospective jealousy and in the same way we know nothing of the follies due to the covert rivalry that urges men to copy the type they have set themselves and exhaust their powers in shining with a reflected light like the moon crevel was deputy mayor because his predecessor had been he was major because he coveted cesar birotteau's epaulettes in the same way struck by the marvels wrought by grindot the architect at the time when fortune had carried his master to the top of the wheel crevel had never looked at both sides of a crown piece to use his own language when he wanted to do up his rooms he had gone with his purse open and his eyes shut to grindot who by this time was quite forgotten it is impossible to guess how long an extinct reputation may survive supported by such stale admiration so grindot for the thousandth time had displayed his white and gold drawing-room panelled with crimson damask the furniture of rosewood clumsily carved as such work is done for the trade had in the country been the source of just pride in paris workmanship on the occasion of an industrial exhibition the candelabra the fire-dogs the fender the chandelier the clock were all in the most unmeaning style of scroll work the round table a fixture in the middle of the room was a mosaic of fragments of italian and antique marbles brought from rome where these dissected maps are made of mineralogical specimens for all the world like tailor's patterns an object of perennial admiration to crevel's citizen friends the portraits of the late lamented madame crevel of crevel himself of his daughter and his son-in-law hung on the walls two and two they were the work of pierre grassou the favoured painter of the bourgeoisie to whom crevel owed his ridiculous byronic attitude the frames costing a thousand francs each were quite in harmony with this coffee-house magnificence which would have made any true artist shrug his shoulders money never yet missed the smallest opportunity of being stupid we should have in paris ten venices if our retired merchants had had the instinct for fine things characteristic of the italians even in our own day a milanese merchant could leave five hundred thousand francs to the duomo to regild the colossal statue of the virgin that crowns the edifice canova in his will desired his brother to build a church costing four million francs and that brother adds something on his own account 
would a citizen of paris and they all like rivet love their paris in their heart ever dream of building the spires that are lacking to the towers of notre dame and only think of the sums that revert to the state in property for which no heirs are found all the improvements of paris might have been completed with the money spent on stucco castings gilt mouldings and sham sculpture during the last fifteen years by individuals of the crevel stamp beyond this drawing-room was a splendid boudoir furnished with tables and cabinets in imitation of boule the bedroom smart with chintz also opened out of the drawing-room mahogany in all its glory infested the dining-room and swiss views gorgeously framed graced the panels crevel who hoped to travel in switzerland had set his heart on possessing the scenery in painting till the time should come when he might see it in reality so as will have been seen crevel the mayor's deputy of the legion of honor and of the national guard had faithfully reproduced all the magnificence even as to furniture of his luckless predecessor under the restoration where one had sunk this other quite overlooked had come to the top not by any strange stroke of fortune but by the force of circumstance in revolutions as in storms at sea solid treasure goes to the bottom and light trifles are floated to the surface cesar birotteau a royalist in favor and envied had been made the mark of bourgeois hostility while bourgeoisie triumphant found its incarnation in crevel this apartment at a rent of a thousand crowns crammed with all the vulgar magnificence that money can buy occupied the first floor of a fine old house between a courtyard and a garden everything was as spick and span as the beetles in an entomological case for crevel lived very little at home this gorgeous residence was the ambitious citizen's legal domicile his establishment consisted of a woman cook and a valet he hired two extra men and had a dinner sent in by chevet whenever he gave a banquet to his political friends to men he wanted to dazzle or to a family party the seat of crevel's real domesticity formerly in the rue notre dame de lorette with mademoiselle heloise brisetou had lately been transferred as we have seen to the rue chauchat every morning the retired merchant every ex-tradesman is a retired merchant spent two hours in the rue des saussets to attend to business and gave the rest of his time to mademoiselle zaire which annoyed zaire very much Osman crevel had a fixed bargain with mademoiselle heloise she owed him five hundred francs worth of enjoyment every month and no bills delivered he paid separately for his dinner and all extras this agreement with certain bonuses for he made her a good many presents seemed cheap to the ex-attache of the great singer and he would say to widowers who were fond of their daughters that it paid better to job your horses than to have a stable of your own at the same time if the reader remembers the speech made to the baron by the porter at the rue chauchat crevel did not escape the coachman and the groom crevel as may be seen had turned his passionate affection for his daughter to the advantage of his self-indulgence the immoral aspect of the situation was justified by the highest morality and then the ex-perfumer derived from this style of living it was the inevitable a free and easy life regence pompadour maréchal de richelieu what not a certain veneer of superiority crevel set up for being a man of broad views a fine gentleman with an air and grace a liberal man with nothing narrow in his ideas and all for the small sum of about twelve to fifteen hundred francs a month this was the result not of hypocritical policy but of middle-class vanity though it came to the same in the end on the bourse crevel was regarded as a man superior to his time and especially as a man of pleasure a bon vivant in this particular crevel flattered himself that he had overtopped his worthy friend birotteau by a hundred cubits and is it you cried crevel flying into a rage as he saw lisbeth enter the room 
who have plotted this marriage between mademoiselle hulot and your young count whom you have been bringing up by hand for her you don't seem best pleased at it said lisbeth fixing a piercing eye on crevel what interest can you have in hindering my cousin's marriage for it was you i am told who hindered her marrying monsieur lebas son you are a good soul and to be trusted said crevel well then do you suppose that i will ever forgive monsieur hulot for the crime of having robbed me of josepha especially when he turned a decent girl whom i should have married in my old age into a good-for-nothing slut a mountebank an opera singer no no never he is a very good fellow too is monsieur hulot said cousin betty amiable very amiable too amiable replied crevel i wish him no harm but i do wish to have my revenge and i will have it it is my one idea and is that desire the reason why you no longer visit madame hulot possibly aha then you were courting my fair cousin said lisbeth with a smile i thought as much and she treated me like a dog worse like a footman nay i might say like a political prisoner but i will succeed yet said he striking his brow with his clenched fist poor man it would be dreadful to catch his wife deceiving him after being packed off by his mistress josepha cried crevel has josepha thrown him over packed him off turned him out neck and crop bravo josepha you have avenged me i will send you a pair of pearls to hang in your ears my ex-sweetheart i knew nothing of it for after i had seen you on the day after that when the fair adeline had shown me the door i went back to visit the lebas at corbeil and have but just come back eloise played the very devil to get me into the country and i have found out the purpose of her game she wanted me out of the way while she gave a housewarming in the rue chauchat with some artists and players and writers she took me in but i can forgive her for eloise amuses me she is a déjazé under a bushel what a character the hussy is there is the note i found last evening dear old chap i have pitched my tent in the rue chauchat i have taken the precaution of getting a few friends to clean up the paint all is well come when you please monsieur hagar awaits her abraham eloise will have some news for me for she has her bohemia at her finger's end but monsieur hulot took the disaster very calmly said lisbeth impossible cried crevel stopping in a parade as regular as the swing of a pendulum monsieur hulot is not as young as he was lisbeth remarked significantly i know that said crevel but in one point we are alike hulot cannot do without an attachment he is capable of going back to his wife it would be a novelty for him but an end to my vengeance you smile mademoiselle fischer ah perhaps you know something i am smiling at your notions replied lisbeth yes my cousin is still handsome enough to inspire a passion i should certainly fall in love with her if i were a man cut and come again exclaimed crevel you are laughing at me the baron has already found consolation lisbeth bowed affirmatively he is a lucky man if he can find a second josepha within twenty-four hours said crevel but i am not altogether surprised for he told me one evening at supper that when he was a young man he always had three mistresses on hand that he might not be left high and dry the one he was giving over the one in possession and the one he was courting for a future emergency he had some smart little workwoman in reserve no doubt in his fish-pond his parc au cerf he is very louis the fifteenth is my gentleman he is in luck to be so handsome however he is aging his face shows it he is taken up with some little milliner dear me no replied lisbeth oh cried crevel what would i not do to hinder him from hanging up his hat i could not win back josepha women of that kind never come back to their first love besides it is truly said such a return is not love 
but cousin betty i would pay down fifty thousand francs that is to say i would spend it to rob that great good-looking fellow of his mistress and to show him that a major with a portly stomach and a brain made to become mayor of paris though he is a grandfather is not to have his mistress tickled away by a poacher without turning the tables my position said lisbeth compels me to hear everything and know nothing you may talk to me without fear i never repeat a word of what any one may choose to tell me how can you suppose i should ever break that rule of conduct no one would ever trust me again i know said crevel you are the very jewel of old maids still come there are exceptions look here the family have never settled an allowance on you but i have my pride said lisbeth i do not choose to be an expense to anybody if you will but help me to my revenge the tradesman went on i will sink ten thousand francs in an annuity for you tell me my fair cousin tell me who has stepped into josepha's shoes and you will have money to pay your rent your little breakfast in the morning the good coffee you love so well you might allow yourself pure mocha eh? and a very good thing is pure mocha i do not care so much for the ten thousand francs in an annuity which would bring me nearly five hundred francs a year as for absolute secrecy said lisbeth for you see my dear monsieur crevel the baron is very good to me he is to pay my rent oh yes long may that last i advise you to trust him cried crevel where will he find the money ah that i don't know at the same time he is spending more than thirty thousand francs on the rooms he is furnishing for this little lady a lady what a woman in society the rascal what luck he has he is the only favorite a married woman and quite the lady lisbeth affirmed really and truly cried crevel opening wide eyes flashing with envy quite as much as at the magic words quite the lady yes really said lisbeth clever a musician three-and-twenty a pretty innocent face a dazzling white skin teeth like a puppy's eyes like stars a beautiful forehead and tiny feet i never saw the like they are not wider than her stay busk and ears asked crevel keenly alive to this catalogue of charms ears for a model she replied and small hands i tell you in few words a gem of a woman and high-minded and modest and refined a beautiful soul an angel and with every distinction for her father was a marshal of france a marshal of france shrieked crevel positively bounding with excitement good heavens by the holy piper by all the joys in paradise the rascal i beg your pardon cousin i am going crazy i think i would give a hundred thousand francs i dare say you would and i tell you she is a respectable woman a woman of virtue the baron has forked out handsomely he has not a sou i tell you there is a husband he has pushed where did he push him asked crevel with a bitter laugh he is promoted to be second in his office this husband who will oblige no doubt and his name is down for the cross of the legion of honor the government ought to be judicious and respect those who have the cross by not flinging it broadcast said crevel with the look of an aggrieved politician but what is there about the man that old bulldog of a baron he went on it seems to me that i am quite a match for him and he struck an attitude as he looked at himself in the glass eloise has told me many a time at moments when a woman speaks the truth that i was wonderful oh said lisbeth women like big men they are almost always good-natured and if i had to decide between you and the baron i should choose you monsieur hulot is amusing handsome and has a figure but you you are substantial and then you see you look an even greater scamp than he does it is incredible how all women even pious women take to men who have that about them exclaimed crevel putting his arm round lisbeth's waist he was so jubilant 
the difficulty does not lie there said betty you must see that a woman who is getting so many advantages will not be unfaithful to her patron for nothing and it would cost you more than a hundred odd thousand francs for our little friend can look forward to seeing her husband at the head of his office within two years time it is poverty that is dragging the poor little angel into that pit crevel was striding up and down the drawing-room in a state of frenzy he must be uncommonly fond of the woman he inquired after a pause while his desires thus goaded by lisbeth rose to a sort of madness you may judge for yourself replied lisbeth i don't believe he has had that of her said she snapping her thumb-nail against one of her enormous white teeth and he has given her ten thousand francs worth of presents already what a good joke it would be cried crevel if i got to the winning post first good heavens it is too bad of me to be telling you all this tittle-tattle said lisbeth with an air of compunction no i mean to put your relations to the blush to-morrow i shall invest in your name such a sum in five per cents as will give you six hundred francs a year but then you must tell me everything his dulcinea's name and residence to you i will make a clean breast of it i never have had a real lady for a mistress and it is the height of my ambition mahomet's houris are nothing in comparison with what i fancy a woman of fashion must be in short it is my dream my mania and to such a point that i declare to you the baroness hulot to me will never be fifty said he unconsciously plagiarizing one of the greatest wits of the last century i assure you my good lisbeth i am prepared to sacrifice a hundred two hundred hush here are the young people i see them crossing the courtyard i shall never have learned anything through you i give you my word of honor for i do not want you to lose the baron's confidence quite the contrary he must be amazingly fond of this woman that old boy he is crazy about her said lisbeth he could not find forty thousand francs to marry his daughter off but he has got them somehow for his new passion and do you think that she loves him at his age said the old maid oh what an owl i am cried crevel when i myself allowed heloise to keep her artist exactly as henri the ninth allowed gabrielle her belgrade alas old age old age good morning celestine how do my jewel and the brat ah here he comes on my honor he is beginning to be like me good day hulot quite well we shall soon be having another wedding in the family celestine and her husband as a hint to their father glanced at the old maid who audaciously asked in reply to crevel indeed whose crevel put on an air of reserve which was meant to convey that he would make up for her indiscretions that of hortense he replied but it is not yet quite settled i have just come from the le bas and they were talking of mademoiselle popinot as a suitable match for their son the young counsellor for he would like to get the presidency of a provincial court now come to dinner End of chapter twelve Chapter Thirteen of Cousin Betty by Honoré de Balzac, translated by James Waring. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Chapter Thirteen. By seven o'clock, Lisbeth had returned home in an omnibus, for she was eager to see Wenceslas, whose dupe she had been for three weeks, and to whom she was carrying a basket filled with fruit by the hands of Crevel himself, whose attentions were doubled towards his cousin Betty she flew up to the attic at a pace that took her breath away and found the artist finishing the ornamentation of a box to be presented to the adored hortense the framework of the lid represented hydrangeas in french called hortensias among which little loves were playing 
the poor lover to enable him to pay for the materials of the box at which the panels were of malachite had designed two candlesticks for florent and chanor and sold them the copyright two admirable pieces of work you have been working too hard these last few days my dear fellow said lisbeth wiping the perspiration from his brow and giving him a kiss such laborious diligence is really dangerous in the month of august seriously you may injure your health look here are some peaches and plums from m crevel now do not worry yourself so much i have borrowed two thousand francs and short of some disaster we can repay them when you sell your clock at the same time the lender seems to me suspicious for he has just sent in this document she laid the writ under the model sketch of the statue of general montcornet for whom are you making this pretty thing said she taking up the model sprays of hydrangea in red wax which wenceslas had laid down while eating the fruit for a jeweller for what jeweller i do not know stidman asked me to make something out of them as he is very busy but these she said in a deep voice are hortensias how is it that you have never made anything in wax for me is it so difficult to design a pin a little box what not as a keepsake and she shot a fearful glance at the artist whose eyes were happily lowered and yet you say you love me can you doubt it mademoiselle that is indeed an ardent mademoiselle why you have been my only thought since i found you dying just there when i saved you you vowed you were mine i mean to hold you to that pledge but i made a vow to myself i said to myself since the boy says he is mine i mean to make him rich and happy well and i can make your fortune how said the hapless artist at the height of joy and too artless to dream of a snare why thus said she lisbeth could not deprive herself of the savage pleasure of gazing at wenceslas who looked up at her with filial affection the expression really of his love for hortense which deluded the old maid seeing in a man's eyes for the first time in her life the blazing torch of passion she fancied it was for her that it was lighted m crevel will back us to the extent of a hundred thousand francs to start in business if as he says you will marry me he has queer ideas has the worthy man well what do you say to it she added the artist as pale as the dead looked at his benefactress with a lustreless eye which plainly spoke his thoughts he stood stupefied and open-mouthed i never before was so distinctly told that i am hideous said she with a bitter laugh mademoiselle said steinbach my benefactress can never be ugly in my eyes i have the greatest affection for you but i am not yet thirty and i am forty-three said lisbeth my cousin adeline is forty-eight and men are still madly in love with her but then she is handsome she is fifteen years between us mademoiselle how could we get on together for both our sakes i think we should be wise to think it over my gratitude shall be fully equal to your great kindness and your money shall be repaid in a few days my money cried she you treat me as if i were nothing but an unfeeling usurer forgive me said wenceslas but you remind me of it so often well it is you who have made me do not crush me you mean to be rid of me i can see said she shaking her head who has endowed you with this strength of ingratitude you who are a man of papier mache have you ceased to trust me your good genius me when i have spent so many nights working for you when i have given you every franc i have saved in my lifetime when for four years i have shared my bread with you the bread of a hard-worked woman and given you all i had to my very courage mademoiselle no more no more he cried kneeling before her with uplifted hands say not another word in three days i will tell you you shall know all let me let me be happy and he kissed her hands i love and i am loved well well my child be happy she said lifting him up 
and she kissed his forehead and hair with the eagerness that a man condemned to death must feel as he lives through the last morning ah you are of all creatures the noblest and best you are a match for the woman i love said the poor artist i love you well enough to tremble for your future fate said she gloomily judas hanged himself the ungrateful always come to a bad end you are deserting me and you will never again do any good work consider whether without being married for i know i am an old maid and i do not want to smother the blossom of your youth your poetry as you call it in my arms that are like vine stalks but whether without being married we could not get on together listen i have the commercial spirit i could save you a fortune in the course of ten years work for economy is my name while wow, with a young wife who would be sheer expenditure you would squander everything you would work only to indulge her but happiness creates nothing but memories even i when i am thinking of you sit for hours with my hands in my lap come wenceslas stay with me look here i understand all about it you shall have your mistresses pretty ones too like that little marneffe woman who wants to see you and who will give you happiness you could never find with me then when i have saved you thirty thousand francs a year in the funds mademoiselle you are an angel and i shall never forget this hour said wenceslas wiping away his tears that is how i like to see you my child said she gazing at him with rapture vanity is so strong a power in us all that lisbeth believed in her triumph she had conceded so much when offering him madame marneffe it was the crowning emotion of her life for the first time she felt the full tide of joy rising in her heart to go through such an experience again she would have sold her soul to the devil i am engaged to be married steinbock replied and i love a woman with whom no other can compete or compare but you are and always will be to me the mother i have lost the words fell like an avalanche of snow on a burning crater lisbeth sat down she gazed with despondent eyes on the youth before her on his aristocratic beauty the artist's brow the splendid hair everything that appealed to her suppressed feminine instincts and tiny tears moistened her eyes for an instant and immediately dried up she looked like one of those meagre statues which the sculptors of the middle ages carved on monuments i cannot curse you said she suddenly rising you you are but a boy god preserve you she went downstairs and shut herself into her own room she is in love with me poor creature said wenceslas to himself and how fervently eloquent she is crazy this last effort on the part of an arid and narrow nature to keep hold on an embodiment of beauty and poetry was in truth so violent that it can only be compared to the frenzied vehemence of a shipwrecked creature making the last struggle to reach shore on the next day but one at half past four in the morning when count steinbock was sunk in the deepest sleep he heard a knock at the door of his attic he rose to open it and saw two men in shabby clothing and a third whose dress proclaimed him a bailiff down on his luck you are monsieur wenceslas count steinbock said this man yes monsieur my name is grasset sir successor to luchard sheriff's officer what then you are under arrest sir you must come with us to prison to clichy please to get dressed we have done the civil as you see i have brought no police and there is a hackney cab below you are safely nabbed you see said one of the bailiffs and we look to you to be liberal steinbock dressed and went downstairs a man holding each arm when he was in the cab the driver started without orders as knowing where he was to go and within half an hour the unhappy foreigner found himself safely under bolt and bar without even a remonstrance so utterly amazed was he at ten o'clock he was sent for to the prison office where he found lisbeth who in tears gave him some money to feed himself adequately and to pay for a room large enough to work in 
my dear boy said she never say a word of your arrest to anybody do not write to a living soul it would ruin you for life we must hide this blot on your character i will soon have you out i will collect the money be quite easy write down what you want for your work you shall soon be free or i will die for it oh i shall owe you my life a second time cried he for i should lose more than my life if i were thought a bad fellow lisbeth went off in great glee she hoped by keeping her artist under lock and key to put a stop to his marriage by announcing that he was a married man pardoned by the efforts of his wife and gone off to russia to carry out this plan at about three o'clock she went to the baroness though it was not the day when she was due to dine with her but she wished to enjoy the anguish which hortense must endure at the hour when wenceslas was in the habit of making his appearance have you come to dinner asked the baroness concealing her disappointment well yes that's well replied hortense i will go and tell them to be punctual for you do not like to be kept waiting hortense nodded reassuringly to her mother for she intended to tell the man-servant to send away monsieur steinbock if he should call the man however happened to be out so hortense was obliged to give her orders to the maid and the girl went upstairs to fetch her needlework and sit in the ante-room and about my lover said cousin betty to hortense when the girl came back you never ask about him now to be sure what is he doing said hortense he has become famous you ought to be very happy she added in an undertone to lisbeth everybody is talking of monsieur wenceslas steinbock a great deal too much replied she in her clear tones monsieur is departing if it were only a matter of charming him so far as to defy the attractions of paris i know my power but they say that in order to secure the services of such an artist the emperor nichols has pardoned him nonsense said the baroness when did you hear that asked hortense who felt as if her heart had the cramp well said the villainous lisbeth a person to whom he is bound by the most sacred ties his wife wrote yesterday to tell him so he wants to be off oh he will be a great fool to give up france to go to russia hortense looked at her mother but her head sank on one side the baroness was only just in time to support her daughter who dropped fainting and as white as her lace kerchief lisbeth you have killed my child cried the baroness you were born to be our curse bless me what fault of mine is this adeline replied lisbeth as she rose with a menacing aspect of which the baroness in her alarm took no notice i was wrong said adeline supporting the girl ring at this instant the door opened the women both looked round and saw wenceslas steinbock who had been admitted by the cook in the maid's absence hortense cried the artist with one spring to the group of women and he kissed his betrothed before her mother's eyes on the forehead and so reverently that the baroness could not be angry it was a better restorative than any smelling salts hortense opened her eyes saw wenceslas and her color came back in a few minutes she had quite recovered so this was your secret said lisbeth smiling at wenceslas and affecting to guess the facts from her two cousins confusion but how did you steal away my lover said she leading hortense into the garden hortense artlessly told the romance of her love her father and mother she said being convinced that lisbeth would never marry had authorized the count's visits only hortense like a full-blown agnes attributed to chance her purchase of the group and the introduction of the artist who by her account had insisted on knowing the name of his first purchaser presently steinbock came out to join the cousins and thanked the old maid effusively for his prompt release lisbeth replied jesuitically that the creditor having given very vague promises she had not hoped to be able to get him out before the morrow and that the person who had lent her the money ashamed perhaps of such mean conduct had been beforehand with her 
the old maid appeared to be perfectly content and congratulated wenceslas on his happiness you bad boy said she before hortense and her mother if you had only told me the evening before last that you loved my cousin hortense and that she loved you you would have spared me many tears i thought that you were deserting your old friend your governess while on the contrary you are to become my cousin henceforth you will be connected with me remotely it is true but by ties that amply justify the feelings i have for you and she kissed wenceslas on the forehead hortense threw herself into lisbeth's arms and melted into tears i owe my happiness to you said she and i will never forget it cousin betty said the baroness embracing lisbeth in her excitement at seeing matters so happily settled the baron and i owe you a debt of gratitude and we will pay it come and talk things over with me she added leading her away so lisbeth to all appearances was playing the part of a good angel to the whole family she was adored by crevel and hulot by adeline and hortense we wish you to give up working said the baroness if you earn forty sous a day sundays excepted that makes six hundred francs a year well then how much have you saved four thousand five hundred francs poor betty said her cousin she raised her eyes to heaven so deeply was she moved at the thought of all the labor and privation such a sum must represent accumulated during thirty years lisbeth misunderstanding the meaning of the exclamation took it as the ironical pity of the successful woman and her hatred was strengthened by a large infusion of venom at the very moment when her cousin had cast off her last shred of distrust of the tyrant of her childhood we will add ten thousand five hundred francs to that sum said adeline and put it in trust so that you shall draw the interest for life with reversion to hortense thus you will have six hundred francs a year lisbeth feigned the utmost satisfaction when she went in her handkerchief to her eyes wiping away tears of joy hortense told her of all the favors being showered on wenceslas beloved of the family so when the baron came home he found his family all present for the baroness had formally accepted wenceslas by the title of son and the wedding was fixed if her husband should approve for a day a fortnight hence the moment he came into the drawing-room hulot was rushed at by his wife and daughter who ran to meet him adeline to speak to him privately and hortense to kiss him you have gone too far in pledging me to this madame said the baron sternly you are not married yet he added with a look at steinbock who turned pale he has heard of my imprisonment said the luckless artist to himself come children said he leading his daughter and the young man into the garden they all sat down on the moss-eaten seat in the summer-house monsieur le comte do you love my daughter as well as i loved her mother he asked more monsieur said the sculptor her mother was a peasant's daughter and had not a farthing of her own only give me mademoiselle hortense just as she is without a trousseau even so i should think said the baron smiling hortense is the daughter of the baron hulot d'ervy councillor of state high up in the war office grand commander of the legion of honor and the brother to count hulot whose glory is immortal and who will ere long be marshal of france and she has a marriage portion it is true said the impassioned artist i must seem very ambitious but if my dear hortense were a laborer's daughter i would marry her that is just what i wanted to know replied the baron run away hortense and leave me to talk business with monsieur le comte he really loves you you see oh papa i was sure you were only in jest said the happy girl my dear steinbach said the baron with elaborate grace of diction and the most perfect manners as soon as he and the artist were alone i promised my son a fortune of two hundred thousand francs of which the poor boy has never had a sou and he never will get any of it my daughter's fortune will also be two hundred thousand francs for which you will give a receipt yes monsieur le baron 
you go too fast said hulot have the goodness to hear me out i cannot expect from a son-in-law such devotion as i look for from my son my son knew exactly all i could and would do for his future promotion he will be a minister and will easily make good his two hundred thousand francs but with you young man matters are different i shall give you a bond for sixty thousand francs in state funds at five per cent in your wife's name this income will be diminished by a small charge in the form of an annuity to lisbeth but she will not live long she is consumptive i know tell no one it is a secret let the poor soul die in peace my daughter will have a trousseau worth twenty thousand francs her mother will give her six thousand francs worth of diamonds monsieur you overpower me said steinbock quite bewildered as to the remaining hundred and twenty thousand francs say no more monsieur said wenceslas i ask only for my beloved hortense will you listen to me effervescent youth as to the remaining hundred and twenty thousand francs i have not got them but you will have them monsieur you will get them from the government in payment for commissions which i will secure for you i pledge you my word of honor you are to have a studio you see at the government depot exhibit a few fine statues and i will get you received at the institute the highest personages have a regard for my brother and for me and i hope to succeed in securing for you a commission for sculpture at versailles up to a quarter of the whole sum you will have orders from the city of paris and from the chamber of peers in short my dear fellow you will have so many that you will be obliged to get assistance in that way i shall pay off my debt to you you must say whether this way of giving a portion will suit you whether you are equal to it i am equal to making a fortune for my wife single-handed if all else failed cried the artist nobleman that is what i admire cried the baron high-minded youth that fears nothing come he added clasping hands with the young sculptor to conclude the bargain you have my consent we will sign the contract on sunday next and the wedding shall be on the following saturday my wife's fete day it is all right said the baroness to her daughter who stood glued to the window your suitor and your father are embracing each other on going home in the evening wenceslas found the solution of the mystery of his release the porter handed him a thick sealed packet containing the schedule of his debts with a signed receipt affixed at the bottom of the writ and accompanied by this letter my dear wenceslas i went to fetch you at ten o'clock this morning to introduce you to a royal highness who wishes to see you there i learned that the duns had had you conveyed to a certain little domain chief town clichy castle so i went off to leon de lora and told him for a joke that you could not leave your country quarters for lack of four thousand francs and that you would spoil your future prospects if you did not make your bow to your royal patron happily bridau was there a man of genius who has known what it is to be poor and has heard your story my boy between them they have found the money and i went off to pay the turk who committed treason against genius by putting you in quod as i had to be at the tuileries at noon i could not wait to see you sniffing the outer air i know you to be a gentleman and i answered for you to my two friends but look them up to-morrow leon and bridau do not want your cash they will ask you to do them each a group and they are right at least so thinks the man who wishes he could sign himself your rival but is only your faithful ally stidman p s i told the prince you were away and would not return till to-morrow so he said very good to-morrow count wenceslas went to bed in sheets of purple without a rose-leaf to wrinkle them that favor can make for us favor the halting divinity who moves more slowly for men of genius than either justice or fortune because jove has not chosen to bandage her eyes hence lightly deceived by the display of impostors and attracted by their frippery and trumpets she spends the time in seeing them and the money in paying them which she ought to devote to seeking out men of merit in the nooks where they hide 
it will now be necessary to explain how monsieur le baron hulot had contrived to count up his expenditure on hortense's wedding portion and at the same time to defray the frightful cost of the charming rooms where madame marneffe was to make her home his financial scheme bore that stamp of talent which leads prodigals and men in love into the quagmires where so many disasters await them nothing can demonstrate more completely the strange capacity communicated by vice to which we owe the strokes of skill which ambitious or voluptuous men can occasionally achieve or in short any of the devil's pupils End of chapter thirteen chapter fourteen of cousin betty by honore de balzac translated by james waring this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by bruce peary chapter fourteen on the day before old johann fischer unable to pay thirty thousand francs drawn for on him by his nephew had found himself under the necessity of stopping payment unless the baron could remit the sum this ancient worthy with the white hairs of seventy years had such blind confidence in hulot who to the old bonapartist was an emanation from the napoleonic sun that he was calmly pacing his anteroom with the bank clerk in the little ground-floor apartment that he rented for eight hundred francs a year as the headquarters of his extensive dealings in corn and forage marguerite has gone to fetch the money from close by said he the official in his gray uniform braided with silver was so convinced of the old alsatian's honesty that he was prepared to leave the thirty thousand francs worth of bills in his hands but the old man would not let him go observing that the clock had not yet struck eight a cab drew up the old man rushed into the street and held out his hand to the baron with sublime confidence hulot handed him out thirty thousand franc notes go on three doors further and i will tell you why said fischer here young man he said returning to count out the money to the bank emissary whom he then saw to the door when the clerk was out of sight fischer called back the cab containing his august nephew napoleon's right hand and said as he led him into the house you do not want them to know at the bank of france that you paid me the thirty thousand francs after endorsing the bills it was bad enough to see them signed by such a man as you come to the bottom of your little garden father fischer said the important man you are hearty he went on sitting down under a vine arbor and scanning the old man from head to foot as a dealer in human flesh scans a substitute for the conscription ay hearty enough for a tontine said the lean little old man his sinews were wiry and his eye bright does heat disagree with you quite the contrary what do you say to africa a very nice country the french went there with the little corporal napoleon to get us all out of the present scrape you must go to algiers said the baron and how about my business an official in the war office who has to retire and has not enough to live on with his pension will buy your business and what am i to do in algiers supply the commissariat with victuals corn and forage i have your commission ready filled in and signed you can collect supplies in the country at seventy per cent below the prices at which you can credit us how shall we get them oh by raids by taxes in kind and the caliphate the country is little known though we settled there eight years ago algeria produces vast quantities of corn and forage when this produce belongs to arabs we take it from them under various pretenses when it belongs to us the arabs try to get it back again there is a great deal of fighting over the corn and no one ever knows exactly how much each party has stolen from the other there is not time in the open field to measure the corn as we do in the paris market or the hay as it is sold in the rue d'enfer the arab chiefs like our spahis prefer hard cash and sell the plunder at a very low price the commissariat needs a fixed quantity and must have it it winks at exorbitant prices calculated on the difficulty of procuring food and the dangers to which every form of transport is exposed 
that is algiers from the army contractor's point of view it is a muddle tempered by the ink bottle like every incipient government we shall not see our way through it for another ten years we who have to do the governing but private enterprise has sharp eyes so i am sending you there to make a fortune i give you the job as napoleon put an impoverished marshal at the head of a kingdom where smuggling might be secretly encouraged i am ruined my dear fisher i must have a hundred thousand francs within a year i see no harm in getting it out of the bedouins said the alsatian calmly it was always done under the empire the man who wants to buy your business will be here this morning and pay you ten thousand francs down the baron went on that will be enough i suppose to take you to africa the old man nodded assent as to capital out there be quite easy i will draw the remainder of the money due if i find it necessary all i have is yours my very blood said old fisher oh do not be uneasy said hulot fancying that his uncle saw more clearly than was the fact as to our excise dealings your character will not be impugned everything depends on the authority at your back now i myself appointed the authorities out there i am sure of them this uncle fisher is a dead secret between us i know you well and i have spoken out without concealment or circumlocution it shall be done said the old man and it will go on for two years you will have made a hundred thousand francs of your own to live happy on in the vosges i will do as you wish my honor is yours said the little old man quietly that is the sort of man i like however you must not go till you have seen your grandniece happily married she is to be a countess but even taxes and raids and the money paid by the war office clerk for fisher's business could not forthwith provide sixty thousand francs to give hortense to say nothing of her trousseau which was to cost about five thousand and the forty thousand spent or to be spent on madame marneffe where then had the baron found the thirty thousand francs he had just produced this was the history a few days previously hulot had insured his life for the sum of a hundred and fifty thousand francs for three years in two separate companies armed with the policies of which he paid the premium he had spoken as follows to the baron de nucingen a peer of the chamber in whose carriage he found himself after a sitting driving home in fact to dine with him baron i want seventy thousand francs and i apply to you you must find some one to lend his name to whom i will make over the right to draw my pay for three years it amounts to twenty-five thousand francs a year that is seventy-five thousand francs you will say but you may die the banker signified his assent here then is a policy of insurance for a hundred and fifty thousand francs which i will deposit with you till you have drawn up the eighty thousand francs said hulot producing the document from his pocket but if you should lose your place said the millionaire baron laughing the other baron not a millionaire looked grave be quite easy i only raised the question to show you that i was not devoid of merit in handing you the sum are you so short of cash for the bank will take your signature my daughter is to be married said baron hulot and i have no fortune like every one else who remains in office in these thankless times when five hundred ordinary men seated on benches will never reward the men who devote themselves to the service as handsomely as the emperor did well well but you had josepha on your hands replied nucingen and that accounts for everything between ourselves the duc d'herouville has done you a very good turn by removing that leech from sucking your purse dry i have known what that is and can pity your case he quoted take a friend's advice shut up shop or you will be done for this dirty business was carried out in the name of one vauvinet a small money-lender one of those jobbers who stand forward to screen great banking-houses like the little fish that is said to attend the shark 
this stock-jobber's apprentice was so anxious to gain the patronage of monsieur le baron hulot that he promised the great man to negotiate bills of exchange for thirty thousand francs at eighty days and pledged himself to renew them four times and never pass them out of his hands fisher's successor was to pay forty thousand francs for the house and the business with the promise that he should supply forage to a department close to paris this was the desperate maze of affairs into which a man who had hitherto been absolutely honest was led by his passions one of the best administrative officials under napoleon peculation to pay the money-lenders and borrowing of the money-lenders to gratify his passions and provide for his daughter all the efforts of this elaborate prodigality were directed at making a display before madame marneffe and to playing jupiter to this middle-class danai a man could not expend more activity intelligence and presence of mind in the honest acquisition of a fortune than the baron displayed in shoving his head into a wasp's nest he did all the business of his department he hurried on the upholsterers he talked to the workmen he kept a sharp lookout on the smallest details of the house in the rue vanneau wholly devoted to madame marneffe he nevertheless attended the sittings of the chambers he was everywhere at once and neither his family nor anybody else discovered where his thoughts were adeline quite amazed to hear that her uncle was rescued and to see a handsome sum figure in the marriage contract was not altogether easy in spite of her joy at seeing her daughter married under such creditable circumstances but on the day before the wedding fixed by the baron to coincide with madame marneffe's removal to her new apartment hector allayed his wife's astonishment by this ministerial communication now adeline our girl is married all our anxieties on the subject are at an end the time is come for us to retire from the world i shall not remain in office more than three years longer only the time necessary to secure my pension why henceforth should we be at any unnecessary expense our apartment costs us six thousand francs a year in rent we have four servants we eat thirty thousand francs worth of food in a year if you want me to pay off my bills for i have pledged my salary for the sums i needed to give hortense her little money and pay off your uncle you did very right said she interrupting her husband and kissing his hands this explanation relieved adeline of all her fears i shall have to ask some little sacrifices of you he went on disengaging his hands and kissing his wife's brow i have found in the rue plumet a very good flat on the first floor handsome splendidly panelled at only fifteen hundred francs a year where you would need only one woman to wait on you and i could be quite content with a boy yes my dear if we keep house in a quiet way keeping up a proper appearance of course we should not spend more than six thousand francs a year excepting my private account which i will provide for the generous-hearted woman threw her arms round her husband's neck in her joy how happy i shall be beginning again to show you how truly i love you she exclaimed and what a capital manager you are we will have the children to dine with us once a week i as you know rarely dine at home you can very well dine twice a week with victorin and twice a week with hortense and as i believe i may succeed in making matters up completely between crevel and us we can dine once a week with him these five dinners and our own at home will fill up the week all but one day supposing that we may occasionally be invited to dine elsewhere i shall save a great deal for you said adeline oh he cried you are the pearl of women my kind divine hector i shall bless you with my latest breath said she for you have done well for my dear hortense this was the beginning of the end of the beautiful madame hulot's home and it may be added of her being totally neglected as hulot had solemnly promised madame marneffe crevel the important and burly being invited as a matter of course to the party given for the signing of the marriage contract 
behaved as though the scene with which this drama opened had never taken place as though he had no grievance against the baron celestin crevel was quite amiable he was perhaps rather too much the ex-perfumer but as a major he was beginning to acquire majestic dignity he talked of dancing at the wedding fair lady said he politely to the baroness people like us know how to forget do not banish me from your home honor me pray by gracing my house with your presence now and then to meet your children be quite easy i will never say anything of what lies buried at the bottom of my heart i behaved indeed like an idiot for i should lose too much by cutting myself off from seeing you monsieur an honest woman has no ears for such speeches as those you refer to if you keep your word you need not doubt that it will give me pleasure to see an end of a coolness which must always be painful in a family well you sulky old fellow said hulot dragging crevel out into the garden you avoid me everywhere even in my own house are two admirers of the fair sex to quarrel for ever over a petticoat come this is really too plebeian i monsieur am not such a fine man as you are and my small attractions hinder me from repairing my losses so easily as you can sarcastic said the baron irony is allowable from the vanquished to the conqueror the conversation begun in this strain ended in a complete reconciliation still crevel maintained his right to take his revenge madame marneffe particularly wished to be invited to mademoiselle hulot's wedding to enable him to receive his future mistress in his drawing-room the great official was obliged to invite all the clerks of his division down to the deputy head clerks inclusive thus a grand ball was a necessity the baroness as a prudent housewife calculated that an evening party would cost less than a dinner and allow of a larger number of invitations so hortense's wedding was much talked about marshal prince wissembourg and the baron de nucingen signed in behalf of the bride the comte de rastignac and popinot in behalf of steinbach then as the highest nobility among the polish emigrants had been civil to count steinbach since he had become famous the artist thought himself bound to invite them the state council and the war office to which the baron belonged and the army anxious to do honor to the comte de Fortsheim, were all represented by their magnates there were nearly two hundred indispensable invitations how natural then that little madame marneffe was bent on figuring in all her glory amid such an assembly the baroness had a month since sold her diamonds to set up her daughter's house while keeping the finest for the trousseau the sale realized fifteen thousand francs of which five thousand were sunk in hortense's clothes and what was ten thousand francs for the furniture of the young folks apartment considering the demands of modern luxury however young monsieur and madame hulot old crevel and the comte de Fortsheim made very handsome presents for the old soldier had set aside a sum for the purchase of plate thanks to these contributions even an exacting parisian would have been pleased with the rooms the young couple had taken in the rue saint dominique near the invalide everything seemed in harmony with their love pure honest and sincere at last the great day dawned for it was to be a great day not only for wenceslas and hortense but for old hulot too madame marneffe was to give a housewarming in her new apartment the day after becoming hulot's mistress en titre and after the marriage of the lovers who but has once in his life been a guest at a wedding ball every reader can refer to his reminiscences and will probably smile as he calls up the images of all that company in their sunday best faces as well as their finest frippery if any social event can prove the influence of environment is it not this in fact the sunday best mood of some reacts so effectually on the rest that the men who are most accustomed to wearing full dress look just like those to whom the party is a high festival unique in their life 
and think too of the serious old men to whom such things are so completely a matter of indifference that they are wearing their everyday black coats the long married men whose faces betray their sad experience of the life the young pair are but just entering on and the lighter elements present as carbonic acid gas is in champagne and the envious girls the women absorbed in wondering if their dress is a success the poor relations whose parsimonious get-up contrasts with that of the officials in uniform and the greedy ones thinking only of the supper and the gamblers thinking only of cards there are some of every sort rich and poor envious and envied philosophers and dreamers all grouped like the plants in a flower-bed round the rare choice blossom the bride a wedding ball is an epitome of the world at the liveliest moment of the evening crevel led the baron aside and said in a whisper with the most natural manner possible by jove that's a pretty woman the little lady in pink who has opened a racking fire on you from her eyes which the wife of that clerk you are promoting heaven knows how madame marneffe what do you know about it listen hulot i will try to forgive you the ill you have done me if only you will introduce me to her i will take you to eloise everybody is asking who is that charming creature are you sure that it will strike no one how and why her husband's appointment got itself signed you happy rascal she is worth a whole office i would serve in her office only too gladly come sinna let us be friends better friends than ever said the baron to the perfumer and i promise you i will be a good fellow within a month you shall dine with that little angel for it is an angel this time old boy and i advise you like me to have done with the devils cousin betty who had moved to the rue vanneau into a nice little apartment on the third floor left the ball at ten o'clock but came back to see with her own eyes the two bonds bearing twelve hundred francs interest one of them was the property of the countess steinbach the other was in the name of madame hulot it was thus intelligible that m crevel should have spoken to hulot about madame marneffe as knowing what was a secret to the rest of the world for as m marneffe was away no one but lisbeth fischer besides the baron and valerie was initiated into the mystery the baron had made a blunder in giving madame marneffe a dress far too magnificent for the wife of a subordinate official other women were jealous alike of her beauty and of her gown there was much whispering behind fans for the poverty of the marneffes was known to every one in the office the husband had been petitioning for help at the very moment when the baron had been so smitten with madame also hector could not conceal his exultation at seeing valerie's success and she severely proper very ladylike and greatly envied was the object of that strict examination which women so greatly fear when they appear for the first time in a new circle of society after seeing his wife into a carriage with his daughter and his son-in-law hulot managed to escape unperceived leaving his son and celestine to do the honors of the house he got into madame marneffe's carriage to see her home but he found her silent and pensive almost melancholy my happiness makes you very sad valerie said he putting his arm round her and drawing her to him can you wonder my dear said she that a hapless woman should be a little depressed at the thought of her first fall from virtue even when her husband's atrocities have set her free do you suppose that i have no soul no beliefs no religion your glee this evening has been really too barefaced you have paraded me odiously really a schoolboy would have been less of a coxcomb and the ladies have dissected me with their side glances and their satirical remarks every woman has some care for her reputation and you have wrecked mine oh i am yours and no mistake and i have not an excuse left but that of being faithful to you monster that you are 
she added laughing and allowing him to kiss her you knew very well what you were doing madame coquet our chief clerk's wife came to sit down by me and admired my lace english point said she was it very expensive madame i do not know this lace was my mother's i am not rich enough to buy the like said i madame marneffe in short had so bewitched the old beau that he really believed she was sinning for the first time for his sake and that he had inspired such a passion as had led her to this breach of duty she told him that the wretch marneffe had neglected her after they had been three days married and for the most odious reasons since then she had lived as innocently as a girl marriage had seemed to her so horrible this was the cause of her present melancholy if love should prove to be like marriage said she in tears these insinuating lies with which almost every woman in valerie's predicament is ready gave the baron distant visions of the roses of the seventh heaven and so valerie coquetted with her lover while the artist and hortense were impatiently awaiting the moment when the baroness should have given the girl her last kiss and blessing at seven in the morning the baron perfectly happy for his valerie was at once the most guileless of girls and the most consummate of demons went back to release his son and celestine from their duties all the dancers for the most part strangers had taken possession of the territory as they do at every wedding ball and were keeping up the endless figures of the cotillions while the gamblers were still crowding round the bouillotte tables and old crevel had won six thousand francs the morning papers carried round the town contained this paragraph in the paris article the marriage was celebrated this morning at the church of saint thomas d'aquin between monsieur le comte steinbach and mademoiselle hortense hulot daughter of baron hulot d'ervy councillor of state and a director at the war office niece of the famous general comte de Fortsheim. the ceremony attracted a large gathering there were present some of the most distinguished artists of the day leon de lora joseph bridau stidman and bichu the magnates of the war office of the council of state and many members of the two chambers also the most distinguished of the polish exiles living in paris counts paz laginski and others monsieur le comte wenceslas steinbach is grand-nephew to the famous general who served under charles the twelfth king of sweden the young count having taken part in the polish rebellion found a refuge in france where his well-earned fame as a sculptor has procured him a patent of naturalization and so in spite of the baron's cruel lack of money nothing was lacking that public opinion could require not even the trumpeting of the newspapers over his daughter's marriage which was solemnized in the same way in every particular as his son's had been to mademoiselle crevel this display moderated the reports current as to the baron's financial position while the fortune assigned to his daughter explained the need for having borrowed money here ends what is in a way the introduction to this story it is to the drama that follows what the premise is to a syllogism what the prologue is to a classical tragedy End of chapter 14in paris when a woman determines to make a business a trade of her beauty it does not follow that she will make a fortune lovely creatures may be found there and full of wit who are in wretched circumstances ending in misery a life begun in pleasure and this is why it is not enough merely to accept the shameful life of a courtesan with a view to earning its profits and at the same time to bear the simple garb of a respectable middle-class wife vice does not triumph so easily it resembles genius in so far that they both need a concurrence of favorable conditions to develop the coalition of fortune and gifts eliminate the strange prologue of the revolution and the emperor would never have existed he would have been no more than a second edition of faber 
venal beauty if it finds no amateurs no celebrity no cross of dishonor earned by squandering men's fortunes is correggio in a hayloft is genius starving in a garret lais in paris must first and foremost find a rich man mad enough to pay her price she must keep up a very elegant style for this is her shop sign she must be sufficiently well-bred to flatter the vanity of her lovers she must have the brilliant wit of a sophie arnould which diverts the apathy of rich men finally she must arouse the passions of libertines by appearing to be mistress to one man only who is envied by the rest these conditions which a woman of that class calls being in luck are difficult to combine in paris although it is a city of millionaires of idlers of used-up and capricious men providence has no doubt vouchsafed protection to clerks and middle-class citizens for whom obstacles of this kind are at least double in the sphere in which they move at the same time there are enough madame marneffes in paris to allow of our taking valerie to figure as a type in this picture of manners some of these women yield to the double pressure of a genuine passion and of hard necessity like madame colville who was for long attached to one of the famous orators of the left keller the banker others are spurred by vanity like madame de la baudray who remained almost respectable in spite of her elopement with lousteau some again are led astray by the love of fine clothes and some by the impossibility of keeping a house going on obviously too narrow means the stinginess of the state or of parliament leads to many disasters and to much corruption at the present moment the laboring classes are the fashionable object of compassion they are being murdered it is said by the manufacturing capitalist but the government is a hundred times harder than the meanest tradesman it carries its economy in the article of salaries to absolute folly if you work harder the merchant will pay you more in proportion but what does the state do for its crowd of obscure and devoted toilers in a married woman it is an inexcusable crime when she wanders from the path of honor still there are degrees even in such a case some women far from being depraved conceal their fall and remain to all appearances quite respectable like those two just referred to while others add to their fault the disgrace of speculation thus madame marneffe is as it were the type of those ambitious married courtesans who from the first accept depravity with all its consequences and determined to make a fortune while taking their pleasure perfectly unscrupulous as to the means but almost always a woman like madame marneffe has a husband who is her confederate and accomplice these machiavellis in petticoats are the most dangerous of the sisterhood of every evil class of parisian woman they are the worst a mere courtesan a josepha a malaga a madame chance a jenny cadine carries in her frank dishonor a warning signal as conspicuous as the red lamp of a house of ill fame or the flaring lights of a gambling hell a man knows that they light him to his ruin but mealy-mouthed propriety the semblance of virtue the hypocritical ways of a married woman who never allows anything to be seen but the vulgar needs of the household and affects to refuse every kind of extravagance leads to silent ruin dumb disaster which is all the more startling because though condoned it remains unaccounted for it is the ignoble bill of daily expenses and not gay dissipation that devours the largest fortune the father of a family ruins himself ingloriously and the great consolation of gratified vanity is wanting in his misery this little sermon will go like a javelin to the heart of many a home madame marneffes are to be seen in every sphere of social life even at court for valerie is a melancholy fact modelled from the life in the smallest details and alas the portrait will not cure any man of the folly of loving these sweetly smiling angels with pensive looks and candid faces 
whose heart is a cash-box about three years after hortense's marriage in eighteen forty one baron hulot d'ervy was supposed to have sown his wild oats to have put up his horses to quote the expression used by louis the fifteenth's head surgeon and yet madame marneffe was costing him twice as much as josepha had ever cost him still valerie though always nicely dressed affected the simplicity of a subordinate official's wife she kept her luxury for her dressing-gowns her home wear she thus sacrificed her parisian vanity to her dear hector at the theatre however she always appeared in a pretty bonnet and a dress of extreme elegance and the baron took her in a carriage to a private box her rooms the whole of the second floor of a modern house in the rue vanneau between a forecourt and a garden was redolent of respectability all its luxury was in good chintz hangings and handsome convenient furniture her bedroom indeed was the exception and rich with such profusion as jenny cadine or madame chance might have displayed there were lace curtains cashmere hangings brocade portieres a set of chimney ornaments modelled by stidman a glass cabinet filled with dainty knick-knacks hulot could not bear to see his valerie in a bower of inferior magnificence to the dunghill of gold and pearls owned by a josepha the drawing-room was furnished with red damask and the dining-room had carved oak panels but the baron carried away by his wish to have everything in keeping had at the end of six months added solid luxury to mere fashion and had given her handsome portable property as for instance a service of plate that was to cost more than twenty-four thousand francs madame marneffe's house had in a couple of years achieved a reputation for being a very pleasant one gambling went on there valerie herself was soon spoken of as an agreeable and witty woman to account for her change of style a rumour was set going of an immense legacy bequeathed to her by her natural father marshal montcornet and left in trust with an eye to the future valerie had added religious to social hypocrisy punctual at the sunday services she enjoyed all the honours due to the pious she carried the bag for the offertory she was a member of a charitable association presented bread for the sacrament and did some good among the poor all at hector's expense thus everything about the house was extremely seemly and a great many persons maintained that her friendship with the baron was entirely innocent supporting the view by the gentleman's mature age and ascribing to him a platonic liking for madame marneffe's pleasant wit charming manners and conversation such a liking as that of the late lamented louis the eighteenth for a well-turned note the baron always withdrew with the other company at about midnight and came back a quarter of an hour later the secret of this secrecy was as follows the lodge keepers of the house were a monsieur and madame olivier who under the baron's patronage had been promoted from their humble and not very lucrative post in the rue du doyenne to the highly paid and handsome one in the rue vanneau now madame olivier formerly a needlewoman in the household of charles x who had fallen in the world with the legitimate branch had three children the eldest an underclerk in a notary's office was object of his parents adoration this benjamin for six years in danger of being drawn for the army was on the point of being interrupted in his legal career when madame marneffe contrived to have him declared exempt for one of those little malformations which the examining board can always discern when requested in a whisper by some power in the ministry so olivier formerly a huntsman to the king and his wife would have crucified the lord again for the baron or for madame marneffe what could the world have to say it knew nothing of the former episode of the brazilian monsieur montes de montejanos it could say nothing besides the world is very indulgent to the mistress of a house where amusement is to be found 
and then to all her charms valerie added the highly prized advantage of being an occult power claude vignon now secretary to marshal the prince de wissembourg and dreaming of promotion to the council of state as a master of appeals was constantly seen in her rooms to which came also some deputies good fellows and gamblers madame marneffe had got her circle together with prudent deliberation only men whose opinions and habits agreed foregathered there men whose interest it was to hold together and to proclaim the many merits of the lady of the house scandal is the true holy alliance in paris take that as an axiom interests invariably fall asunder in the end vicious natures can always agree within three months of settling in the rue vanneau madame marneffe had entertained monsieur crevel who by that time was mayor of his arrondissement and officer of the legion of honor crevel had hesitated he would have to give up the famous uniform of the national guard in which he strutted at the tuileries believing himself quite as much a soldier as the emperor himself but ambition urged by madame marneffe had proved stronger than vanity then monsieur le maire had considered his connection with mademoiselle heloise brise too as quite incompatible with his political position indeed long before his accession to the civic chair of the mayoralty his gallant intimacies had been wrapped in the deepest mystery but as the reader may have guessed crevel had soon purchased the right of taking his revenge as often as circumstances allowed for having been bereft of josepha at the cost of a bond bearing six thousand francs of interest in the name of valerie fortin wife of sieur marneffe for her sole and separate use valerie inheriting perhaps from her mother the special acumen of the kept woman read the character of her grotesque adorer at a glance the phrase i never had a lady for a mistress spoken by crevel to lisbeth and repeated by lisbeth to her dear valerie had been handsomely discounted in the bargain by which she got her six thousand francs a year in five per cents and since then she had never allowed her prestige to grow less in the eyes of cesar birotteau's erewhile bagman crevel himself had married for money the daughter of a miller of la brie an only child indeed whose inheritance constituted three-quarters of his fortune for when retail dealers grow rich it is generally not so much by trade as through some alliance between the shop and rural thrift a large proportion of the farmers corn factors dairy keepers and market gardeners in the neighborhood of paris dream of the glories of the desk for their daughters and look upon a shopkeeper a jeweller or a money-changer as a son-in-law after their own heart in preference to a notary or an attorney whose superior social position is a ground of suspicion they are afraid of being scorned in the future by these citizen bigwigs madame crevel ugly vulgar and silly had given her husband no pleasures but those of paternity she died young her libertine husband fettered at the beginning of his commercial career by the necessity for working and held in thrall by want of money had led the life of tantalus thrown in as he phrased it with the most elegant women in paris he let them out of the shop with servile homage while admiring their grace their way of wearing the fashions and all the nameless charms of what is called breeding to rise to the level of one of these fairies of the drawing-room was a desire formed in his youth but buried in the depths of his heart thus to win the favors of madame marneffe was to him not merely the realization of his chimera but as has been shown a point of pride of vanity of self-satisfaction his ambition grew with success his brain was turned with elation and when the mind is captivated the heart feels more keenly every gratification is doubled also it must be said that madame marneffe offered to crevel a refinement of pleasure of which he had no idea neither josepha nor heloise had loved him 
and madame marneffe thought it necessary to deceive him thoroughly for this man she saw would prove an inexhaustible till the deceptions of a venal passion are more delightful than the real thing true love is mixed up with bird-like squabbles in which the disputants wound each other to the quick but a quarrel without animus is on the contrary a piece of flattery to the dupe's conceit the rare interviews granted to crevel kept his passion at a white heat he was constantly blocked by valerie's virtuous severity she acted remorse and wondered what her father must be thinking of her in the paradise of the brave again and again he had to contend with a sort of coldness which the cunning slut made him believe he had overcome by seeming to surrender to the man's crazy passion and then as if ashamed she entrenched herself once more in her pride of respectability and airs of virtue just like an englishwoman neither more nor less and she always crushed her crevel under the weight of her dignity for crevel had in the first instance swallowed her pretensions to virtue in short valerie had special veins of affections which made her equally indispensable to crevel and to the baron before the world she displayed the attractive combination of modest and pensive innocence of irreproachable propriety with a bright humour enhanced by the suppleness the grace and softness of the creole but in a tete-a-tete -tete, she would outdo any courtesan she was audacious amusing and full of original inventiveness such a contrast is irresistible to a man of the crevel type he is flattered by believing himself sole author of the comedy thinking it is performed for his benefit alone and he laughs at the exquisite hypocrisy while admiring the hypocrite valerie had taken entire possession of baron hulot she had persuaded him to grow old by one of those subtle touches of flattery which reveal the diabolical wit of women like her in all evergreen constitutions a moment arrives when the truth suddenly comes out as in a besieged town which puts a good face on affairs as long as possible valerie foreseeing the approaching collapse of the old bow of the empire determined to forestall it why give yourself so much bother my dear old veteran said she one day six months after their doubly adulterous union do you want to be flirting to be unfaithful to me i assure you i should like you better without your make-up oblige me by giving up all your artificial charms do you suppose that it is for two sous worth of polish on your boots that i love you for your india-rubber belt your straight waistcoat and your false hair and then the older you look the less need i fear seeing my hulot carried off by a rival and hulot trusting to madame marneffe's heavenly friendship as much as to her love intending too to end his days with her had taken this confidential hint and ceased to dye his whiskers and hair after this touching declaration from his valerie handsome hector made his appearance one morning perfectly white madame marneffe could assure him that she had a hundred times detected the white line of the growth of the hair and white hair suits your face to perfection said she it softens it you look a thousand times better quite charming the baron once started on this path of reform gave up his leather waistcoat and stays he threw off all his bracing his stomach fell and increased in size the oak became a tower and the heaviness of his movements was all the more alarming because the baron grew immensely older by playing the part of louis the twelfth his eyebrows were still black and left a ghostly reminiscence of handsome hulot as sometimes on the wall of some feudal building a faint trace of sculpture remains to show what the castle was in the days of its glory this discordant detail made his eyes still bright and youthful all the more remarkable in his tanned face because it had so long been ruddy with the florid hues of a rubens and now a certain discoloration and the deep tension of the wrinkles betrayed the efforts of a passion at odds with natural decay 
Hulot was now one of those stalwart ruins in which virile force asserts itself by tufts of hair in the ears and nostrils and on the fingers, as moss grows on the almost eternal monuments of the Roman Empire. How had Valerie contrived to keep Crevel and Hulot side by side, each tied to an apron string, when the vindictive mayor only longed to triumph openly over Hulot? Without immediately giving an answer to this question, which the course of the story will supply, it may be said that Lisbeth and Valérie had contrived a powerful piece of machinery which tended to this result. Marneffe, as he saw his wife improved in beauty by the setting in which she was enthroned, like the sun at the centre of the sidereal system, appeared, in the eyes of the world, to have fallen in love with her again himself. He was quite crazy about her now though his jealousy made him somewhat of a marplot it gave enhanced value to valerie's favours marneffe meanwhile showed a blind confidence in his chief which degenerated into ridiculous complaisance the only person whom he really would not stand was crevel marneffe wrecked by the debauchery of great cities described by roman authors though modern decency has no name for it was as hideous as an anatomical figure in wax but this disease on feet clothed in good broadcloth encased his lath-like legs in elegant trousers the hollow chest was scented with fine linen and musk disguised the odours of rotten humanity this hideous specimen of decaying vice trotting in red heels for valerie dressed the man as beseemed his income his cross and his appointment horrified crevel who could not meet the colourless eyes of the government clerk marneffe was an incubus to the mayor and the mean rascal aware of the strange power conferred on him by lisbeth and his wife was amused by it he played on it as on an instrument and cards being the last resource of a mind as completely played out as the body he plucked crevel again and again the mayor thinking himself bound to subserviency to the worthy official whom he was cheating seeing crevel a mere child in the hands of that hideous and atrocious mummy of whose utter vileness the mayor knew nothing and seeing him yet more an object of deep contempt to valerie who made game of crevel as of some mountebank the baron apparently thought him so impossible as a rival that he constantly invited him to dinner valerie protected by two lovers on guard and by a jealous husband attracted every eye and excited every desire in the circle she shone upon and thus while keeping up appearances she had in the course of three years achieved the most difficult conditions of the success a courtesan most cares for and most rarely attains even with the help of audacity and the glitter of an existence in the light of the sun valerie's beauty formerly buried in the mud of the rue de doyenne now like a well-cut diamond exquisitely set by chanor was worth more than its real value it could break hearts claude vignon adored valerie in secret this retrospective explanation quite necessary after the lapse of three years shows valerie's balance sheet now for that of her partner, Lisbeth. End of chapter 15chapter 16 of cousin betty by honore de balzac translated by james waring this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by bruce peary chapter 16 Lisbeth Fisher filled the place in the Marneffe household of a relation who combines the functions of a lady companion and a housekeeper, but she suffered from none of the humiliations which, for the most part, weigh upon the women who are so unhappy as to be obliged to fill these ambiguous situations. Lisbeth and Valerie offered the touching spectacle of one of those friendships between women, so cordial and so improbable, that men, always too keen-tongued in Paris, forthwith slander them 
the contrast between lisbeth's dry masculine nature and valerie's creole prettiness encouraged calumny and madame marneffe had unconsciously given weight to the scandal by the care she took of her friend with matrimonial views which were as will be seen to complete lisbeth's revenge an immense change had taken place in cousin betty and valerie who wanted to smarten her had turned it to the best account the strange woman had submitted to stays and laced tightly she used bandoline to keep her hair smooth wore her gowns as the dressmaker sent them home neat little boots and gray silk stockings all of which were included in valerie's bills and paid for by the gentleman in possession thus furbished up and wearing the yellow cashmere shawl lisbeth would have been unrecognizable by any one who had not seen her for three years this other diamond a black diamond the rarest of all cut by a skilled hand and set as best became her was appreciated at her full value by certain ambitious clerks any one seeing her for the first time might have shuddered involuntarily at the look of poetic wildness which the clever valerie had succeeded in bringing out by the arts of dress in this bleeding nun framing the ascetic olive face in thick bands of hair as black as the fiery eyes and making the most of the rigid slim figure lisbeth like a virgin by cranach or van eyck or a byzantine madonna stepped out of its frame had all the stiffness the precision of those mysterious figures the more modern cousins of isis and her sister goddesses sheathed in marble folds by egyptian sculptors it was granite basalt porphyry with life and movement saved from want for the rest of her life lisbeth was most amiable wherever she dined she brought merriment and the baron paid the rent of her little apartment furnished as we know with the leavings of her friend valerie's former boudoir and bedroom i began she would say as a hungry nanny goat and i am ending as a lion she still worked for m rivet at the more elaborate kinds of gold trimming merely as she said not to lose her time at the same time she was as we shall see very full of business but it is inherent in the nature of country folks never to give up bread-winning in this they are like the jews every morning very early cousin betty went off to market with the cook it was part of lisbeth's scheme that the house book which was ruining baron hulot was to enrich her dear valerie as it did indeed is there a housewife who since eighteen thirty eight has not suffered from the evil effects of socialist doctrines diffused among the lower classes by incendiary writers in every household the plague of servants is nowadays the worst of financial afflictions with very few exceptions who ought to be rewarded with the montillon prize the cook male or female is a domestic robber a thief taking wages and perfectly barefaced with the government for a fence developing the tendency to dishonesty which is almost authorized in the cook by the time-honored jest as to the handle of the basket the women who formerly picked up their forty sous to buy a lottery ticket now take fifty francs to put into the savings bank and the smug puritans who amuse themselves in france with philanthropic experiments fancy that they are making the common people moral between the market and the master's table the servants have their secret toll and the municipality of paris is less sharp in collecting the city dues than the servants are in taking theirs on every single thing to say nothing of fifty per cent charged on every form of food they demand large new year's premiums from the tradesmen the best class of dealers tremble before this occult power and subsidize it without a word coachmakers jewelers tailors and all if any attempt is made to interfere with them the servants reply with impudent retorts or revenge themselves by the costly blunders of assumed clumsiness and in these days they inquire into their master's character as formerly the master inquired into theirs this mischief is now really at its height 
and the law courts are beginning to take cognizance of it but in vain for it cannot be remedied but by a law which shall compel domestic servants like laborers to have a pass-book as a guarantee of conduct then the evil will vanish as if by magic if every servant were obliged to show his pass-book and if masters were required to state in it the cause of his dismissal this would certainly prove a powerful check to the evil the men who are giving their attentions to the politics of the day know not to what lengths the depravity of the lower classes has gone statistics are silent as to the startling number of working men of twenty who marry cooks of between forty and fifty enriched by robbery we shudder to think of the result of such unions from the three points of view of increasing crime degeneracy of the race and miserable households as to the mere financial mischief that results from domestic peculation that too is immense from a political point of view life being made to cost double any superfluity becomes impossible in most households now superfluity means half the trade of the world as it is half the elegance of life books and flowers are to many persons as necessary as bread lisbeth well aware of this dreadful scourge of parisian households determined to manage valerie's promising her every assistance in the terrible scene when the two women had sworn to be like sisters so she had brought from the depths of the vosges a humble relation on her mother's side a very pious and honest soul who had been cook to the bishop of nancy fearing however her inexperience of paris ways and yet more the evil counsel which wrecks such fragile virtue at first lisbeth always went to market with maturine and tried to teach her what to buy to know the real prices of things and command the salesman's respect to purchase unnecessary delicacies such as fish only when they were cheap to be well informed as to the price current of groceries and provisions so as to buy when prices are low in anticipation of a rise all this housekeeping skill is in paris essential to domestic economy as maturine got good wages and many presents she liked the house well enough to be glad to drive good bargains and by this time lisbeth had made her quite a match for herself sufficiently experienced and trustworthy to be sent to market alone unless valerie was giving a dinner which in fact was not unfrequently the case and this was how it came about the baron had at first observed the strictest decorum but his passion for madame marneffe had ere long become so vehement so greedy that he would never quit her if he could help it at first he dined there four times a week then he thought it delightful to dine with her every day six months after his daughter's marriage he was paying her two thousand francs a month for his board madame marneffe invited any one her dear baron wished to entertain the dinner was always arranged for six he could bring in three unexpected guests lisbeth's economy enabled her to solve the extraordinary problem of keeping up the table in the best style for a thousand francs a month giving the other thousand to madame marneffe valerie's dress being chiefly paid for by crevel and the baron the two women saved another thousand francs a month on this and so this pure and innocent being had already accumulated a hundred and fifty thousand francs in savings she had capitalized her income and monthly bonus and swelled the amount by enormous interest due to crevel's liberality in allowing his little duchess to invest her money in partnership with him in his financial operations crevel had taught valerie the slang and the procedure of the money market and like every parisian woman she had soon outstripped her master lisbeth who never spent a sou of her twelve hundred francs whose rent and dress were given to her and who never put her hand in her pocket had likewise a small capital of five or six thousand francs of which crevel took fatherly care at the same time two such lovers were a heavy burthen on valerie 
on the day when this drama reopens valerie spurred by one of those incidents which have the effect in life that the ringing of a bell has in inducing a swarm of bees to settle went up to lisbeth's rooms to give vent to one of those comforting lamentations a sort of cigarette blown off from the tongue by which women alleviate the minor miseries of life oh lisbeth my love two hours of crevel this morning it is crushing how i wish i could send you in my place that unluckily is impossible said lisbeth smiling i shall die a maid two old men lovers really i am ashamed sometimes if my poor mother could see me you are mistaking me for crevel said lisbeth tell me my little betty do you not despise me oh if i had but been pretty what adventures i would have had cried lisbeth that is your justification but you would have acted only at the dictates of your heart said madame marneffe with a sigh pooh marneffe is a dead man they have forgotten to bury replied lisbeth the baron is as good as your husband crevel is your adorer it seems to me that you are quite in order like every other married woman no it is not that dear adorable thing that is not where the shoe pinches you do not choose to understand yes i do said lisbeth the unexpressed factor is part of my revenge what can i do i am working it out i love wenceslas so that i am positively growing thin and i can never see him said valerie throwing up her arms hulot asks him to dinner and my artist declines he does not know that i idolize him the wretch what is his wife after all fine flesh yes she is handsome but i i know myself i am worse be quite easy my child he will come said lisbeth in the tone of a nurse to an impatient child he shall but when this week perhaps give me a kiss as may be seen these two women were but one everything valerie did even her most reckless actions her pleasures her little sulks were decided on after serious deliberation between them lisbeth strangely excited by this harlot existence advised valerie on every step and pursued her course of revenge with pitiless logic she really adored valerie she had taken her to be her child her friend her love she found her docile as creoles are yielding from voluptuous indolence she chattered with her morning after morning with more pleasure than with wenceslas they could laugh together over the mischief they plotted and over the folly of men and count up the swelling interest on their respective savings indeed in this new enterprise and new affection lisbeth had found food for her activity that was far more satisfying than her insane passion for wenceslas the joys of gratified hatred are the fiercest and strongest the heart can know love is the gold hatred the iron of the mine of feeling that lies buried in us and then valerie was to lisbeth beauty in all its glory the beauty she worshipped as we worship what we have not beauty far more plastic to her hand than that of wenceslas who had always been cold to her and distant at the end of nearly three years lisbeth was beginning to perceive the progress of the underground mine on which she was expending her life and concentrating her mind lisbeth planned madame marneffe acted madame marneffe was the axe lisbeth was the hand that wielded it and that hand was rapidly demolishing the family which was every day more odious to her for we can hate more and more just as when we love we love better every day love and hatred are feelings that feed on themselves but of the two hatred has the longer vitality love is restricted within limits of power it derives its energies from life and from lavishness hatred is like death like avarice it is so to speak an active abstraction above beings and things 
lisbeth embarked on the existence that was natural to her expended in it all her faculties governing like the jesuits by occult influences the regeneration of her person was equally complete her face was radiant lisbeth dreamed of becoming madame la marechale hulot this little scene in which the two friends had bluntly uttered their ideas without any circumlocution in expressing them took place immediately on lisbeth's return from market whither she had been to procure the materials for an elegant dinner marneffe who hoped to get coquet's place was to entertain him and the virtuous madame coquet and valerie hoped to persuade hulot that very evening to consider the head clerk's resignation lisbeth dressed to go to the baroness with whom she was to dine you will come back in time to make tea for us my betty said valerie i hope so you hope so why have you come to sleeping with adeline to drink her tears while she is asleep if only i could said lisbeth laughing i would not refuse she is expiating her happiness and i am glad for i remember our young days it is my turn now she will be in the mire and i shall be comtesse de fortsheim end of chapter sixteen Chapter Seventeen of Cousin Betty by Honoré de Balzac, translated by James Waring. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Chapter Seventeen. Lisbeth set out for the Rue Plumet, where she now went as to the theatre to indulge her emotions. The residence Hulot had found for his wife consisted of a large bare entrance room, a drawing room, and a bed and dressing room. The dining-room was next the drawing-room on one side. Two servants' rooms and a kitchen on the third floor completed the accommodation, which was not unworthy of a councillor of state high up in the war office. The house, the courtyard, and the stairs were extremely handsome. The baroness, who had to furnish her drawing-room, bedroom, and dining-room with the relics of her splendor, had brought away the best of the remains from the house in the Rue de l'Université indeed the poor woman was attached to these mute witnesses of her happier life to her they had an almost consoling eloquence in memory she saw her flowers as in the carpets she could trace patterns hardly visible now to other eyes on going into the spacious anteroom where twelve chairs a barometer a large stove and long white cotton curtains bordered with red suggested the dreadful waiting-room of a government office the visitor felt oppressed conscious at once of the isolation in which the mistress lived grief like pleasure infects the atmosphere a first glance into any home is enough to tell you whether love or despair reigns there adeline would be found sitting in an immense bedroom with beautiful furniture by jacob de maltaire of mahogany finished in the empire style with ormolu which looks even less inviting than the brasswork of louis the sixteenth it gave one a shiver to see this lonely woman sitting on a roman chair a work-table with sphinxes before her colourless affecting false cheerfulness but preserving her imperial air as she had preserved the blue velvet gown she always wore in the house her proud spirit sustained her strength and preserved her beauty the baroness by the end of her first year of banishment to this apartment had gauged every depth of misfortune still even here my hector has made my life much handsomer than it should be for a mere peasant said she to herself he chooses that it should be so his will be done i am baroness hulot the sister-in-law of a marshal of france i have done nothing wrong my two children are settled in life i can wait for death wrapped in the spotless veil of an immaculate wife and the crape of departed happiness a portrait of hulot in the uniform of a commissary general of the imperial guard painted in eighteen ten by robert lefebvre hung above the work-table and when visitors were announced adeline threw into a drawer an imitation of jesus christ her habitual study this blameless magdalen thus heard the voice of the spirit in her desert mariette my child said lisbeth to the woman who opened the door how is my dear adeline to-day 
oh she looks pretty well mademoiselle but between you and me if she goes on in this way she will kill herself said mariette in a whisper you really ought to persuade her to live better now yesterday madame told me to give her two sous worth of milk and a roll for one sou to get her a herring for dinner and a bit of cold veal she had a pound cooked to last her the week of course for the days when she dines at home and alone she will not spend more than ten sous a day for her food it is unreasonable if i were to say anything about it to monsieur le marechal he might quarrel with monsieur le baron and leave him nothing whereas you who are so kind and clever can manage things but why do you not apply to my cousin the baron said lisbeth oh dear mademoiselle he has not been here for three weeks or more in fact not since we last had the pleasure of seeing you besides madame has forbidden me under threat of dismissal ever to ask the master for money but as for grief oh poor lady she has been very unhappy it is the first time that monsieur has neglected her for so long every time the bell rang she rushed to the window but for the last five days she has sat still in her chair she reads whenever she goes out to see madame la comtesse she says mariette if monsieur comes in says she tell him i am at home and send the porter to fetch me he shall be well paid for his trouble poor soul said lisbeth it goes to my heart i speak of her to the baron every day what can i do yes says he betty you are right i am a wretch my wife is an angel and i am a monster i will go to-morrow and he stays with madame marneffe that woman is ruining him and he worships her he lives only in her sight i do what i can if i were not there and if i had not maturine to depend upon he would spend twice as much as he does and as he has hardly any money in the world he would have blown his brains out by this time and i tell you mariette adeline would die of her husband's death i am perfectly certain at any rate i pull to make both ends meet and prevent my cousin from throwing too much money into the fire yes that is what madame says poor soul she knows how much she owes you replied mariette she said she had judged you unjustly for many years indeed said lisbeth and did she say anything else no mademoiselle if you wish to please her talk to her about monsieur le baron she envies you your happiness in seeing him every day is she alone i beg pardon no the marshal is with her he comes every day and she always tells him she saw monsieur in the morning but that he comes in very late at night and is there a good dinner to-day mariette hesitated she could not meet lisbeth's eye the drawing-room door opened and marshal hulot rushed out in such haste that he bowed to lisbeth without looking at her and dropped a paper lisbeth picked it up and ran after him downstairs for it was vain to hail a deaf man but she managed not to overtake the marshal and as she came up again she furtively read the following lines written in pencil my dear brother my husband has given me the money for my quarter's expenses but my daughter hortense was in such need of it that i lent her the whole sum which was scarcely enough to set her straight could you lend me a few hundred francs for i cannot ask hector for more if he were to blame me i could not bear it my word thought lisbeth she must be in extremities to bend her pride to such a degree lisbeth went in she saw tears in adeline's eyes and threw her arms round her neck adeline my dearest i know all cried cousin betty here the marshal dropped this paper he was in such a state of mind and running like a greyhound has that dreadful hector given you no money since he gives it me quite regularly replied the baroness but hortense needed it and and you had not enough to pay for dinner to-night said lisbeth interrupting her now i understand why mariette looked so confused when i said something about the soup you really are childish adeline come take my savings thank you my kind cousin said adeline wiping away a tear this little difficulty is only temporary and i have provided for the future my expenses henceforth will be no more than two thousand four hundred francs a year rent inclusive and i shall have the money above all betty not a word to hector is he well 
as strong as a pont neuf and as gay as a lark he thinks of nothing but his charmer valerie madame hulot looked out at a tall silver fir in front of the window and lisbeth could not see her cousin's eyes to read their expression did you mention that it was the day when we all dine together here yes but dear me madame marneffe is giving a grand dinner she hopes to get monsieur coquet to resign and that is of the first importance now adeline listen to me you know that i am fiercely proud as to my independence your husband my dear will certainly bring you to ruin i fancied i could be of use to you all by living near this woman but she is a creature of unfathomable depravity and she will make your husband promise things which will bring you all to disgrace adeline writhed like a person stabbed to the heart my dear adeline i am sure of what i say i feel it is my duty to enlighten you well let us think of the future the marshal is an old man but he will last a long time yet he draws good pay when he dies his widow would have a pension of six thousand francs on such an income i would undertake to maintain you all use your influence over the good man to get him to marry me it is not for the sake of being madame la marechale i value such nonsense at no more than i value madame marneffe's conscience but you will all have bread i see that hortense must be wanting it since you give her yours the marshal now came in he had made such haste that he was mopping his forehead with his bandana i have given mariette two thousand francs he whispered to his sister-in-law adeline colored to the roots of her hair two tears hung on the fringes of the still long lashes and she silently pressed the old man's hand his beaming face expressed the glee of a favored lover i intended to spend the money in a present for you adeline said he instead of repaying me you must choose for yourself the thing you would like best he took lisbeth's hand which she held out to him and so bewildered was he by his satisfaction that he kissed it that looks promising said adeline to lisbeth smiling so far as she was able to smile the younger hulot and his wife now came in is my brother coming to dinner asked the marshal sharply adeline took up a pencil and wrote these words on a scrap of paper i expect him he promised this morning that he would be here but if he should not come it would be because the marshal kept him he is overwhelmed with business and she handed him the paper she had invented this way of conversing with marshal hulot and kept a little collection of paper scraps and a pencil at hand on the work-table i know said the marshal he has worked very hard over the business in algiers at this moment hortense and wenceslas arrived and the baroness as she saw all her family about her gave the marshal a significant glance understood by none but lisbeth happiness had greatly improved the artist who was adored by his wife and flattered by the world his face had become almost round and his graceful figure did justice to the advantages which blood gives to men of birth his early fame his important position the delusive eulogies that the world sheds on artists as lightly as we say how do you do or discuss the weather gave him that high sense of merit which degenerates into sheer fatuity when talent wanes the cross of the legion of honor was the crowning stamp of the great man he believed himself to be after three years of married life hortense was to her husband what a dog is to its master she watched his every movement with a look that seemed a constant inquiry her eyes were always on him like those of a miser on his treasure her admiring abnegation was quite pathetic in her might be seen her mother's spirit and teaching her beauty as great as ever was poetically touched by the gentle shadow of concealed melancholy on seeing hortense come in it struck lisbeth that some long-suppressed complaint was about to break through the thin veil of reticence lisbeth from the first days of the honeymoon had been sure that this couple had too small an income for so great a passion 
hortense as she embraced her mother exchanged with her a few whispered phrases heart to heart of which the mystery was betrayed to lisbeth by certain shakes of the head adeline like me must work for her living thought cousin betty she shall be made to tell me what she will do those pretty fingers will know at last like mine what it is to work because they must at six o'clock the family party went in to dinner a place was laid for hector leave it so said the baroness to mariette monsieur sometimes comes in late oh my father will certainly come said victorin to his mother he promised me he would when we parted at the chamber lisbeth like a spider in the middle of its net gloated over all these countenances having known victorin and hortense from their birth their faces were to her like panes of glass through which she could read their young souls now from certain stolen looks directed by victorin on his mother she saw that some disaster was hanging over adeline which victorin hesitated to reveal the famous young lawyer had some covert anxiety his deep reverence for his mother was evident in the regret with which he gazed at her hortense was evidently absorbed in her own woes for a fortnight past as lisbeth knew she had been suffering the first uneasiness which want of money brings to honest souls and to young wives on whom life has hitherto smiled and who conceal their alarms also lisbeth had immediately guessed that her mother had given her no money adeline's delicacy had brought her so low as to use the fallacious excuses that necessity suggests to borrowers hortense's absence of mind with her brother's and the baroness's deep dejection made the dinner a melancholy meal especially with the added chill of the marshal's utter deafness three persons gave a little life to the scene lisbeth celestine and wenceslas hortense's affection had developed the artist's natural liveliness as a pole the somewhat swaggering vivacity and noisy high spirits that characterize these frenchmen of the north his frame of mind and the expression of his face showed plainly that he believed in himself and that poor hortense faithful to her mother's training kept all domestic difficulties to herself you must be content at any rate said lisbeth to her young cousin as they rose from table since your mother has helped you with her money mamma replied hortense in astonishment oh poor mamma it is for me that she would like to make money you do not know lisbeth but i have a horrible suspicion that she works for it in secret they were crossing the large dark drawing-room where there were no candles all following mariette who was carrying the lamp into adeline's bedroom at this instant victorin just touched lisbeth and hortense on the arm the two women understanding the hint left wenceslas celestine the marshal and the baroness to go on together and remained standing in a window bay what is it victorin said lisbeth some disaster caused by your father i dare wager yes alas replied victorin a money-lender named vauvinet has bills of my father's to the amount of sixty thousand francs and wants to prosecute i tried to speak of the matter to my father at the chamber but he would not understand me he almost avoided me had we better tell my mother no no said lisbeth she has too many troubles it would be a death-blow you must spare her you have no idea how low she has fallen but for your uncle you would have found no dinner here this evening dear heaven victorin what wretches we are said hortense to her brother we ought to have guessed what lisbeth has told us my dinner is choking me hortense could say no more she covered her mouth with her handkerchief to smother a sob and melted into tears i told the fellow vauvinet to call on me to-morrow replied victorin but will he be satisfied by my guarantee on a mortgage i doubt it those men insist on ready money to sweat others on usurious terms let us sell out of the funds said lisbeth to hortense what good would that do replied victorin it would bring fifteen or sixteen thousand francs and we want sixty thousand 
dear cousin cried hortense embracing lisbeth with the enthusiasm of guilelessness no lisbeth keep your little fortune said victorin pressing the old maid's hand i shall see to-morrow what this man would be up to with my wife's consent i can at least hinder or postpone the prosecution for it would really be frightful to see my father's honour impugned what would the war minister say my father's salary which he pledged for three years will not be released before the month of december so we cannot offer that as a guarantee this vauvinet has renewed the bills eleven times so you may imagine what my father must pay in interest we must close this pit if only madame marneffe would throw him over said hortense bitterly heaven forbid exclaimed victorin he would take up someone else and with her at any rate the worst outlay is over what a change in children formerly so respectful and kept so long by their mother in blind worship of their father they knew him now for what he was but for me said lisbeth your father's ruin would be more complete than it is come into mamma said hortense she is very sharp and will suspect something as our kind lisbeth says let us keep everything from her let us be cheerful victorin said lisbeth you have no notion of what your father will be brought to by his passion for women try to secure some future resource by getting the marshal to marry me say something about it this evening i will leave early on purpose victorin went into the bedroom and you poor little thing said lisbeth in an undertone to hortense what can you do come to dinner with us to-morrow and we will talk it over answered hortense i do not know which way to turn you know how hard life is and you will advise me while the whole family with one consent tried to persuade the marshal to marry and while lisbeth was making her way home to the rue vanneau one of those incidents occurred which in such women as madame marneffe are a stimulus to vice by compelling them to exert their energy and every resource of depravity one fact at any rate must however be acknowledged life in paris is too full for vicious persons to do wrong instinctively and unprovoked vice is only a weapon of defence against aggressors that is all End of chapter 17chapter eighteen of cousin betty by honore de balzac translated by james waring this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by bruce peary chapter eighteen madame marneffe's drawing-room was full of her faithful admirers and she had just started the whist tables when the footman a pensioned soldier recruited by the baron announced monsieur le baron montache de montejanoche valerie's heart jumped but she hurried to the door exclaiming my cousin and as she met the brazilian she whispered you are my relation or all is at an end between us and so you were not wrecked henri she went on audibly as she led him to the fire i heard you were lost and have mourned for you these three years how are you my good fellow said marneffe offering his hand to the stranger whose get-up was indeed that of a brazilian and a millionaire monsieur le baron henri montache de montejanoche to whom the climate of the equator had given the colour and stature we expect to see in othello on the stage had an alarming look of gloom but it was a merely pictorial illusion for sweet and affectionate by nature he was predestined to be the victim that a strong man often is to a weak woman the scorn expressed in his countenance the muscular strength of his stalwart frame all his physical powers were shown only to his fellow-men a form of flattery which women appreciate nay which so intoxicates them that every man with his mistress on his arm assumes a matador swagger that provokes a smile very well set up in a closely fitting blue coat with solid gold buttons in black trousers spotless patent evening boots and gloves of a fashionable hue the only brazilian touch in the baron's costume was a large diamond 
worth about a hundred thousand francs which blazed like a star on a handsome blue silk cravat tucked into a white waistcoat in such a way as to show corners of a fabulously fine shirt-front his brow bossy like that of a satyr a sign of tenacity in his passions was crowned by thick jet-black hair like a virgin forest and under it flashed a pair of hazel eyes so wild-looking as to suggest that before his birth his mother must have been scared by a jaguar this fine specimen of the portuguese race in brazil took his stand with his back to the fire in an attitude that showed familiarity with paris manners holding his hat in one hand his elbow resting on the velvet-covered shelf he bent over madame marneffe talking to her in an undertone and troubling himself very little about the dreadful people who in his opinion were so very much in the way this fashion of taking the stage with the brazilian's attitude and expression gave alike to crevel and to the baron an identical shock of curiosity and anxiety both were struck by the same impression and the same surmise and the manoeuvre suggested in each by their very genuine passion was so comical in its simultaneous results that it made everybody smile who was sharp enough to read its meaning crevel a tradesman and shopkeeper to the backbone though a mayor of paris unluckily was a little slower to move than his rival partner and this enabled the baron to read at a glance crevel's involuntary self-betrayal this was a fresh arrow to rankle in the very amorous old man's heart and he resolved to have an explanation from valerie this evening said crevel to himself too as he sorted his hand i must know where i stand you have a heart cried marneffe you have just revoked i beg your pardon said crevel trying to withdraw his card this baron seems to me very much in the way he went on thinking to himself if valerie carries on with my baron well and good it is a means to my revenge and i can get rid of him if i choose but as for this cousin he is one baron too many i do not mean to be made a fool of i will know how they are related that evening by one of those strokes of luck which come to pretty women valerie was charmingly dressed her white bosom gleamed under a lace tucker of rusty white which showed off the satin texture of her beautiful shoulders for parisian women heaven knows how have some way of preserving their fine flesh and remaining slender she wore a black velvet gown that looked as if it might at any moment slip off her shoulders and her hair was dressed with lace and drooping flowers her arms not fat but dimpled were graced by deep ruffles to her sleeves she was like a luscious fruit coquettishly served in a handsome dish and making the knife-blade long to be cutting it valerie the brazilian was saying in her ear i have come back faithful to you my uncle is dead i am twice as rich as i was when i went away i mean to live and die in paris for you and with you lower henri i implore you pooh i mean to speak to you this evening even if i should have to pitch all these creatures out of window especially as i have lost two days in looking for you i shall stay till the last i can i suppose valerie smiled at her adopted cousin and said remember that you are the son of my mother's sister who married your father during junot's campaign in portugal what i montes de montejanus great-grandson of a conqueror of brazil tell a lie hush lower or we shall never meet again pray why marneffe like all dying wretches who always take up some last whim has a revived passion for me that cur said the brazilian who knew his marneffe i will settle him what violence and where did you get all this splendor the brazilian went on just struck by the magnificence of the apartment she began to laugh henri what bad taste said she 
she had felt two burning flashes of jealousy which had moved her so far as to make her look at the two souls in purgatory crevel playing against baron hulot and monsieur coquet had marneffe for his partner the game was even because crevel and the baron were equally absent-minded and made blunder after blunder thus in one instant the old men both confessed the passion which valerie had persuaded them to keep secret for the past three years but she too had failed to hide the joy in her eyes at seeing the man who had first taught her heart to beat the object of her first love the rights of such happy mortals survive as long as the woman lives over whom they have acquired them with these three passions at her side one supported by the insolence of wealth the second by the claims of possession and the third by youth strength fortune and priority madame marneffe preserved her coolness and presence of mind like general bonaparte when at the siege of mantua he had to fight two armies and at the same time maintain the blockade jealousy distorting hulot's face made him look as terrible as the late marshal montcornet leading a cavalry charge against a russian square being such a handsome man he had never known any ground for jealousy any more than murat knew what it was to be afraid he had always felt sure that he should triumph his rebuff by josepha the first he had ever met he ascribed to her love of money he was conquered by millions and not by a changeling he would say when speaking of the duc d'herouville and now in one instant the poison and delirium that the mad passion sheds in a flood had rushed to his heart he kept turning from the whist table towards the fireplace with an action a la mirabeau and as he laid down his cards to cast a challenging glance at the brazilian and valerie the rest of the company felt the sort of alarm mingled with curiosity that is caused by evident violence ready to break out at any moment the sham cousin stared at hulot as he might have looked at some big china mandarin this state of things could not last it was bound to end in some tremendous outbreak marneffe was as much afraid of hulot as crevel was of marneffe for he was anxious not to die a mere clerk men marked for death believe in life as galley slaves believe in liberty this man was bent on being a first-class clerk at any cost thoroughly frightened by the pantomime of the baron and crevel he rose said a few words in his wife's ear and then to the surprise of all valerie went into the adjoining bedroom with the brazilian and her husband did madame marneffe ever speak to you of this cousin of hers said crevel to hulot never replied the baron getting up that is enough for this evening said he i have lost two louis there they are he threw the two gold pieces on the table and seated himself on the sofa with a look which everybody else took as a hint to go monsieur and madame coquet after exchanging a few words left the room and claude vignon in despair followed their example these two departures were a hint to less intelligent persons who now found that they were not wanted the baron and crevel were left together and spoke never a word hulot at last ignoring crevel went on tiptoe to listen at the bedroom door but he bounded back with a prodigious jump for marneffe opened the door and appeared with a calm face astonished to find only the two men and the tea said he where is valerie replied the baron in a rage my wife said marneffe she is gone upstairs to speak to mademoiselle your cousin she will come down directly and why has she deserted us for that stupid creature well said marneffe mademoiselle lisbeth came back from dining with the baroness with an attack of indigestion and maturin asked valerie for some tea for her so my wife went up to see what was the matter and her cousin he is gone do you really believe that said the baron i have seen him to his carriage replied marneffe with a hideous smirk the wheels of a departing carriage were audible in the street the baron counting marneffe for nothing went upstairs to lisbeth 
an idea flashed through him such as the heart sends to the brain when it is on fire with jealousy marneffe's baseness was so well known to him that he could imagine the most degrading connivance between husband and wife what has become of all the ladies and gentlemen said marneffe finding himself alone with crevel when the sun goes to bed the cocks and hens follow suit said crevel madame marneffe disappeared and her adorers departed will you play a game of piquet added crevel who meant to remain he too believed that the brazilian was in the house monsieur marneffe agreed the mayor was a match for the baron simply by playing cards with the husband he could stay on indefinitely and marneffe since the suppression of the public tables was quite satisfied with the more limited opportunities of private play baron hulot went quickly up to lisbeth's apartment but the door was locked and the usual inquiries through the door took up time enough to enable the two light-handed and cunning women to arrange the scene of an attack of indigestion with the accessories of tea lisbeth was in such pain that valerie was very much alarmed and consequently hardly paid any heed to the baron's furious entrance indisposition is one of the screens most often placed by women to ward off a quarrel hulot peeped about here and there but could see no spot in cousin betty's room where a brazilian might lie hidden your indigestion does honor to my wife's dinner lisbeth said he scrutinizing her for lisbeth was perfectly well trying to imitate the hiccup of spasmodic indigestion as she drank her tea how lucky it is that dear betty should be living under my roof said madame marneffe but for me the poor thing would have died you look as if you only half believed it added lisbeth turning to the baron and that would be a shame why asked the baron do you know the purpose of my visit and he leered at the door of a dressing-closet from which the key had been withdrawn are you talking greek said madame marneffe with an appealing look of misprized tenderness and devotedness but it is all through you my dear cousin yes it is your doing that i am in such a state said lisbeth vehemently this speech diverted the baron's attention he looked at the old maid with the greatest astonishment you know that i am devoted to you said lisbeth i am here that says everything i am wearing out the last shreds of my strength in watching over your interests since they are one with our dear valerie's her house costs one-tenth of what any other does that is kept on the same scale but for me cousin instead of two thousand francs a month you would be obliged to spend three or four thousand i know all that replied the baron out of patience you are our protectress in many ways he added turning to madame marneffe and putting his arm round her neck is not she my pretty sweet on my honour exclaimed valerie i believe you are gone mad well you cannot doubt my attachment said lisbeth but i am also very fond of my cousin adeline and i found her in tears she has not seen you for a month now that is really too bad you leave my poor adeline without a sou your daughter hortense almost died of it when she was told that it is thanks to your brother that we had any dinner at all there was not even bread in your house this day adeline is heroically resolved to keep her sufferings to herself she said to me i will do as you have done the speech went to my heart and after dinner as i thought of what my cousin had been in eighteen eleven and of what she is in eighteen forty one thirty years after i had a violent indigestion i fancied i should get over it but when i got home i thought i was dying you see valerie to what my adoration of you has brought me to crime domestic crime oh i was wise never to marry cried lisbeth with savage joy you are a kind good man adeline is a perfect angel and this is the reward of her blind devotion an elderly angel said madame marneffe softly as she looked half tenderly half mockingly at her hector who was gazing at her as an examining judge gazes at the accused my poor wife 
said hulot for more than nine months i have given her no money though i find it for you valerie but at what a cost no one else will ever love you so and what torments you inflict on me in return torments she echoed then what do you call happiness i do not yet know on what terms you have been with this so-called cousin whom you never mentioned to me said the baron paying no heed to valerie's interjection but when he came in i felt as if a penknife had been stuck into my heart blinded i may be but i am not blind i could read his eyes and yours in short from under that ape's eyelids there flashed sparks that he flung at you and your eyes oh you have never looked at me so never as to this mystery valerie it shall all be cleared up you are the only woman who ever made me know the meaning of jealousy so you need not be surprised by what i say but another mystery which has rent its cloud and it seems to me infamous go on go on said valerie it is that crevel that square lump of flesh and stupidity is in love with you and that you accept his attentions with so good a grace that the idiot flaunts his passion before everybody only three can you discover no more asked madame marneffe there may be more retorted the baron if monsieur crevel is in love with me he is in his rights as a man after all if i favoured his passion that would indeed be the act of a coquette or of a woman who would leave much to be desired on your part well love me as you find me or let me alone if you restore me to freedom neither you nor monsieur crevel will ever enter my doors again but i will take up with my cousin just to keep my hand in in those charming habits you suppose me to indulge good-bye monsieur le baron hulot she rose but the baron took her by the arm and made her sit down again the old man could not do without valerie she had become more imperatively indispensable to him than the necessaries of life he preferred remaining in uncertainty to having any proof of valerie's infidelity my dearest valerie said he do you not see how miserable i am i only ask you to justify yourself give me sufficient reasons well go downstairs and wait for me for i suppose you do not wish to look on at the various ceremonies required by your cousin's state hulot turned slowly away you old profligate cried lisbeth you have not even asked me how your children are what are you going to do for adeline i at any rate will take her my savings to-morrow you owe your wife white bread to eat at least said madame marneffe smiling the baron without taking offence at lisbeth's tone as despotic as josepha's got out of the room only too glad to escape so importunate a question the door bolted once more the brazilian came out of the dressing-closet where he had been waiting and he appeared with his eyes full of tears in a really pitiable condition montesch had heard everything End of chapter eighteen chapter nineteen of cousin betty by honore de balzac translated by james waring this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by bruce peary chapter nineteen henri you must have ceased to love me i know it said madame marneffe hiding her face in her handkerchief and bursting into tears it was the outcry of real affection the cry of a woman's despair is so convincing that it wins the forgiveness that lurks at the bottom of every lover's heart when she is young and pretty and wears a gown so low that she could slip out at the top and stand in the garb of eve but why if you love me do you not leave everything for my sake asked the brazilian this south american-born being logical as men are who have lived the life of nature at once resumed the conversation at the point where it had been broken off putting his arm round valerie's waist why she repeated gazing up at henri whom she subjugated at once by a look charged with passion why my dear boy i am married we are in paris not in the savannah the pampas the backwoods of america my dear henri my first and only love listen to me 
that husband of mine a second clerk in the war office is bent on being a head clerk and officer of the legion of honor can i help his being ambitious now for the very reason that made him leave us our liberty nearly four years ago do you remember you bad boy he now abandons me to m hulot i cannot get rid of that dreadful official who snorts like a grampus who has fins in his nostrils who is sixty-three years old and who had grown ten years older by dint of trying to be young who is so odious to me that the very day when marneffe is promoted and gets his cross of the legion of honor how much more will your husband get then a thousand crowns i will pay him as much in an annuity said baron montesch we will leave paris and go where said valerie with one of the pretty sneers by which a woman makes fun of a man she is sure of paris is the only place where we can live happy i care too much for your love to risk seeing it die out in a tete-a-tete -tete in the wilderness listen henri you are the only man i care for in the whole world write that down clearly in your tiger's brain for women when they have made a sheep of a man always tell him that he is a lion with a will of iron now attend to me monsieur marneffe has not five years to live he is rotten to the marrow of his bones he spends seven months of the twelve in swallowing drugs and decoctions he lives wrapped in flannel in short as the doctor says he lives under the scythe and may be cut off at any moment an illness that would not harm another man would be fatal to him his blood is corrupt his life undermined at the root for five years i have never allowed him to kiss me he is poisonous some day and the day is not far off i shall be a widow well then i who have already had an offer from a man with sixty thousand francs a year i who am as completely mistress of that man as i am of this lump of sugar i swear to you that if you were as poor as hulot and as foul as marneffe if you beat me even still you are the only man i will have for a husband the only man i love or whose name i will ever bear and i am ready to give any pledge of my love that you may require well then to-night but you son of the south my splendid jaguar come expressly for me from the virgin forest of brazil said she taking his hand and kissing and fondling it i have some consideration for the poor creature you mean to make your wife shall i be your wife henri yes said the brazilian overpowered by this unbridled volubility of passion and he knelt at her feet well then henri said valerie taking his two hands and looking straight into his eyes swear to me now in the presence of lisbeth my best and only friend my sister that you will make me your wife at the end of my year's widowhood i swear it that is not enough swear by your mother's ashes and eternal salvation swear by the virgin mary and by all your hopes as a catholic valerie knew that the brazilian would keep that oath even if she should have fallen into the foulest social slough the baron solemnly swore it his nose almost touching valerie's white bosom and his eyes spellbound he was drunk drunk as a man is when he sees the woman he loves once more after a sea voyage of a hundred and twenty days good now be quite easy and in madame marneffe respect the future baroness de montejanoche you are not to spend a sou upon me i forbid it stay here in the outer room sleep on the sofa i myself will come and tell you when you may move we will breakfast to-morrow morning and you can be leaving at about one o'clock as if you had come to call at noon there is nothing to fear the gatekeepers love me as much as if they were my father and mother now i must go down and make tea she beckoned to lisbeth who followed her out on to the landing there valerie whispered in the old maid's ear my darky has come back too soon i shall die if i cannot avenge you on hortense make your mind easy my pretty little devil said lisbeth kissing her forehead love and revenge on the same track will never lose the game hortense expects me to-morrow she is in beggary 
for a thousand francs you may have a thousand kisses from wenceslas on leaving valerie hulot had gone down to the porter's lodge and made a sudden invasion there madame olivier on hearing the imperious tone of this address and seeing the action by which the baron emphasized it madame olivier came out into the courtyard as far as the baron led her you know that if any one can help your son to a connection by and by it is i it is owing to me that he is already third clerk in a notary's office and is finishing his studies yes monsieur le baron and indeed sir you may depend on our gratitude not a day passes that i do not pray to god for monsieur le baron's happiness not so many words my good woman said hulot but deeds what can i do sir asked madame olivier a man came here to-night in a carriage do you know him madame olivier had recognized montes well enough how could she have forgotten him in the rue du doyenne the brazilian had always slipped a five-franc piece into her hand as he went out in the morning rather too early if the baron had applied to monsieur olivier he would perhaps have learned all he wanted to know but olivier was in bed in the lower orders the woman is not merely the superior of the man she almost always has the upper hand madame olivier had long since made up her mind as to which side to take in case of a collision between her two benefactors she regarded madame marneffe as the stronger power do i know him she repeated no indeed no i never saw him before what did madame marneffe's cousin never go to see her when she was living in the rue du doyenne oh was it her cousin cried madame olivier i dare say he did come but i did not know him again next time sir i will look at him he will be coming out said hulot hastily interrupting madame olivier he has left said madame olivier understanding the situation the carriage is gone did you see him go as plainly as i see you he told his servant to drive to the embassy this audacious statement wrung a sigh of relief from the baron he took madame olivier's hand and squeezed it thank you my good madame olivier but that is not all monsieur crevel monsieur crevel what can you mean sir i do not understand said madame olivier listen to me he is madame marneffe's lover impossible monsieur le baron impossible said she clasping her hands he is madame marneffe's lover the baron repeated very positively how do they manage it i don't know but i mean to know and you are to find out if you can put me on the tracks of this intrigue your son is a notary don't you fret yourself so monsieur le baron said madame olivier madame cares for you and for no one but you her maid knows that for true and we say between her and me that you are the luckiest man in this world for you know what madame is just perfection she gets up at ten every morning then she breakfasts well and good after that she takes an hour or so to dress that carries her on till two then she goes for a walk in the tuileries in the sight of all men and she is always in by four to be ready for you she lives like clockwork she keeps no secrets from her maid and wren keeps nothing from me you may be sure wren can't if she would along of my son for she is very sweet upon him so you see if madame had any intimacy with monsieur crevel we should be bound to know it the baron went upstairs again with a beaming countenance convinced that he was the only man in the world to that shameless slut as treacherous but as lovely and as engaging as a siren crevel and marneffe had begun a second rubber at piquet crevel was losing as a man must who is not giving his thoughts to his game marneffe who knew the cause of the mayor's absence of mind took unscrupulous advantage of it he looked at the cards in reverse and discarded accordingly thus knowing his adversary's hand he played to beat him the stake being a franc a point he had already robbed the mayor of thirty francs when hulot came in hey day said he amazed to find no company are you alone where is everybody gone your pleasant temper put them all to flight said crevel 
no it was my wife's cousin replied marneffe the ladies and gentlemen supposed that valerie and henri might have something to say to each other after three years separation and they very discreetly retired if i had been in the room i would have kept them but then as it happens it would have been a mistake for lisbeth who always comes down to make tea at half-past ten was taken ill and that upset everything then is lisbeth really unwell asked crevel in a fury so i was told replied marneffe with the heartless indifference of a man to whom women have ceased to exist the mayor looked at the clock and calculating the time the baron seemed to have spent forty minutes in lisbeth's rooms hector's jubilant expression seriously incriminated valerie lisbeth and himself i have just seen her she is in great pain poor soul said the baron then the sufferings of others must afford you much joy my friend retorted crevel with acrimony for you have come down with a face that is positively beaming is lisbeth likely to die for your daughter they say is her heiress you are not like the same man you left this room looking like the moor of venice and come back with the air of saint preux i wish i could see madame marneffe's face at this minute and pray what do you mean by that said marneffe to crevel packing his cards and laying them down in front of him a light kindled in the eyes of this man decrepit at the age of forty-seven a faint color flushed his flaccid cold cheeks his ill-furnished mouth was half open and on his blackened lips a sort of foam gathered thick and as white as chalk this fury in such a helpless wretch whose life hung on a thread and who in a duel would risk nothing while crevel had everything to lose frightened the mayor i said repeated crevel that i should like to see madame marneffe's face and with all the more reason since yours at this moment is most unpleasant on my honour you are horribly ugly my dear marneffe do you know that you are very uncivil a man who has won thirty francs of me in forty-five minutes cannot look handsome in my eyes ah if you had but seen me seventeen years ago replied the clerk you were so good-looking asked crevel that was my ruin now if i had been like you i might be a mayor and a peer yes said crevel with a smile you have been too much in the wars and of the two forms of metal that may be earned by worshipping the god of trade you have taken the worse the dross this dialogue is garnished with puns for which it is difficult to find any english equivalent and crevel roared with laughter though marneffe could take offence if his honour were in peril he always took these rough pleasantries in good part they were the small coin of conversation between him and crevel the daughters of eve cost me dear no doubt but by the powers short and sweet is my motto long and happy is more to my mind returned crevel madame marneffe now came in she saw that her husband was at cards with crevel and only the baron in the room besides a mere glance at the municipal dignitary showed her the frame of mind he was in and her line of conduct was at once decided on marneffe my dear boy said she leaning on her husband's shoulder and passing her pretty fingers through his dingy gray hair but without succeeding in covering his bald head with it it is very late for you you ought to be in bed to-morrow you know you must dose yourself by the doctor's orders when will give you your herb tea at seven if you wish to live give up your game we will pay it out up to five points said marneffe to crevel very good i have scored two replied the mayor how long will it take you ten minutes said marneffe it is eleven o'clock replied valerie really monsieur crevel one might fancy you meant to kill my husband make haste at any rate this double-barrelled speech made crevel and hulot smile and even marneffe himself valerie sat down to talk to hector you must leave my dearest said she in hulot's ear walk up and down the rue vanneau and come in again when you see crevel go out i would rather leave this room and go into your room through the dressing-room door you could tell wren to let me in wren is upstairs attending to lisbeth 
well suppose then i go up to lisbeth's rooms danger hemmed in valerie on every side she foresaw a discussion with crevel and could not allow hulot to be in her room where he could hear all that went on and the brazilian was upstairs with lisbeth really you men when you have a notion in your head you would burn a house down to get into it exclaimed she lisbeth is not in a fit state to admit you are you afraid of catching cold in the street be off there or good night good evening gentlemen said the baron to the other two hulot when piqued in his old man's vanity was bent on proving that he could play the young man by waiting for the happy hour in the open air and he went away marneffe bid his wife good night taking her hands with a semblance of devotion valerie pressed her husband's hand with a significant glance conveying get rid of crevel good night crevel said marneffe i hope you will not stay long with valerie yes i am jealous a little late in the day but it has me hard and fast i shall come back to see if you are gone we have a little business to discuss but i shall not stay long said crevel speak low what is it said valerie raising her voice and looking at him with a mingled expression of haughtiness and scorn crevel as he met this arrogant stare though he was doing valerie important services and had hoped to plume himself on the fact was at once reduced to submission that brazilian he began but overpowered by valerie's fixed look of contempt he broke off what of him said she that cousin is no cousin of mine said she he is my cousin to the world and to monsieur marneffe and if he were my lover it would be no concern of yours a tradesman who pays a woman to be revenged on another man is in my opinion beneath the man who pays her for love of her you did not care for me all you saw in me was monsieur hulot's mistress you bought me as a man buys a pistol to kill his adversary i wanted bread i accepted the bargain but you have not carried it out said crevel the tradesman once more you want baron hulot to be told that you have robbed him of his mistress to pay him out for having robbed you of josepha nothing can more clearly prove your baseness you say you love a woman you treat her like a duchess and then you want to degrade her well my good fellow and you are right this woman is no match for josepha that young person has the courage of her disgrace while i i am a hypocrite and deserve to be publicly whipped alas josepha is protected by her cleverness and her wealth i have nothing to shelter me but my reputation i am still the worthy and blameless wife of a plain citizen if you create a scandal what is to become of me if i were rich then indeed but my income is fifteen thousand francs a year at most i suppose much more than that said crevel i have doubled your savings in these last two months by investing in orleans well a position in paris begins with fifty thousand and you certainly will not make up to me for the position i should surrender what was my aim i want to see marneffe a first-class clerk he will then draw a salary of six thousand francs he has been twenty-seven years in his office within three years i shall have a right to a pension of fifteen hundred francs when he dies you to whom i have been entirely kind to whom i have given your fill of happiness you cannot wait and that is what men call love she exclaimed though i began with an ulterior purpose said crevel i have become your poodle you trample on my heart you crush me you stultify me and i love you as i have never loved in my life valerie i love you as much as i love my celestine i am capable of anything for your sake listen instead of coming twice a week to the rue du dauphin come three times is that all you are quite young again my dear boy only let me pack off hulot humiliate him rid you of him said crevel not heeding her impertinence have nothing to say to the brazilian be mine alone you shall not repent of it 
to begin with i will give you eight thousand francs a year secured by bond but only as an annuity i will not give you the capital till the end of five years constancy always a bargain a tradesman can never learn to give you want to stop for refreshments on the road of love in the form of government bonds bah shopman pomatum seller you put a price on everything hector told me that the duc d'herouville gave josepha a bond for thirty thousand francs a year in a packet of sugar almonds and i am worth six of josepha oh to be loved she went on twisting her ringlets round her fingers and looking at herself in the glass henri loves me he would smash you like a fly if i winked at him hulot loves me he leaves his wife in beggary as for you go my good man be the worthy father of a family you have three hundred thousand francs over and above your fortune only to amuse yourself a hoard in fact and you think of nothing but increasing it for you valerie since i offer you half said he falling on his knees what still here cried marneffe hideous in his dressing-gown what are you about he is begging my pardon my dear for an insulting proposal he has dared to make me unable to obtain my consent my gentleman proposed to pay me crevel only longed to vanish into the cellar through a trap as is done on the stage get up crevel said marneffe laughing you are ridiculous i can see by valerie's manner that my honor is in no danger go to bed and sleep in peace said madame marneffe isn't she clever thought crevel she has saved me she is adorable as marneffe disappeared the mayor took valerie's hands and kissed them leaving on them the traces of tears it shall all stand in your name he said that is true love she whispered in his ear well love for love hulot is below in the street the poor old thing is waiting to return when i place a candle in one of the windows of my bedroom i give you leave to tell him that you are the man i love he will refuse to believe you take him to the rue du dauphin give him every proof crush him i allow it i order it i am tired of that old seal he bores me to death keep your man all night in the rue du dauphin grill him over a slow fire be revenged for the loss of josepha hulot may die of it perhaps but we shall save his wife and children from utter ruin madame hulot is working for her bread oh poor woman on my word it is quite shocking exclaimed crevel his natural feeling coming to the top if you love me celestin said she in crevel's ear which she touched with her lips keep him there or i am done for marneffe is suspicious hector has a key of the outer gate and will certainly come back crevel clasped madame marneffe to his heart and went away in the seventh heaven of delight valerie fondly escorted him to the landing and then followed him like a woman magnetized down the stairs to the very bottom my valerie go back do not compromise yourself before the porters go back my life my treasure all is yours go in my duchess madame olivier valerie called gently when the gate was closed why madame you here said the woman in bewilderment bolt the gates at top and bottom and let no one in very good madame having barred the gate madame olivier told of the bribe that the war office chief had tried to offer her you behaved like an angel my dear olivier we shall talk of that to-morrow valerie flew like an arrow to the third floor tapped three times at lisbeth's door and then went down to her room where she gave instructions to mademoiselle Wren, for a woman must make the most of the opportunity when a montesh arrives from brazil End of chapter 19